those two cars two seconds apart. And a minute, 22 seconds back is Rennie Binder in the on-form Duquesne team effort, the number 30 car, Edex Sports, Paul Lafargue, almost a minute back with Jan van Utrecht in the Palace Racing car. It's uh, three French teams, in fact, four French teams then battling behind. And uh, caps to be addressed. The Pro Amplas led and led well at the moment in 21st position by Algo Pro Racing after traumas in the morning and particularly for Paul Ben Barnicoat, the number 80 car crashing out the lead and out of the race. The racing's Melty Jakobsen is, what is that, uh, two, three laps back from the lead in Pro-Am in the 37 cool racing car that has its own problems overnight. Looking at the Hendrix Motorsport tomorrow, gloriously filthy. That's exactly what a race car should look like. Mike Rockenfeller aboard that car and in that pit stop. There goes the Jackman on the left-hand side of the car. Do the same on the right-hand side of the car. See Rocky get aboard the car through the driver's window. No doors on that car. The car drops back again into the lead pack of GTM. And in that battle, it is the Iron Dames. Rahel Fry leads the race, two and a half seconds ahead of a closing Matteo Caroli. Porsche 1-2, 85 from 56 with the Project 1 AO. Choose your weapon, bright pink Porsche, green dinosaur. This is uh, this GTM battle is fantastic. It's great. It's, the lead is just changing almost every hour. You know, when GT Pro left the World Championship, the FIWC at the end of last year, we'll mourn it and we'll, we'll forever mourn it. It's provided fantastic uh, entertainment. And GTE Am, the uh, formula with pro and drivers of these cars, the sole remaining place in the World Endurance Championship and here at Le Mans for the GTE machines in their final year of competition alongside the ELMS. Again, its final year before LMGT3 takes over next year. We look forward to the uh, the variety that's going to bring. Robert Singer there, so long, so uh, part of the Porsche efforts in um, here at Le Mans, and uh, there with Christian Reed, the ever-present starter, still that number six car. This is a long repair. By the way, Robert Singer's son, the first race car he's designed is the current and brand new 992 version of the uh, 911 GT3R, the current GT3 car. All about Porsche GT3's Peter Dubrek. Uh, now three years at the Nürburgring most recently. Yeah, I've, I've driven a few. Oh. That's the man loose, loose on entry to uh, Indianapolis. The 98 car in the hands of Ian James. A podium finisher here at Le Mans back in 2006 in LMP2. This uh, part of racing backs replacement for Paul Dallana's entry, uh, but on the entry, came together in the days before Spa. They've not had long to put together this effort at Le Mans. Come back to you, the at uh, the Le Mans. Yeah, I mean, we, I talked about it before. Actually, Matteo Caroli was my teammate uh, in my last year in Falcon Motorsport Porsche. Um, and yes, I, I know how quick a driver he is. He's honing in on uh, Rahel Fry now. Yep, and uh, this is a big story between two very popular teams for two very different reasons. The, the significance cannot be ignored. We've already had an overall victory in the European Le Mans series for the Iron Dames. They're still awaiting their first victory in the FI World Endurance Championship. And if that could come at the 24 hours of Le Mans, wow, that would be quite something. Well, we've seen them in the mix the whole race. They've we just been, have. They've been in the top three the whole time, just up first, second, third, back to first again. So they're really taking it to the other teams. And five seconds added, by the way, to the 708 next pit stop, the Glickenhaus, in their pursuit of fifth place, the next target for Glickenhaus. Doing it mostly for the most of reliability. They're climbing up the order. So Rahel Fry from Switzerland. I think it's fair to say now a veteran pro driver has been a factory driver for Audi in the past. Matteo Caroli. 
Porsche contracted driver, the next stage down from the full factory driver. Italian driver who is passionate about Porsche. There's not many of those, but he is. His words to me were, and I couldn't believe him when, I was, when he was saying it. He said, if I don't drive for Porsche, I don't drive. He, that's, he said that to me more than yeah. once. Um, I remember him putting, uh, the, I think the first season I came across him at the top level, the European Le Mans series, putting the Porsche, the only Porsche that year in the European Le Mans series on pole at Imola. And I've rarely seen a more related young driver. Uh, I think he's a fabulous character. And he is a big fan favourite would be an understatement here. Look forward, by the way, uh, if you if you like your, your toy cars, I do. And, uh, that car, I can tell you, took a visit to Hot Wheels recently. That's coming. And that will be one very popular pocket money toy when it finally comes. This is a great battle. It looks like it's about to take a bite out of the Iron Dames car. <laughs> <laughs> you choose your weapon. Well, the weapon at the moment is a Porsche. 911 RSR 19. The oh. 2019 spec of these cars. Let's have a listen what's going on with the lead car. James Gallardo. Rear side ratio at high speed, front right. Uh, I can see the tyre bobbing up and down. Copy that, man. Copy that. Do you think it's pickup? No. Oh. Front right, big vibration. I can see the tyre popping up and down. And he doesn't think it's pickup. Yeah. I mean, the lap time's still good. He's, he's 29.8 uh, versus uh, power power on the 30.3. So. The pace is still there, but um, clearly he's obviously got um, some concerns over that uh, that tyre. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this, this issue of vibration, try to put it, Peter Dunbreck, into terms that someone can understand and listen to. I've seen your explanation on the stage at the Mon Scrutineering when you were asked, what's it like at 200 miles an hour on the Montana? And I've often demonstrated to people face to face what, how it was you explained it, and it was both graphic and hilarious, but what level of vibration are we talking about? By the way, that's the lead change that's just happened with Matteo Garoni making his way by. Well, obviously, the faster you go, the more that vibration comes through the car, and um, I, I can't remember We're, explaining it to before, but... Uh, I, I will do, and apologies to the TV viewers, I'll explain to both the gentlemen sitting to my, to my right what Peter did when interviewed by... Bruno van der Stick. The, the question was, what's it like at 200 miles an hour on the Mulzan? And uh, Peter's response was... <laughs> uh, which it was basically, Peter, um, I'm going to put this, acting out, uh, effectively being in a tumble dryer. Now, that's a regular run down the Mulzan. It's not billiard table smooth in a race car. Yeah. If he's complaining about it, he's got a problem. Just looking yeah. now at the video to see if there's anything movement of the tyre, the wheel rather. It, it's hard to tell whether that's irregular, but that could just be... The fact that he's reporting it. Yeah. So this is his first stint on this tyre. Uh, looking at that, minute 20 on the pit stop. If they did, if they did four tyres, that was quick. So listen to what James is saying now. Hey, James. We need at least two more laps, and it's three to make it a 12-lap stint. We can't cut this one short, or we add a stop. There you go, this far out, 7 hours and 14 minutes. Team making it very clear, you've got to tough this one out, Sunshine. Gap is now under 20 seconds, but it's not coming down massive. Did on that last lap by three seconds, actually. So we'll keep an eye on the sector times here. It's actually quicker in the middle sector than the record last time. I mean, it could be the balance of the, of the wheel, yeah. That, that's that's why the weight off the wheel. Guess. Something as simple as that. So he's, he's basically just going to make it his way through at least two laps and hopefully three to keep them on the strategy. And as you heard there from Justin Taylor, the uh, race engineer on the 51 car with a huge amount of experience, ex Audi and with Rebellion for some time as well, Justin. They're counting back here, and that's, a, that's quite a moment in this race, isn't it, when you start to count back towards the end of the race. It's 
just make it feel shorter or longer, gentlemen? I think it's shorter. I think, you know, the end, the end is in sight. Definitely close to the end now, so... Uh, but this is where it really starts to... You know, they can't afford any yelly pit stops because they don't have the time to recover, so... It's a straight fight now between the two... Uh, between the Ferrari and the Toyota, so... And as you said, even, even at the lap times he's doing, he's still maintaining that 19, 20-second gap. Yep. Well, as a mark of just how well alight this race is, we're talking here about a gap for the overall lead hovering around the 20-second mark with a little bit of a, a running problem at the moment, the 51 car vibration from the front right. In the last 10 minutes, we have had lead changes in both LMP2 and in... Uh, GTM. Let's uh, go to one of the guys who's been involved in that battle. Louise Beckett is with Robert Kubica on pit lane uh, with Team WRT right now. I'm with Robert Kubica from the 41 WRT. That looked like it was a challenge this morning. Right. Uh, actually, compared to, to the middle part of the race and uh, the early part of the race, this was an uh, easy one. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, the track condition is settled now, uh, which was not the case in the first part of the race. So, uh, yeah, uh, we are fighting. It's not an easy one against uh, Inter Europa. Uh, they are uh, from different league compared to us. Uh, yeah, so uh, a part of, uh, I think that they, they are uh, more clever by using short ratios, uh, shorter ratios than us. Uh, so okay, they get a lot of more acceleration than they are. It's still a long way to go, uh, everything can happen, uh, especially with the new safety car rules. So, uh, yeah, we have to keep going, keep it clean and uh, try our best. You jumped straight on Team Radio and you were feeding back a lot to the team. Just that's what you were saying. Was it about those pit stops? No, I mean, uh, I, my job is uh, to inform the team how was the balance, how was the car, uh, try to give as many information also to Rui. And, uh, yeah, uh, we didn't have... Uh, Proper pressure, I think, for this uh, run, for this stint. Uh, I did triple stint, but uh, especially first two were very difficult. There was a lot of slow zones in the uh, high-speed corners, so I didn't put uh, a lot of energy into the tires. I couldn't put because we were going 80 km per hour. So the tire never switched on, and actually, afterwards they were better. But yeah, uh, nevertheless, you know, still a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you right now. I think. Team WRT are rattled by the form of that car. They said something about the short ratios. From memory, I think there were two options for LMP2 ratios. I find it difficult to believe that the Le Mans 24 hours, they've gone for a short ratio option. I agree. There are two ratios for, for the P2 car. As you say, you would have thought there was uh, only one set for Le Mans. Yeah. Um, but they certainly had the speed advantage on the streets, didn't they? Yeah. But it could be aero. I mean, it could be that they're uh, running yeah. maybe a slightly faster car or... Yeah, yeah. Let's have a listen what's going on with the surviving Toyota. We are here at Kawa in pursuit. Okay, Rio, we see, uh, we think the 51 Ferrari has flat spotted its tires. You're two tenths up, sector one, gap 19.3. Great job. Just keep pushing, mate. Keep pushing. Head down. That's what you want to hear, but trouble here from the number 708 car at Indianapolis, I think that is, has looped it. Can the car be restarted? It's Olivier Plat. Don't think it's hit the barrier, has it? I think it's probably just it's maybe spun on the exit. It might have hit the barrier, you know, look at here. Classic error we've seen time and time again here. Yeah, oh, it spits it hard, that is going to be in the barrier. It's yeah. clanged it, clanged it hard. That could be a big problem. Don't like to see, gentlemen, that rear wheel clattered into a barrier that could transfer the energy all the way through the car. That's where you can get mechanical problems. And also the barrier, you saw the barrier tick, you know, huge amount of impact. And uh, it's whether it's actually damaged the barrier, because if it has damaged the barrier, then obviously uh, you're going to have to get the marshals on track to start fixing it. Double yellows at the moment, as you might expect, uh, to give Olivier Pla the opportunity to rejoin. He is going to rejoin. Fabulous stuff. You can see the barrier bending with the impact. But has it bent too far? Lickenau's ready. 
He's still not away. Going to need to find reverse. Olivier, highly experienced, needs the push back here. He's not got room to do it. He's struggling to find reverse here for the car. And these cars are not really designed for reverse. reverse. So they have a tiny little reverse gear and sometimes... Well, the problem here is it's double yellows. The marshals will be instructed whether or not they can go to the track surface to push that car. There's not the protection of anything other than a yellow flag. And I'm pretty certain that without a slow zone, they're not going to be attending that car. He's shaking his head a little, isn't he? Talking to the team by the look of things as well. So listen, what's going on from race control? The slow zone is coming. The driver is supposed to know how to engage reverse, correct? Yes. Yeah, that's uh, that is peak Eduardo. <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's a case that he doesn't know how to do it. I think it's a case that it just won't go in. I suspect that's probably quite right. And that, I think, is why he's shaking his head, which is where I'm concerned. What we've often seen when you see that, that kind of sideways impact through the axle is the damage isn't at the wheel and it's not the drive sh shaft. I think the damage could be in the gearbox. I think we've got marshals on the track now, so the push will happen. And finally, the number five car, a six car rather uh, rejoins the race, and that was 43 minutes. That small error at the entry to the Porsche curves cost the Porsche Penske number six car. It's Kevin Estrin that will uh, get, uh, get things back on track. Let's go and talk to Blue. Blue, what's going on down there? James Collado, it looks like that number 51 Ferrari is on its way in for a pit stop. Thanks, Lou. And that will be the two laps that Justin Teller told James he needed to complete to stick with the plan. He's restricted the damage. That car is crappy. The 708 car is back on the way, but it is not running in a straight line. Look at that. The spare nose for the 709 prepared for the 708 this time. Which indicates they're beginning to run out of spares. Such a shame, they were having such a great run. Absolutely. As we've seen, though, it's a tiny little mistake can make absolutely. all the difference and, and can pretty much ruin your race. Yeah, Olivier Pla will be absolutely distraught with that. So let's go down to Lou just briefly. Ferrari is going to be on its way in shortly. What's awaiting for it, Lou? You can see Antonio Giovinazzi ready to get into the car and a fresh set of medium tyres are ready for him. Yeah, fair fraction with the leading number 51 car, Ryu Hirakawa has, and it's on pit lane now. So double stinting drivers at the moment, changing tyres and driver every two stints. Collado out of the car, it is, yes, yeah, Jeff Lazzi in. They're pushing and pushing hard now. I think, I think they're just trying to keep the drivers fresh. And, I think know. they are, and I think they can sense a bit of history coming here, gentlemen. There's the huge opportunity here for AF Corsa, Ferrari. In comes the 708 from Glickenhaus. If you've got tired drivers, the chances of an error like Olivier Pla just made become a bit higher. Therefore, you better just uh, double stint drivers, keep them fresh, keep them rested. They're in a good down the, the prime position right now. Indeed. Also on pit lane, by the way, Ria Hurakawa from second place. So 51 on pit lane. James Collado to Antonio Giovinazzi. Ria Hurakawa stays aboard and a break car in and out of the pits. The number two Cadillac like in third place. Now on the hands of Richard Westbrook, Seb Bourdais. He sits in fourth. Cadillac like still third and fourth as they have been through most of this morning. And it's the Peugeot. The damage on the rear of the Lincoln House. So I think Toyota choosing to go the other way. They're 
Isn't that the fourth stint of uh, Hirokawa? It is. He's been in for quite some time. Peugeot up in the fifth place, the 93 car. And that car also recently in and out of the pits. It's Mikkel Jensen bought that car. 709, Glickenhaus takes the sixth position. It was previously occupied by the car that's now being pushed back into the garage after that's hit. The exit in Indianapolis, there it goes, Olivier Plant. It is a highly unusual occurrence in the history of this team to see a car in the barriers, uh, in, the, in the garage. You're, you spotted something? Yeah, um, Buemi now is in the car, in the number eight. Ah, we didn't so, see the driver uh, change. Yeah, two fresh drivers. There it is. Oh, oh, shit. God, that was a violent kick, wasn't it, through the gravel trap? Just had the power on where it did need to be. It was almost like he got away with it, but then he almost busted out on the curb. Yeah, yeah. Kick, up, kick the rear wheels up, and that's what got the rotation. Well, you, you can see that a lot of other people have stuck a wheel in that gravel, so the gravel now is a hole. Yes, exactly. Completely, yes, absolutely yeah. spot on. Yeah, what a brilliant yeah. shot that was. Great cover work. That's a fantastic shot. Just a few minutes until we hand over to Jim Roller in the big chair. It has been a morning of real drama. This has just been the latest one. But as we get uh, close to nine o'clock in the morning here, seven hours to go. It's Ferrari that leads them on. We've had an uh, inter-Polish battle team and drivers for the lead in other P2. The moment that's gone the way of the inter-European competition car on the cost of the wheel. 34 car pulling away from Team WRT now cycling through with their silver driver still leading about an hour to serve of his drive time. Six hours they must do. Looks like the Ferrari had a slightly better pit stop than the uh, the Toyota. Looks like the gap now in 28 seconds. So we'll see once uh, we're a little bit further on. It was actually the sort of 21 seconds longer for the Ferrari. So that it? indicates somewhere has been lost by Toyota. We'll keep an eye on that gap. 28 seconds, you're absolutely right. That was down to 19, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, the other side of that pit stop cycle. So what's gone on there? Um, GTM, by the way, and that's been a little light too. And the latest change is it's uh, been a pit stop for the Iron Dames who led coming into breakfast time here. Matteo Caroli for the 56. Project 1A Ocar, and if none of those words mean anything to you, Rexy the Dinosaur leads them on. Dinosaur wins them on. Wow, that would be something. Nicky Katzberg, by the way. The 33 Corvette back up into second position. And up to third, Charlie Eastwood in the ORT by TF Aston Martin. Top three places, three very different cars. The 25 car, Oman Racing Team, talked about nation getting behind what's going on in the P2. Trust me, little nation of Oman, nation of around 4 million people will be waking up this morning. Whatever time it is in Oman, I'm too tired to work that one out. And we'll be taking a very close interest in what's going on in GTEM. So what happened there with this Toyota? It's definitely uh, 28 seconds, almost 29 seconds. It's gained 20 seconds in the pits, but lost time on track. Let's find out whether there's any clues from what's going on with Seppo Amy. How can I unlock the red bar? How can I unlock it? Okay, Seb, just try and push it a little bit forward. Push it forward maximum, and then while it's down, pull it back. Push it forward maximum, then pull it back. Unlock the what bar? The bar, or maybe... Yeah, not sure. So under seven hours to go now, and uh, as I say, uh, I'll be handing over in just a few moments to Jim Roller. And the next voice you'll hear in our third chair will be Ad Davidson for Peterton Breck. Let's uh, go down though to pit lane for interview with Louise Beckett. I'm with James Collado, who's just brought the 51 Ferrari in, uh, just getting a massage there. Do you reckon he can do that on my feet? <laughs> I could try. I think it's a good little thing. It's like a, 
I don't know, vibrating thing. I'll be careful what I say. Um, I guess you want to ask about the, the stint. It was it was pretty decent. The car's there. Uh, it's been a great fight for the Toyotas. Uh, we've been nose to tail for the last few hours, and um, I'm just really enjoying it. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a magical place to be. Um, you know, and, um, you know, so proud of the guys. So whatever happens, just I'm happy for them. I mean, yes, what you guys have achieved so far this season within WEC and here in the Mon, uh, we are getting to the early hours, we are getting a little bit emotional, but it's true, isn't it? What you've, what you've achieved so far is incredible. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't think the car's ever gone this far before, if I'm honest, in terms of hours. Um, but, you know, it, it always seems to be okay, I mean, fingers crossed, but like I say, We'll just take it lap by lap, step by step, do the best we can. And Tono's in the car now on a, on a different compound because I start to struggle a bit with the rears. And we'll see how we go. I'll let you rest up a bit. Thank you. Get a bit more of a massage. There's our uh, one-time leader in the... And still is our leader. Yeah, just in the LMP2 category. While, while Anthony and I were having breakfast this morning, we saw that car lose the lead in the WRT number 41, but now it has regained the lead. Back in the old days of television, guys, you'd have never seen those pebbles. They would have been little blurs. That's what high definition has done for it. You can see he just overshot on the entry to uh, All Sand Corner into the gravel. Oh, look at that. Perhaps oh. just lost concentration for a second, but um, those stones a lot of stones in that car, that can cause some problems. It just takes a stone to get into the brake disc or in the wheel, and um, you know, that can cause some problems. So hopefully it won't do. They're having a great run and uh, had a sort of a 20 second lead um, over the second place WRT car, so. Yeah, they had lost the lead uh, when they had their lowest graded driver in the car behind the wheel of the interior pole but now i believe they can run through to the end of the race with their higher graded the golds and the platinum drivers that they have available so uh, yeah so that's a, a rare mistake i'd have to say for albert costa there down into uh, the molson corner as rio hirakara walks away from the pit wall back to the garage new fastest lap of the race by the 50 ferrari on a 28.1 328.1 so new fastest lap so, Guy, I understand uh, Boemi, who is uh, not, uh, well, is back in the car. Uh, once I went off to, for my for my rest, he continued to have roll, roll bar issues. Was he still complaining about the car? Yeah, they just don't seem totally happy with the car. They've been playing around a lot with the roll bars, and they just don't quite have the raw pace of the Ferrari. They've, they've kept themselves in the game, and... Uh, but at the, the, last, the last pit stop, a um, couple of laps ago, the gap was 19, 18, 19 seconds. They did a pit stop, came out, and it was at 28, 29. So somewhere, um, Toyota lost a decent chunk of time. Um, well, they're out of sync, aren't they, with the driver changes? Uh, they, they, yeah. they, both they both changed at the same time. They, they, so when we, when we jumped in um, for... Uh, Rio. Rio, yes. Oh, hang on, I can hear I can hear Louise in my ear. So, Louise, do you want to come in if uh, Jim hits the panel? There you go. You can tell tell the world, Lou. Thanks, and when Rio put a fresh set of tyres on, he went back out and there was a 25-second difference. So now it's 32 yeah. seconds. Rio, of course, being for... Rio is... Rio Hirakawa, yeah, so Hirakawa, um, so at that point, he was out of sync with, uh, at the time it was Pierre Guidi yes. at the wheel of the Ferrari 51, so that's why I assumed that's still the way be. it was so, when, yeah. Yeah, but uh, so Rio, obviously, he had the right rear puncture, slow puncture as well, for those of you who had missed it, um, so that's why they lost a little bit of lap time there, they all also, uh, not lap time, time, to the 51 car, and they also had to change the splitter. The nose of the car came off, they had a little bit of damage. I think it uh, affected the balance of that Toyota, and uh, so they still, even with that nose change, they still haven't managed to find the speed that they started this race with. Uh, 
and uh, Graham Goodwin leaps out of his chair and he's pointing <laughs> at a purple He's so purple. He's so purple. We are, yes, we are in happy hour uh, where the track is at its best. You got the rubber down from uh, from yesterday and, and coming into today. I know we've had the rain, but the temperatures are cool and you can now see where you're going. So yeah. uh, <laughs> that's where the lap time starts to come from. As we uh, are just under seven hours to go, there's your LMP2 leader. Second place is the Team WRT number 41 and the Duquesne number 30 continues to circulate as our final podium position in LMP2. And how amazing would this be? Uh, probably completely cursed it for them right now. Uh, into Europol, regardless what happens through the rest of this race, I mean, it's been incredible. They've had the speed from word go here at Le Mans, mm -hmm. which hasn't been the case for the time that I've been watching their efforts, their efforts at this track. So, uh, or, or, or in LMP2 in general, they've always been somewhere there or thereabouts. But they have had a quick racing car all the way through this event. Albert Acosta behind the wheel of that car currently. Giovinazzi just did his fastest uh, lap of the race, uh, lap earlier on, a, I think it was a, uh, a 28.6, I believe, 7. So the Ferrari's pushing on, got some real pace at the minute, and again extended the lead over Guemi to 33 seconds. And in third place is still the, the Cadillac, Richard Westbrook behind the wheel. And then in fourth place is the other Cadillac, Sebastian Bourdais, still lap down. He's not been able to get that lap back. Yes, uh, even with the new safety car rules, we haven't seen one for, for quite some time, and that's probably what that uh, number three caddy is praying for. But a yeah, remarkable effort that they're back there in P4. It really is, because there was a time when I thought that they were just going to leave the car in the garage. It's been it's, it's had a troubled time here, I think it's fair to say. Uh, but, you know, the car set on fire, we saw in qualifying. Uh, then they suffered, they, through no fault of their own, a huge amount of crash damage in the race. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, 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 show, a showcase to everybody just to never give up. Well, and speaking of never giving up, the number 33, Corvette Racing, Nicky Katzberg behind the wheel of that car, yeah. has now climbed all the way back to second in the GTM race. Of course, uh, Rexy, the Project 1A of Porsche, Matteo Caroli, Matteo Caroli behind the wheel of that car. And then the Iron Dame, Dames, uh, Rahel Fry in the number 85. So it's the, the two Porsches and the Corvette now battling it out as we uh, have just under seven hours to go. It's just past 9 a.m. here in Lazard. Good morning, everyone. Places are a little bit different, but uh, times actually, Guy, are a little bit different, but really things uh, haven't changed much since you and I were together last uh, about five o'clock this morning. No, the top's uh, very much the same. It's the uh, Ferrari and the, the Toyota. There's a super bronze. Ben super Keating. bronze. <laughs> He's Keeping his fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the Corvette, as you say, is making a, a, a real comeback. And, um, you know, it's, it's very much in the frame for a, for a possible win here. Which is it, it, amazing. I, because I, I counted them out. I did. I mean, yeah, me too. I, I thought, no, they're, they're going to carry them. on. Maybe hope for a top five. But they're... It, I mean, we're coming up on 49 minutes away from a regular race distance. So it's all to play for. That's right. The uh, Le Mans is uh, round four of the World Endurance Championship this season. And uh, yeah, like you say, Jim, most of our races we have in the WEC are six hours long. And uh, yeah, we're 49 minutes away from that happening. Here comes the overall race leader in the back of your shot. That's the, of course, of Ferrari 499, Antonio Giovinazzi, the former Formula One driver behind, behind the wheel. Yeah, Giovinazzi was uh, driving a absolutely formidable stint before he handed over to uh, Pierre Guidi. 
So he's back out there and he's got the sister car behind him. Number 50 with uh, Fuoco at the wheel who holds on to the fastest lap. Still. Let's find out what the Corvette team's talking about. course yellow we have a full course yellow now what has happened here oh it was uh Fuoco running a little bit wide there but that's not what the uh it's not what the full course yellow is about <laughs> but that was uh that was a lucky escape there wasn't it from Fuoco So with a full co <laughs> Picking up some bollards. So with the full course yellow, pit lane is closed. So if you're Corvette and you're close on fuel, you were getting ready for a pit stop. Ben was standing by. I think this is the reason for the full course yellow right here. Just too much debris. Just too track. much, too many pebbles, too much. Uh... They need one of those big jet blowers. They do. And the guy behind's thinking, why use my broom when the guy in front's got a leaf blower? <laughs> well, I'll just walk he's, behind. He's him. really there to uh, watch the guy's back. Yeah, exactly. To be honest, <laughs> and, uh, I, if I'm the guy with the leaf blower, I don't, I don't want that guy. I want him looking. <laughs> yes, Louise. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the other team that are waiting for their car to come in is the number 43 DKR. The lollipop person is in the pit lane, so they're gonna, um, they're gonna suffer from this closed pit lane. Hopefully, they haven't left it too close. And well, have to it, make emergency service for fuel. Well, that's the thing. If it's yeah. if you have to come in because you're running low on fuel, uh, you're only allowed a five-second splash, mm -hmm. and then you're going to be back in before you know it. Yeah, and then you have to come back in. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, that, that's that's the penalty you you suffer with the, you know, if you, it's just unlucky timing. There's nothing that the yeah. team can do. No. Nope. Could the 50 get any closer to the 51? Yeah. Yeah, I'm only leading the race, mate. Come on, this. You know, yeah, you're, you're, I'm, I'm sorry. I, just, I think these these guys are playing too many games. Um, I get the competition. I get that you you know you want to be competitive, but unless you've been told to get up there and look at something, you, that, that's just insane. You're you're asking. Eventually, that's going to come back to haunt them. Those kind of shenanigans, like we saw the, at Spa. And, you know, and like we, we saw earlier in the race when when they were really going hammer and tong at each other. Just stretch your legs, boys. You got 24 hours. Well, you know, the, the number 50 is pushing on to try and make up lost ground. They're down there in P8, though. Uh, if it's anybody else, yeah, sure. But when it's your teammate, it's um, you don't want to put the, the lead car, your teammate, under unnecessary pressure. Watching a replay there of uh, Buemi. Big, Big old lockup. Lock up. Wow, that's a huge lockup. He's, he's going to have blisters with, with that kind of vibration. Oh, flat spots, yeah. And uh, he's definitely going to be feeling that one. You're right there, Jim. That's what we call blistering. Oh, you call it blistering? Yeah. Not flat spot? Oh, no, no, no. On, on your hands. Oh, blisters in your hands. <laughs> <laughs> All right, he'll drive through that. That's, uh, he'll be more concerned about his uh, eyeballs getting rattled around in their sockets from the from the flat spots as uh, Fuoco continues to harass his teammate through the Porsche curves. Let's go back to the pits. Uh, well, just looking at the timing, we've got 6.44 left. And remember, a usual WEC race is six hours, so we're not even, we're still above a normal six hour, um, six hour WEC race right now. Yeah, that's uh, we were just talking about that. That's, you're exactly right. And uh, 
Can you uh, ask the Ferrari guys what's going on between the 50 and the 51? I don't know oh, if you're seeing the monitor. Oh, goodness, the they are the other end of the pit lane, but ah, okay, I will go up there. <laughs> yeah, we'd ju it'd just be good <laughs> to know, Lou, in. if they're going to swap them around, because uh, it would make sense if I was the... If I was the team boss there, I'd be saying, look, you know, there's no, at the moment, no pressure. You're, you're, you're over 35 seconds ahead of the Toyota uh, is Giovinazzi and Fuoco's down in P8. He's a, a, lap, a couple of laps oh, down yeah. on his, on the, about six laps down. Yeah, oh, on, let him go. You're right. You're go. absolutely right. Yeah, Monty Jakobsen there just uh, had a spin. So the pit lane is open and here comes the 50 car. That makes more sense yeah, why he was so close makes, now, because yeah. <laughs> he was trying to minimize the time loss before coming into the pits. He looks over the, his left shoulder there just to check the car as he comes in, sees him on his way. So yeah, clearly on a very different uh, strategy there, but Fuoco was absolutely flying. Fastest lap, like you said earlier on, guy 328.1 on lap 227. Well, that, that will save Louise the trip then. Yeah, stand down, Lou. Yeah, that's near right. Stand <laughs> it all makes sense now. <laughs> right, we, actually, we should have seen because they're on the graphics there, the energy level with the 6% remaining of... Uh, that's a clue. <laughs> there you go. And You're behind him, uh, the 33 car has also come in. Ben Keating will... Uh, he was boot, uh, suited and booted, but he did not get in. Fuel only, no tires. Same for the 50 car. So the comeback drive continues. Going to leave Nikki Katzberg in the car for one more stint. At least. Yeah, you've got to leave Nikki in there for as long as you possibly can. He's uh, an exceptionally quick racing driver, particularly in that 33 Corvette. He's been outstanding so far this year. Put in a absolutely brilliant drive in uh, Portimao at round two of the championship. Uh, under immense pressure he was that day but uh, hung on to it, a real masterclass in defensive driving. And this is a huge race for the 33 car from the overall big picture of the World Endurance Championship because they can put a virtual lock uh, on the championship with a victory here, given that it's double points. And in fact, I know Graham Goodwin worked out, there are a couple of scenarios where they could clinch here if they can get a victory, but that's uh, definitely dependent on that. Let's check in with Eduardo Freitas and his team. We are removing full course yellow at 9.18.45. At 9.18.45 in 30 seconds, we're removing full course yellow. So 30 seconds until we uh, go back to action. Antonio Fuoco. Coming up to speed. And full course yellow is gone. Yeah, weaving around on the... Uh, the back straight there, the Molsan straight down towards the first chicane, seventh gear, 318, 20, 21, still rising before the braking zone into that first chicane. Down into second gear, get on power as early as you can. See the graphic on the right hand side. Straight Glickenhaus. Ooh, yep. going on there? He was stuck there. The Glickenhaus, uh, yeah, it's kind of hesitated momentarily and they had a slower car on the left hand side so that bulked uh, Fuoco's progress and he's weaving he's kind yeah, of yeah what is not quite sure now it's not the time to try and get some pressures up in your uh... biggest ride you can really see the body language of the car the attitude's different from a car down in P8 compared to that of the, uh, the 51 car with Giovinazzi. It's just a different, it's more alive, more energetic. There is a desperate in the approach. And there's nothing to lose now when you're down there. Race Control says the full force yellow is under investigation, which is kind of a broad statement that they're checking uh, that someone may have done something wrong. And it's slippery down there as they see oh, yeah. You still see there's a lot of pebbles there. They've they've tried to clean the racing line, but there's a lot off. It's just, I don't know whether the wind has changed direction or what, but it's uh, maybe some oil down or something, but Fuoco immediately running wide. Almost uh, a copy of what happened to the uh, 34 car earlier on. Yeah, the gap at the top of the field now, 39. Pretty much 40 seconds between uh, the AF course Ferrari and the Toyota. Wind is switchy, Anthony, about 180 degrees from when we looked at it early in, early in the race. So.
Track temperature is 26.6. Ambient is just under 20 degrees centigrade. Wind speeds uh, 9 kilometers per hour. Humidity 70%. That's why uh, the first chicane took a month to dry out <laughs> last night. I took it till the sun came out yes. to, uh, to dry it off properly. I mean, it, that lasted forever, didn't it? The, yeah. the slippery conditions. What a brutal race for the drivers it's been. Set of medium tyres there, ready to go on the number 51 Ferrari. And again, interesting to see they, they tend to choose the medium. Toyota tend to go for the soft. As the temperatures rise in the daytime, do you think we'll see that strategy change a little bit and we may see them go now, he's back in. Sorry, yes. Do you know what it was? It had to have a splash, didn't it? Under the pit lane. Yes, closed. it did. That Ferrari had to splash, so he's back in for a full service this time. The oh, car. Oh, oh, the penalty oh, anyway. We do tires and fuel, you stay the car, tires and fuel. And, and here comes sense. the 33 car. So you have to serve, you have to come back in within uh, a lap of so going well, green. So that's. Uh, both being done perfectly by both crews. I wonder if Ben Keating will get in now. Uh, that's exactly right. I bet he will, and that's why they didn't get in. So a couple of teams there stung by that uh, pit lane being closed under the uh, the yellow that we had. So uh, uh, it's uh, even more time loss for all those that suffered that. But However, a break for Keating is the fact that the uh, Project 1AO Porsche, uh, Rexy, is also in the pits for their uh, stop. And in fact, here comes Ben sliding into the Corvette. Katzberg gets out. Katzberg will stay and help with the with the belts. A lot of times you see mechanics do that. New set of Michelin boots going on. Rexy, I love the arms there. I still don't know why. Maybe you know the answer to this guy, but why the GT cars, the, the driver helps the other driver. They effectively become the driver helper, don't they, in, in terms of installing the next guy, the next uh, driver in. But the LMP cars is all I've ever really known. You always have a, a dedicated driver helper. I think with the GT car, the driver can actually do more. So uh, when I did GTs, I, I'd always do my own lap belts. And then the driver getting out can then do the shoulder belt, so it's quite straightforward. Whereas in a prototype, it's, it tends to be you jump in, you lift your arms up, and they do your full belts. It's so difficult to, to such sort of move in the cockpit to actually do much yourself. And I think um, there's just a bit more, yeah, a bit more space. And then it frees up effectively another person. Um, you've got you've got less bodies in the pit. So. Yeah. Well, and the other thing too is, is that with the um, with the GT car. in where with the LMP uh, with the with the prototypes the, the mechanic has got less around his head smaller opening exactly. he can get in there and help I was just thought you know whenever I got out of the car, car you're in a kind of you know you're in a fluster you you all you want all you could think about is just get out get back into the garage I'm knackered I do all I want to do is get the helmet off drink cool down as quick as I can I, I would have been worried I would make mistakes in installing the next driver and be slower as well than a, than a driver helper that's dedicated to the job. So I'm, I'm surprised they've got the, the energy and also the capacity to, uh, to do such an important job. It, you know, it's such a responsibility. It after, tends, yeah, it tends to be the, um, the, the, the driver getting out will just do the shoulder belts. So the driver will do the getting in, will do the, the, the lap belts. The driver gets out, will do the shoulder belts. And then it's usually a thumbs up, you know, are you good? Are you yeah. good to go? I'm good to go. Door gets closed and, and away you go. Is, is there an opportunity to communicate? You know, sometimes, the, sometimes the, the, it might the be just. Brakes are knackered, or you know. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's 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 often it's very very quick. It's you know, car's good, or it's got big oversteer, or it's a very very sort of quick exchange. Uh, but uh, yeah, kind of, kind of look him in the face and say, "I've thrashed it for you." <laughs> Slap him on the knee. And <laughs> good luck. <laughs> it was fine when I got out of it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's making a funny noise. It'll be all right. <laughs> Nothing to worry about though. Your new leader in the GTM category, the Iron Dames. 
Rahel Frey behind the wheel of that car. We just saw Bobe looking on from the pits. Again, these girls are doing a great job. They keep, they're just, they, depending on pit stops, they're either fir first or the third. They're, they've been in the, in the hunt all day. And, and these girls are inspiring so many females um, in motorsport. And, um, you, know, you see, you go to a local go-kart track now, and do you see the amount of girls, uh, young ladies racing? And this is partly down to teams like this, this that are inspiring these girls. This event has a long tradition of female participation, dating back to 1930. In fact, 65 women have competed in this event in the past. Fantastic. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's going to boil down to this again, isn't it? It was inevitable. Of course it was. The 33 yellow Corvette versus the car we're looking at on screen. The Iron Dame's pink Porsche. It's, this has been the story all season long, usually in qualifying, to be fair. But it's usually that epic fight uh, between Ben Keating in qualifying versus Saura Bovi. And, uh, you know, the order's a little bit mixed up in this long race today. 33's had a severe setback near the start of the race. And I never expected, I was with you, Jim, I never yeah. expected us to be even remotely thinking about the, the prospect of Corvette being on the lead lap, let alone potentially challenging the Iron Dames, uh, the leaders of this race in the last six and a half hours. So, uh, yeah, I can't wait to, to see that gap slowly close down, but Ben Keating is now behind the wheels. We saw him jump in with Rahel Frey driving the Iron Dames. And, and a great statement for Porsche as well, because they didn't even put one car in the hyperbole. Yeah, in, in the class. There were, there were eight cars in GTM, and not one of them carried the, the gold shield. It's like I always say, you're probably bored of hearing me say it, <laughs> I never ended an endurance race, ever, and thought, you know what, I wish I could have had a better qualifying session. That's right. <laughs> All it is, is a, it's a great way, it's a muscle flexing contest qualifying, particularly for the 24 hours of Le Mans. I've never known somebody qualify on pole and, uh, you know, breeze off into the distance and go, yep, it was all because of that pole. My That's wife how we it willy wagging. <laughs> <laughs> Through the Porsche curves goes the uh, Ferrari, number 51. That's our race leader, Antonio Giovinazzi. And he's really taken to this, isn't he? Uh, oh, very his much first so. season in full-time sports car racing in the car that he wants to be in, the yes. Ferrari, the car he never had a chance to race in Formula One. He, that was his primary goal. Sure. You know, like many drivers, they start off, like Guy mentioned, go-karts, single-seaters, you get into first, and you, you, you kind of blinker. It's that, it's that fast track to Formula One. It's all you can really think of when you're young and you've come out of, of, of you know, junior formula single seaters and this probably wouldn't have been on his radar he would never have envisaged it happening so early in his career but my goodness he's not looking back now let's check in with uh, okay, so have a track limit at turn three oh, this lap fifth call track limit turn three fifth call so that's he's now used up all of his free ones yeah five so. jokers you're allowed five jokers before you get a penalty so the momentum's just starting to shift a little bit towards yeah. um, the Ferrari. Everything just slightly going in their favor, a little bit more speed. Webb is on the max out on his... Uh... Copy. Yeah, unsurprisingly. Tires are completely what? Yeah, completely flat spotted. Oh, unsurprisingly, well, yeah, because... Like we saw. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, if that was a huge lockup into, uh, well, around turn one, basically, wasn't it? Yes. A yep. Fast right hander and uh, inside right wheel. I wonder if that's got anything to do with the, uh, with this, this the uh, roll distribution switch oh, sure. is stuck. Yeah. Possibly. Because yeah, you may have put the put too much weight forward or back. And, yeah. And, if you're if you're too light in the front, is that going to give you a tendency to lock the front? Yeah, too stiff yeah. on the front end, yeah. under braking, and uh, you know you, you got that extra extra load going through the front axle of the car, less compliance basically, yeah. and easier to lock up. I, I do wonder if they're 
they're, they're really on the back foot there. This flat spot will not be helping at all. And it loses speed on the straight as well, as we well know, yeah. guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just causes that, that extra drag. It's been a long race for the, uh, the Action Express car 311. Obviously, they've lost a lot of time there in the race. What well, happened so early in a 24 hour race, and you kind of just play and catch up, it's. Uh, It's probably you know, as much as anything as a test, it's a great opportunity to get more miles on the ball. Test the car. On board of the two car, Richard Westbrook behind the wheel now. This is third overall. So we have Ferrari, Toyota, Cadillac number two, Cadillac number three, and then the Peugeot 93. Now, much like the Ben Keating story, who would have thought that the, if we were going to see a Peugeot in the top five, that it would be the 93 car? Uh, yeah, you know. again, <laughs> Nick Agnes is at the wheel at the moment, but uh, yeah, there was a time when we wouldn't have been uh, wouldn't have been surprised at all if it didn't make it back out of the garage. Good job, Richard. Good job. People behind is not for position. He's down. his fastest lap of the race on a 28, 328.5. So he's not he's not hanging about, he's pushing on and trying to extend that gap over Sebastian Weber, which is now 43 seconds. Yeah, there's going to be no waiting around at this point. There's no, certainly with uh, six and a half hours remaining in the race, it's still, still keep it, keep, keep it going. I think you've got to, I think as a, as a driver and as, as a team, if you start to drive slightly conservatively, that's when the mistakes happen and, you know, you lose concentration. So I think absolutely flat out, full focus, and, um, you know, that's that's what you need to do. Maybe not maybe not 10 tenths, but certainly 9 tenths, because the other thing, too, is that any margin that you build becomes a safety net if you do have a problem later on. It may not be a big enough safety net, but at least you've got something. You know, and Ke Kevin Estra there, he's also doing a 3.28.3 at the port, which is, you know, that's actually quicker than the leader's fastest lap, so it just shows there is the pace in that car. LMP2 leader into the pits. Got some new tires standing by, some new Goodyear's. We may see a tire change. The Goodyear uh, engineer tire tech going, uh, giving those uh, a pretty close inspection. Yeah, it's usually when they want to keep those same set of tyres on. So you've got their, the other tyres all ready to go just in case. And then the thumb goes up from uh, the guy that was just checking the tyres. Yeah, so fuel in. And I should expect they're going to keep those tyres on for another stint. So just a precautionary measure that's taken. It makes sense to, uh, to do that because yeah, without the, the help of the tyre technician, Cutting the tire, right, sure. something you just can't see from inside the car, and the mechanics are, are doing their job around the car. And uh, you know, yeah, they don't have time to do no a way. tire inspection. No way. So uh, you know, they're better suited to the job than, than the person that's uh, in, involved in the, the tire manufacturer themselves. And each of those engineers is embedded with the team. 
Yeah, so they also know the team strategy. They know what their compound plans are, what they've been using, what they what they want to use, what their plan is for the rest of the race. So he's he's fully in the know and can help them make their decisions. Here's the second place car in the class. Rui Andre. You see the total overtakes there. The hypercar yeah. category LP2 GTM. 8,000. 181 overtakes. Incredible stuff. Three class racing. There's passing everywhere. There's 2,727 overtakes per driver at this point in that car crew. Throw it up in the car crews for the uh, hypercar. No wonder some of them go wrong from yeah, time to time. Again. <laughs> I mean, that's a serious amount of uh, calculated, calculated risk to take, should we say. Yeah. Yeah, I did work it out once because uh, during the LMP days, we have obviously they were even faster than the app today, and you were catching cars even quicker. I, I, roughly, you'd have to say it was around four, about four or five cars you were overtaking per lap at wow. any time. Wow. And uh, I worked out, yeah, no wonder it goes wrong sometimes because per driver in each car. With your time behind the wheel, around eight hours, you were right, sharing sure, it yeah. equally. Yeah. Uh, it was around 400, 450 cars were overtaking alone uh, per driver. Every, every, every one of them perfect. <laughs> perfect. That's, that's a big word. You'd, you'd be surprised how many the MSs. <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, you know, and you're thinking, that was close, that was close. <laughs> I'm and, glad it wasn't just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. You, know, you think back and you think, I know we won that race or we had a podium and it was really good. But the outside looks like it was really slick yeah. and you know <laughs> nicely operated. But oof, if that moment had just gone wrong there, oh yeah, when I, got, when I just thought I, you know, just getting it oh so close and thought I'd, I'd mastered that one. If that driver had just done this or that at that moment, it would have been a massive one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you, have you ever looked back at it? Going, what was I thinking? Like I say, it's calculated risk, and uh, you've got to have some cooperation on the, on the track. Yeah, you've got to have respect. And that's the important thing. Is is when you're racing closely, uh, particularly, you know, against your sort of peers, you've got to have that respect, and um, you know, it's fine mar fine margins. And you know, sometimes when you come up to some of the slower cars, they they don't always see you, and uh, you know, that's that's the danger. Is is getting collected. Sebastian Bourdais out of the number three car, Scott Dixon back in. These guys have uh, put in a, 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 another outstanding performance. This is a, so, so we've got a couple of comeback drives in each of these classes that are just very noteworthy. And this for me in hypercar is the, is the most noteworthy of, of all. Again, this was a car that, that, that was out of it and all we gotta do is have a little bit of trouble any of those three cars that are in front of them, and they are definitely in the shot for a podium. Yeah, Ryle Frey has just done the fastest lap of the uh, Iron Dames' car, so they're pushing on. They know that they, they've they got pressure from behind from the Corvette and the Project One car. So she's uh, done a great job there, and she's pushing, pushing hard to keep uh, that car up at the top spot. What an amazing story it would be. They're a get great car crew, like you said, Guy. Um, you know, had, a, had success already in the World Endurance Championship, but uh, this is the one they want. This is the one they want. They're, they're on track you know, the, to, to do that. Uh, you know, not a clean qualifying session for them. And, yeah, didn't make hyperpole, but uh, you know, the car we're looking at on screen didn't make hyperpole either. But they were in, right in there in the race. Place. The race. Yeah. yeah. Until they had their problem. I mean, I. I Surprised, honestly, still to see them in the race. They've had reliability has not been their friend uh, this year. Well, since they since they re returned to the World Endurance Championship, it hasn't been their friend. And uh, I think there were modest expectations, to say the least, from even within the team themselves to, to, in terms of the reliability of the car. And uh, I'll just I say that it's going yep. popping back into the garage. Can't see anything wrong with the car. No. But uh, I mean, look, you. 
you're, you're down there and effectively last place in, in hypercar at the moment anyway, but that's due to driver error, not because of yeah. reliability. So oh, Lord A out of the car now, local man. Report from the pit lane is that uh, oil temperature alarm on the Peugeot, so they have taken that back to further investigate. Okay, I wonder if that's anything to do with the earlier uh, shot that the car could very well be. First. Okay. A lot of talk now down in the Toyota pit about Webby coming in and switching to mediums. Yeah, they've been running the softs, haven't they, for the majority of the race, and the pace just isn't there. They're just losing time to the Ferrari. And I think they've got to kind of roll the dice a little bit here and maybe just try something different, try and go for the mediums. As, as we start to, as the track temperature starts to warm up, um, they might find that the medium tire is probably more in the window for them. So let's see how that works out. And of course, remember, he, he absolutely destroyed the same tires going up into the Dunlop chicane with that lockup. So, yeah, well, he'll be desperate to, sure. yeah, he's desperate to get, get rid, of rid of these things. And if that happens early on in the stint, you know, one of the first relaps, you've got to look at it. Yeah, well, well, yeah. well. As we said about that vibration, it's literally glitching your teeth and they're knocked out. So it's, it's an awful thing to have to drive with for, for a full stint. Six, PJ Hyatt, the man behind that is actually his uh, daughter, is the person behind that uh, T-Rex Porsche paint scheme there. And behind in his mirrors, where he's got an LMP2 car now, that's the number 41 in second place. Uh, driving that car, but further back, you've got the 33 car, there it is, with Ben Keating on board. And, uh, Instead of a dinosaur, I think we've got the shark. I think we're going to start hearing the Jaws music. Donna, 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 Donna. Here it comes. 51 comes in with Giovinazzi there. Race Team leader, this, this looks like it will probably be fuel only for the stop. There's uh, getting ready to take one of the... No, they're not going to take the tear off. Oh, it, what, they were pulling something off the, off the top of the top of the car, uh, top of the windscreen. Thought maybe they were going to go with the tear off, but then why would they clean the windscreen? It's the windscreen wiper. They, they uh, pull it back yeah, I guess. so they can Thank access you. more of the screen with the uh, cleaner fluid. And you don't want to go peeling off too many tear offs. You want to use them wisely. You've only got, uh, I think, 12 maximum can go okay, onto these screens. Box, 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 box for tires. Stay in the car. So, that's, that's just a couple times now. The Toyota has had to, oh, trouble now for the 709. That's the same place as yeah. 708. Had yeah. the exit of Indianapolis. Yeah, the 708 ran wide into the gravel, dropped a wheel, and bottomed out on the curb, and unfortunately went backwards into the barrier with Olivier Plath. 709 possibly done something similar. Very, <laughs> Almost can, the same. Can you say duplicate? But it oh, went in forward. Went in front, the, instead of the back. Yeah. What I was going to say about the Toyota, this is uh, at least two times that I've witnessed uh, personally, and I'm sure maybe it's happened before, that the drivers have gotten out of sequence with their tires. We saw it at the beginning of the race when they started in the sauce, and, and Webby stayed in the car, and they changed tires, and this time he's stayed in the car, and they've changed tires. They had to because of the flat spots, but yeah. I think this is going to be the first time we've seen tire go on the Toyota so yeah we're hearing that the Toyota has in fact come in now and yep, uh, switched switch those switch. mediums because with all of the uh, the rain that we had we kept getting the soft compound when you could be on slicks that was the one to be on yeah I think though that they did on that first stint when when they were went out on the softs and the racetrack started to dry enough they went to the mediums and then we got rain and then they went everybody came in wet tires. The number 50 Ferrari just posted again the fast lap of the race on a 327.8. Seriously great. Absolutely flying. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, like we said before, you know, they're out there taking the risks that you can now. Yeah. There's nothing to lose. You're down there in V8. So, you know, if you don't do that, then uh, you, it's, it's, here is the, the race. 
it's like your teammate. So yeah, there's the move as expected from Ben Keating on the car 56. No contest there. Another place gained and Keating now up into second place. Uh, look at that under braking, just absolutely perfect. But Hyatt went for the brakes. Ben said, see ya, you wanna be ya. Keating was a 3.55, and uh, the leader of that class at the moment, uh, Rachel Gray, 3.55 as well. She's, uh, yeah, keep it, maintaining that gap, but uh, got a feeling this, this fight's not over. No, no, no. no. Corbett's got some serious pace in it, as we saw in qualifying as well. Here comes the 7.09 back into the pits. So they, they were, I've heard uh, Jimmy Johnson and Jensen referring to it as a stock car. So you could call it a stock car. That's not a NASCAR. I mean, that? NASCAR is the National Association of Stock Car, stock car Automobile Racing. Easy for you to say. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, if you can't say it, no one's going to do it. Because in the, in the genesis of the sport, they were stock cars. They were, they were showroom model cars that guys would take and modify and, and, and turn into race cars. I mean, the actual the actual origins of the sport, believe it or not, were a group of guys who were moonshiners who used to use, you know, modify the cars to be able to stay ahead of the police and the revenuers. And, and they would have places in the car to hide the, the illegal liquor. And these guys would always be, as, as, as men are wont to do, would be bragging about whose car was better. So they started to get together on Friday and Saturday nights and race their cars on the dirt tracks. And that was really the genesis of stock car racing in America. I don't think anyone would have a chance of catching that uh, Chevrolet Camaro. No. <laughs> <laughs> they would hear it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that would go against it. Much much like those uh, jets that we heard flying <laughs> over yesterday. <laughs> oh, so the glick of that Yeah. Struggling with the um, 708 car, the gold side of you knows, and they they had to change the stickers. Yeah, and they they had had to now that one looks pretty damaged as well. So looks like the old gaffer tape's coming out. Oh dear, a bit like Peugeot found themselves in that situation in Sebring, wow. yeah. round one, and they were desperately peeling off the. I can't remember which way around it was. Number three, number four, they're peeling off the stickers yeah. of one of them to put <laughs> the, the other one on the car. Oh. Look at the gap at the top uh, between the Ferrari and... Uh, wow, Ferrari. it's out to a minute. Good spot, guy. It's after that pit stop, of course, for Buemi. Ah, good point. So, set back out there on the medium tires now. But it's, it's not what I... It's, it's this part of the race is not what I expected. I did think really? the Toyota would have the speed to match the Ferrari. Not necessarily be faster, but uh, I didn't expect the Ferrari to just be streaking away now. In his first full lap, though, he has set a personal best sector one. Let's check in in the pits. I'm just at Glickenhaus, and the 709, they're actually doing the work in the pit lane to fix that car. But at the same time, the 708 has now come in for a pit stop as well, so they're both side by side. The team are still working on that 709 at the front of it at the moment. I'll um, let you know what happens. I'll try and speak to somebody from the team. Yeah, he went in at, uh, both of them have now had problems at Indianapolis going wide on driver's right, hitting the, hitting the gravel with the right rear tires and then, and then bouncing uh, and spinning. The uh, 708 went in on the driver's left, the 709 went in on driver's right. So they both uh, had contretemps at the same spot. They've had to put it on the uh, on the trolley. They, they should have really put that car, the 709, in the garage, but it's ready to go now. That was a that was a troubled moment for Glickenhaus trying to get that front end on that car. It really didn't want to go at one point. I wonder if it 
bent something else yeah. further oh, yes. back. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Or, or even one of the attachment clips, you know, if you've got the, well, they couldn't the, even the round get, peg and the round yeah. hole. And it seemed like they couldn't even get it close enough to ah, get the peg yeah. to, to do its thing. Jim Pivenhouse watches on. And, uh, he's now seen two of his cars get rotated at the, uh, the same corner. I've said it before, I'll say it again. History will look upon this man as one of the unsung heroes of sports car racing. A man who believes in the project, has you know, done it all out of his own pocket. That's kind of uh, much like I was talking moments ago about the foundation of stock car racing. That's kind of the foundation of sports car racing. said she was going to see if she could find somebody at Clicking House. Sounds like she may have. I'm with Ryan Briscoe, driver of the 70 Clicking House. Uh, you guys can't get the race right now, can you? Yeah, I mean, it's a shame, you know, because uh, we had both cars sort of looking top five, but hey, we've still got a lot of racing left to do. Um, and both cars are running strong, so, you know, we're going through some notes and stuff, but, um, been a bit of a theme of the race, I think, for everybody. Uh, after the team bought the 708 in to fix all of the repairs with that one, 709 had a very similar one. They thought they could do it with the pit lane. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think I think we we had a bit of suspension damage on our one, so they had to bring it in, uh, do the suspension uh, on that one. It was just body work, so they were able to do it in pit lane pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, not the sort of things you want to have to do during the 24-hour race, but uh, you know, we have a great crew here. They do it as quickly as they can, and uh, we've got both cars on track. Uh, and, and honestly, we're running a pretty good pace, so we've been really happy with how the race has been going. Absolutely, and your history here is that actually you've always been there at the end. Yeah, yeah, no, and we know that's our strength. And we really went in with the mindset we didn't want to have any mistakes, no penalties. We've had a bit of both, but, um, you know, we're just going to do our best here and uh, see what result we can pull out of it. You two six hours. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so it's uh, just over a normal race distance to go. We've got the Ferrari 51 leading Antonio Giovinazzi. Uh, Sebastian Webby just set a personal best for the Toyota, a 329.3. Well, meanwhile, further down, Antonio Fuoco, our pole sitter, just set the fastest lap of the race at a 327.434. Yeah, almost two seconds a lap quicker than the uh, Toyota, so it just shows the Toyota is definitely lacking some pace to take the fight to the Ferrari. It all goes, also goes to show that the top three are really only there because they've had the, the least problems. I mean, they've, yeah. got, they've got speed as well, but you look at the number two Cadillac as a prime example of you keep your nose clean and a race like this, such a high attrition rate, such difficult conditions for the drivers. We mentioned that Brian Briscoe touched on it there as well. You know, everyone's had their fair share of misdemeanors, but the Cadillac has really had one of the cleanest races and they're right up there on a podium position. Now we've had a change in uh, GTM is for second place. The uh, Oman Racing Team by TF, uh, Charlie Eastwood, has now gotten by Ben Keating in the number 33 cor uh, Corvette for second place in the class. Of course, the Iron Dames continue to lead. Rahel Fry behind the wheel there. Yeah, Charlie Eastwood. There you see him in the background of that shot. Uh, Eastwood in the orange Aston Martin. Yeah, Charlie is, uh, I think he's a gold-rated driver, not platinum, he's gold. So uh, he's super quick in these cars. Well, he's a super quick driver anyway. He drives LMP2 as well. He's an experienced endurance racer. And uh, yeah, so he's uh, in a different category of you know, graded driver compared to Ben Keating, who's a bronze. So that's, that explains why Charlie's really uh, flying up through the field at this stage. Let's go back down to, uh, to Louise. Yes, I'm with Paul Chatin from the 48 EDEC Sport. I mean, hyper pole feels like a long time ago, but uh, you did an incredible job putting that car on pole. Yeah, I propose, you know, it was a 
Thursday, so now it's full time job, but yeah, it was a great feeling to come as well. Team did a great, great job, so for sure it was nice to start from pole position for, for this race. After, you know, now we are six hours from the end of the race and still fighting for, for a good position, uh, maybe a podium. Paul just finished his driving style, time, which is good because now we will be able to push as maximum as possible till the end and to try to come back on the podium. Has the race balance of, um, of the car felt the same, so from uh, qualifying to the race performance? Uh, the balance is more or less the same. Of course, we, we are just a bit the setup to have a bit more of understeer because it's always better to have a little bit of understeer for a 24 hours race. But uh, the balance is quite pretty good, the car is very fast and uh, just feel not close to, to be able to, to catch uh, the top. Currently running seventh, uh, you've got a great team here. They always put in a good effort here at Le Mans, so you're feeling confident? Yeah, I'm, I'm confident, but you know, the others are, are really good too, so we'll do our best. And I would be really happy to be able to come back P4, P3, P2, P1 maybe. Uh, that start of that race is the only word we've all been using is crazy. I don't know, did you start the car? So how, has, how challenging has this particular Le Mans been? Sorry, how challenging for the drivers has this Le Mans been? Because we've had rain, we've had dry, we've had so much going on, a lot of incidents from the start. Yeah, it was a very difficult uh, first part of the race. The, the start was quite okay, just the first chicken in the Nodia was wet, so we, we had to be careful there. But uh, yes, honestly, the 10 first hours were really challenging. A lot of pressure because when you are in Le Mans, it's dry at some corners and it's wet at others. And it's very difficult to manage for the entire strategy, even for the driver. We don't know if we can push or not. We, we saw a lot of mistakes just because sometimes when, when there is a lot of water, we are just a passenger in the car and we just try to survive. When are you back in? Sorry? When are you back in? Uh, I will be back in uh, something like two hours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Louise Beckett down there patrolling pit lane for us. Interesting conversation. Yeah, good insight from Chatan there yeah. because, you know, you hear it from the horse's mouth that it's what a tough, what a tough Le Mans it's been. We, we, we can only watch on and uh, you know, imagine. Uh, was that some dust yeah, getting dust pulled up there? Or just a car? No, it was. Ah. It's an uh, LMP2, the soft. 45 that car, that's the, the uh, crowd strike. Entry. The Algarve Pro Car. Algarve, yep, thank you. Where are they in the order 45? They are on the other timing screen. Yes, they are. The leading Pro Am. Yeah, they're 23rd, uh, 11th in class. They're right, right behind the Alpine uh, number 35. Well, not right behind, but that's who they're chasing. But yeah, Chatan, going back to that, you know, one of, clearly one of the stars in qualifying, and we were all talking about Foco and that pole position, epic stuff at Ferrari, uh, their, 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 the front row lockout. Uh, but yeah, Chatan in the LMP2, it's, uh, it's a hard fought category, is LMP2. Everyone on the Orica, same engines, you know, it's a, it's a spec car, spec chassis. Um, so to do that, it's a, it's a real testament to uh, the, the driver's skill. And, uh, yeah, really insightful saying how we knew we had a good qualifying car and we've had to work on the balance coming into this race. You're always putting in a little bit more understeer to uh, just stop the car from being so pointy, so edgy to drive, to uh, allow a little bit more understeer in the car to give the driver an easier time, particularly when the amateur driver gets in, as you, as you have to have in LMP2. And there you see the 45 car going off. Let's head back to the pits. I'm with Jock van Oite from the 65 Canis Racing, bringing the car in in fourth, just jumping out. You look like you've worked hard. Yeah, I think I've already got a full 24 hours for my feeling, and I still have to do the last uh, three hours, I think. So it will be tough, but uh, I'm looking forward for the challenges. That's me. Yeah, and it's, it's going well. Like. We are fighting for the podium, so I think we have a good good chance. Uh, we just need everything to work out as well towards the end with uh, pit stops, etc. But so far, it, it's looking quite good. 
we don't always see planets racing, we do see you at Le Mans. So how does the team, team come together? Do, are you doing ELMS with them? Yeah, we do the full ELMS together with Manuel and Taima. So this is just we, because last year we finished second in ELMS, so we got the entry for Le Mans. Uh, so that's why we, we do this event, but normally Barnes is always, uh, always here. Right, well hopefully I'll be speaking to you again soon. Yeah, thank you very much. So just under six hours remaining, we're at the three-quarter mark of the Centenary Le Mans, the 91st running of this great event, but the 100th anniversary of the first one in May of 1923. And right now, Ferrari leads Le Mans. We haven't said that for a long, long time. In fact, the last time that Ferrari was able to win this great race was in 1965. 50 years ago was the last time that they were here with a frontline car. That was the 312 PB that sat on the pole at this great race. Currently, Antonio Giovinazzi leads in the Ferrari, chased by Sebastian Buemi in the Toyota. He is almost a full minute behind at 59.8 seconds. And then comes two Cadillacs, the number two car with Richard Westbrook behind the wheel, and then Scott Dixon in the number three car. Let's check in with the Ferrari team. Hey man, gap is steady at 61 seconds. Good job managing the traffic. So all is uh, seemingly going well for that car in LMP2. We have the Interpol, Inter-Europol, Interpol. I knew I was going to say that eventually. <laughs> They're not a crime stopping unit. They're a, a, a bakery concern. The uh, Interpol. We are much better with those tires, much better. I just got so unlucky the last two laps. Hopefully you can see now, it's much better. If you've just joined us, uh, yeah, Sebastian Boimi has not been happy with that car throughout. He uh, flat spotted his tires the first part of his stint. Let's catch you up on the other classes before we do anything else. The inter Europol competition uh, car number 34 leads in LMP2. Team WRT with Rui Andre behind the wheel is second. And Team Duquesne is third, the number 30 car with Neil Yanni behind the wheel. The Hendrick Motorsports innovative car, the NASCAR Camaro, has now climbed to 29th overall. They are uh, just racing for uh, to see what kind of position they can get at the end of this race. And then behind them is our new uh, GTM leader, the uh, Charlie Eastwood in the orange uh, Aston Martin number 25. He's chased by uh, Corvette Racing's Ben Keating in the number 33. Then comes the Project One AO Porsche of uh, PJ Hyatt, and then Rachel Freya in the uh, Iron Dames number 85. Those look like the four cars that are probably going to fight this out here in the final six hours. Uh, the Iron Dames were leading until they made a pit stop. So that kind of catches you up with what's going on. I'm Jim Roller uh, alongside Peter Dumbreck and Anthony Davidson. And, and gentlemen, we hope that this race would be given that it is the centenary celebration and epic event. And so far, it, it is pretty much lived up to the hype. Absolutely, it's been a, a fantastic race. We've we've seen the top category again, hypercar, um, reignited after um, a few years where, you know, the numbers were not so great. Now we've got so many manufacturers in here and only gonna get stronger from here into next year. Uh, but right down the field, the three different classes that it's dipping tuck between uh, the first three cars so it's, it's great to see all these battles taking place on on track yeah it's been a an enthrilling uh le mans 24 hours like you say for the centenary very fitting let's hear what boy has okay, got to say so we did get a track warning uh for turn three the other lap when you're pushed out we'll try and do something but the onboard isn't uh it isn't there isn't clear i got the chicane i got pushed so yeah I mean, here we uh, go uh, as well as we know he's he's on his five jokers and yeah. one more and uh he's going to get some kind of penalty so uh He's had the he's had the warning flag, and okay, that's what they're, the that, that's what they're thank you, that's what they're uh, stressing about right now. So they're trying to get the onboard to prove if they need it, prove it to the race stewards 
because they could get caught up. So we'll keep an eye on our uh, telemetry screens that we have to see if that is the case. So, so it his. sounds like he got pushed off in the chicane yeah. by another car. So that, that would explain it. And if he can prove that, then, you know, fair enough. If you're physically pushed off the track, then you know, that, that's not uh, through any fault of, uh, of Seb. But that's also another reason to try and keep one in the bank just in case that does happen. Boy, let's go back down to pit lane. It's not looking good for Prema. They've already retired the 63, and now the 9 is in the garage. I haven't seen what's happened, if you guys have, but I will try and speak to the team once they've finished working on this car. That car has gone through many tribulations. It's been on the hook at least twice that I remember. It's funny, isn't it, when we get to uh, the daylight, you can tell that the, the marshals or the stewards or whoever's looking at track limits, they can see a bit more, they wake up a little bit more, and suddenly it becomes more of a thing. In the nighttime, we didn't hear anything about track limits, it'd be funny enough, it's yeah. so hard to see. You you would see across the bottom of the screen occasionally, it would occasionally. go somebody, but yeah, but not with the regularity. <laughs> yeah, right. we, we've yeah. seen zero penalties so far. With all, that's true. With all the, you know, leading up to this, um, all the qualifying sessions, all the laps getting deleted, I was pretty sure by, say, I was six that we'd see the first penalties, but sure. actually, we've seen nothing Certainly so by half distance. Yeah. It's, Certainly by half distance. It's always the way in WEC. You know, they go, it's Eduardo Freitas, he's the race director, it's his style. He goes very hard on the drivers in the beginning, FP1, oh. FP2, calls them up into the stewards room, gives them five minute stop and go penalties during free practice sessions, really comes down on them hard. And then when it comes to the race, it all kind of eases off in a hope that the lessons that he's put down, yeah, he lay, lays down the law early on. He, he hopes that, uh, it, you know, everyone starts behaving themselves. What's the definition of crazy? Oh. The same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. So if you've been called in on the carpet in the early going, hopefully you, you'll, you'll learn and it makes everybody's life better during the race. The thing that's tough for the, for the driver as well, that FP1, FP2, you're really learning the ropes. Oh, that's and so going off the track is more commonplace. That was always my argument. That, you know, you, you, it's, of course you're going to make more mistakes in, in, in when the track's dusty, you're trying to get up to speed. And, you know, you have to, you, you make, you, it's natural you make mistakes and you bring it back from there. You didn't need necessarily like an extra punishment or reminder that it's not the right thing to do. And uh, so you know, it does come with some frustration as well. It's not easy to, to stay within those white lines at all times. And that's why we've seen such a lot of incidents on this track that's pretty unforgiving around certain points. Yeah, I don't know. There are some people that would believe that if you give them an inch, they take a call. Well, you will, but only when there's no immediate uh, risk involved. So, yeah. well, as I always said, there's a psychological impact when you've got a white line or a barrier. It, you know, it's close to the edge of the track. It's here from Estra. Yeah, so he's got uh, some tyre issues as well, some vibrations going on on that uh, number six Porsche, Penske Porsche entry. But, uh, yeah, and some discussions down in the, uh, in the pits as well. And then here on the Cadillacs, the 311 car on the inside, big lock up into the double chicane. Gets away with it, I think. I'm just going to carry a mark flat spot from that one. You know, Jim, you were talking about the, the differences, what, what, what you, you know, give a driver an inch, you'll take a mile. The job of the driver is to, is to take that mile. <laughs> is, no, is to just work these little angles to try and, you know, be that little bit better than your competitors and um, produce a faster lap time and a safer lap time and think about all these factors. And, you know, as soon as you see one car doing something that you think is quicker, you're going to do doing it. Watch the exit thing. of karting, look at karting, watch for the white line. So yeah, you go, you know the fastest way is to go as close to that white line with the left hand tyres oh, right. yep. as possible. It's not, so you give yourself a little bit of margin most of the time. So you saw half the car go over there. Now, if there's a barrier totally there, illegal. If that's totally yeah, it's totally illegal. Legal. If there's a barrier there, very close proximity to the edge of the track, that you know will be a, a serious consequence if you were to go straying too far. Now, it's easy for someone sitting there to go, yeah, but why can't you do that with a white line? Because of the psychological impact. To, uh, as I always say, I don't know anything about rallying. I would, I would be scared to drive rally fit on all those trees around. On the gravel over all those jumps. Tell you what, cut all the trees down and put white lines on the side. Oh, here we go. I'll take it flat wherever I want to go. If I run out of 
bit wider. Yeah, it's only a white line. Yeah, that's a good yeah, analogy. That's my yeah. analogy. So that's, that's the analogy. psychological impact, whether you're staring at a gravel trap, a barrier, a bit of grass, a white line, it doesn't cut it. It never will cut it. So the drivers will naturally just take a few extra liberties. This corner here in, in uh, Porsche Cars is well. space so driving through the corner you, you felt that you had more space and then it came in and you're, you're driving up to the car and you're very close and we've seen a few cars in that barrier yeah, already sure. and it, it compresses the the track slightly and you feel oh it's, it's yeah. really tight whereas it used to feel a lot wider through there it's like walking across a it's like walking across a beam isn't it you know it's just walking it's right. fine and the beam is quite low to the ground and if you fall off it you can walk the normal speed across that beam right now if you were to put that beam way up high in the air what are you going to do for how a lot slow of are you going to walk yeah, across that beam it four feet off the ground <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> that's the psychological yeah. impact so the white line is the equivalent of that beam being super low to the ground <laughs> you know you you know imagine if so you're going to get told off if you fall off that beam yeah but you know it's still just it's not the same as you being actually physically scared yeah, for your life if you fell off that beam. And you'll never be able to replace that. It's human preservation, self-preservation. Yeah, self yeah. So yeah, we got there in the end. A long winded answer. Yeah. It's a long winded race. <laughs> So he is, like he said on the radio, feeling much happier yeah. on those medium tyres. And he said to the guys, look, watch my lap times. I'm feeling much more comfortable. I know I was in traffic the last two or three laps. So ignore those. Yeah, last lap around 3.29 compared to Giovinazzi's 3.31. Of course, it, it comes and goes with traffic. But um, that gap has come there. 58.8 seconds now. See the choreography. Yeah, it's a beautiful it takes watch, place in a world endurance racing pit stop. They allowed four guys over the wall once the fueling is done. Ooh, that's uh, that's some fresh debris. That's new. That's yeah, definitely going to need to be cleared up, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, but somebody has carried on. I'm sure that would be a slow zone. Six is now active. Slow zone six is now active. He does not allow any marshal to go near the racing surface. Oh, and it was the 38. Oh, Sorry, the 38 Jim. Car. The 38 car was the one that uh, the is the cold brakes. Felix Da Costa at the wheel there. He doesn't allow anyone on the racing surface. 
purpose to do any cleanup unless he has the target. Uh, of course. And I, and I, well, that isn't the way it used to be, Anthony. Look at this. It's really similar to the Glickenhaus incident, wasn't it? Just yeah. dipped the right rear wheel momentarily onto the gravel, catches the slide one way and uh, shoots him round the other. He's made it back to the pits. Let's go to Louise. Don't forget, that's the car that pretty much had all of its bodywork replaced after the incident earlier in the race. And I was speaking to the team earlier. They said um, after the 75 Porsche Penske retired, they gave their spare bodywork over to the Hertz Team Jota team as a backup. And the, the team have been preparing it, trying to get the 75 livery off, put their own on, and it uh, looks like they might need it. We can't wow, see that's, that. That's nose. pretty cool. Yeah. Is that going to have to go back in the garage? I think yeah, it will. that's I definitely know, there because is it nose. looks like he's broken it's some of the, it's some a black the structure carbon, isn't there. It? Yeah. Oh. That was a pretty hard hit. Oh, it's the structure of the nose, not the not the chassis. So that's yeah, the, it's that's the yeah the crumple zone. It's the only thing yeah. that's left of that uh, nose assembly. The crumple crumbled. It did its job, didn't it? Well, this is the. Uh, this is the. Uh, looks like it's a new livery because it's got black uh, black fenders with, yeah, the, with the, some from, with some wrap put on with some stickers. Yeah, they've uh, they, they've done the best they can in yeah. a short time to get that car looking. Uh, well, they get the livery back on. That's the least of their problems right now. Or oh, they having a look at that front right as well. That's sustained some damage, I think. Could that be part of the brake cooling, or is it a bit of body work only? Oh, I see the energy graphics there on the left-hand side of the screen. Getting ready for, uh, where you got 20%, so, stops. yeah, another round coming up. Going through the slow zone is the... from the obvious of staying off that exit curb. I don't know what else could be done to stop these incidents, you know, the car snapping. Well, yeah, because they're once they drop off, the wheel, yeah, the, that, the, 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 yeah, where that gravel bottoms. ends is squared off, yeah. and it's and it's, you have the curb, and then you have uh, asphalt, and that just is launching the rear end of the car, and then when it catches, it's going to go whichever direction you may or may not have the front wheels turn. It's just an unfortunately shaped curb with a, it's like a, it's like a triangle on its side. So as soon as you go up and over that triangular edge, it just dips you straight into the stone. So it's, uh, you've got support at, uh, only up to a certain point, then you drop off the other information side. Information to the pit lane, information to the pit lane. This is going to take longer than we expected because we will need to repair the guardrails on driver's left. On driver's left? That's interesting. wonder if that is, well, yeah, the the Hertz car didn't actually contact on the left side. It no. contacted only on the right. There was a bit of stunning camera work before I came on it. At it is the right. It yeah. is the right. Yeah, he's got his left and right ah, mixed up. Cookie hand, Eduardo. Cookie hand. Um, there was some stunning camera work before I came on of the when the 908 went off of the dropping the wheel in that gravel and then kicking it and sending it on its way. Let's go to Louise. Just picking up again on the Hertz Team Jota incident, Antonio Felix da Costa is out of the car and he's gone around to everybody in the team, shook their hands saying, sorry, mate. Uh, just goes to show the team ethos here, but also, you know, how he's feeling about that. Yeah, he's a real team player, is Antonio. We all know that, and uh, he'll be absolutely kicking himself for that mistake and uh, you know he had, he had survived the hardest bit all the way through the rain he yeah. watched his teammate uh, give up the lead by crashing out in the Porsche curves and you know Antonio had driven a, a brilliant race up until that point real survivor it's a rare mistake for him but uh, it goes to show how unforgiving like I said before how unforgiving some parts of this track can be and that's one of them we've seen so many drivers make that a similar mistake, the Glickenhouses just moments ago. 
both of them. Yeah, to name, name but a few. Yeah, so both both of them make a mistake. You know, we talk about experienced drivers here as well, and that's part of the challenge of Le Mans. You know, you get to this stage at uh, 20 past 10 in the morning, the sun's back up, you're still out there doing it, you're so tired. Yeah. Your and focus just oh, drops slightly yeah. for a short amount of time. You yeah. put the car, I mean, he was literally probably three inches too wide there. Yeah. And, yeah. and it was enough just to drop the tire off and round she goes. So we saw a shot of the United Auto Sports cars running in tandem. The 22 and 23, both of those cars have had eventful races. The 22 car is currently 11th with the Freddie Lubin behind the wheel and the 23 car with Ollie Jarvis is in 12th position. There they are going through the second chicane. Separated now by the Ferrari, the race leading Ferrari number 51 and one of the Peugeots. crowd have been absolutely treated, haven't they, to one of, if not the best Le Mans I've ever seen. The biggest uh, crowd I've ever seen has uh, gotten their money's worth. <laughs> yeah, big time, sure. big time. I mean, yeah, they couldn't have asked for any more action, nope. really. And uh, yeah, still five and a half hours to go for this race. It's uh, under a minute between the lead car and second place in the uh, hypercar category. Richard Westbrook in the Cadillac number yeah. two, still on the lead lap as well. Three cars on the lead lap. Three cars on the lead, yeah. I, I frankly thought we'd have at least one or two more. Yeah. Based on yeah, based on what we saw earlier on in the yeah. race. But there was a moment in the race I honestly thought, I don't know if I can keep up with this for 24 hours. <laughs> Let's go to Louise. Juan Manuel Correa, you from the number nine Prema, you've stayed in that car the whole time. The team have been working on it, just holding on, and I'm so sorry that you've stepped out now. So tell us the situation. Yeah, it seems like we have a, a broken starter. So our race was already already over before that with, with the accident we had uh, during the night. We were just uh, trying to finish the race. I think we'll be back out in the track soon, but uh, I'm going to step out and Bent is going to go in now and and take it. Uh, yeah, a shame because the pace is really, really good. I was running with uh, with the front runners through my whole stint, and uh, we're competitive, but uh, it wasn't meant to be. And we can see how hard and fast the team are working to get that car back out. Yeah, they're amazing. We we had a broken crankshaft after the the accident we had in the night, and they changed everything in 20 minutes. We thought we were done, and, and they got the car back out there. So shout out to them. Uh, yeah, hey, it's Le Mans, first time here. I, I'm still. Uh, You were with us in Portugal, was that right? And then you're here at Le Mans. How are you finding endurance racing? It's awesome. Honestly, I, I love every second of it. It's so different, especially this race. You know, Portugal was already very different for me than F2, what I'm, what I'm racing. But this is a whole different level. So uh, a lot of learning. Uh, I got up to speed, which I'm happy about. And I'm just enjoying the experience. Um, you've worked really hard to get back up to fitness anyway for um, after your accident. But how much more do you have to do for this? I've seen some of your socials where you're training in between all of your uh, all of your stints. Well, it's tough, you know. I, I'm sweating. Uh, it's we're doing three, almost four hour stints sometimes in uh, here in endurance, and you need a lot of concentration. I think my, mainly my preparation is more cognitive and mental. You have to stay focused. You have a lot of traffic, and uh, it's very intense. Great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. I think one of the things that people don't still even even as much as the sport of auto racing has grown throughout the world in the last three four decades the um, i don't think fans really realize how the fitness level that you guys as drivers have to achieve isn't so much about the physical side as it is having the stamina 
to use the mental portion because there's so much concentration. I know that that even in in, in the part of my old job of directing motorsport, uh, not only motorsports, but, but uh, stick and ball sports in the United States, if I was on the air for two hours, it was total concentration on that event, and that's all I could think about. I had to be planning where I was going, what I was doing, and for you guys, like you said, three inches, and that's mental. Yeah. That, that's uh, mental. The, the thing is, I think most of the drivers, it's... I suppose it was probably Schumacher back in the 90s that alerted everyone to the kind of fitness level, taking it to that next level of fitness. And then bit by bit, everyone just got fitter and fitter to drive the car. Like so, Tiger Woods in golf. Yeah, yeah, so it gets to the point where your actual feelings in the car, well, there's nothing there. You're just strong, you're fit, and the rest of it's all in the head. So you know, Manuel Correa, if his name, yeah, that's yeah. his name. Um, he was just talking about the cognitive side, and yeah, he, he is very fit. He drives Formula Two, um, which are high downforce cars. Yeah. He's doing two two races per weekend on, on the Formula One weekends. So um, the fitness side is obviously there, but this is a different story. This is about trying to keep keep the focus up for such a, a long amount of time, and for me with sleep deprivation yeah. and everything else. There was, I always, I, I kind of find there's two ways to go about it. You could say, right, I am going to be safe. I'm not gonna drive at 10 tenths. For whatever reason, maybe you think your car's not quick enough to win, but you're quick enough to take a podium. And for me, I was like, well, at times I was like, okay, I will survive. Someone sang a song about that, didn't they? <laughs> So, um, but then you, you get you get you, you get drivers different subject. drivers like Kevin Estra who, in his last stint, they, they, he was pushing like crazy, absolutely on the limit, ten tenths, eleven tenths, and the result was a crash that put them, you know, cost them forty minutes in the pit. So there's two ways to go about it, and you, you, I think you have to play the right the right way at the right time. Yeah, it's risk and reward, isn't it, really? Um, that's the thing. And uh, you see the drivers, like we mentioned, Fuoco earlier on, mm -hmm. there in P8, P7. In a way, nothing to lose. Ferrari came here, they're on the front row. They want to have a 1 2 finish, so let's try all we can. Driving at 10 10, like you say, Peter, get yourself back up into the into the top three, perhaps even further up if you, if you can. And it might pay off if you can carry on driving like that, but there's no way you would drive like that when you're in the lead, like Antonio yeah. Giovinazzi's. And you can see the body language is very different between the two cars. But what um, Correa was saying is that, you know, Mentally, this race has been so fatiguing because, as we all know as drivers, driving in the rain, it takes so much more mental capacity than driving in the dry. You can't just let the car flow and do its thing. You're always, you're, your eyes are on stalks, your body goes rigid because you're just trying to feel yeah. extra, extra input from all four tires driving through the seat of your pants. And before you know it, you realize that your hands are absolutely grip, like 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 your life depends on it in a steering wheel. If anyone's ever Flex. been in a, a kayak or a canoe yes. for the first time in their life, they'll know exactly what we're talking about. Your knees suddenly get wedged into the side, your whole body goes stiff, and every little movement you make, you're, you're absolutely petrified that it's going to escalate further, and that's what it's like driving a race car in the rain when you're not confident of the grip, particularly yeah. on a wet track on slick tyres, yeah. or even walking on ice or something right, like that. Right. You know, it, just one slip up, quite literally, mm -hmm. and you can really hurt yourself. So you, what do you do? You tense up, right. and the problem gets worse. And for Korea, it's complicated by coming back from that crash at Spa. Oh, absolutely, you know, that's a whole other only, thing. Not only physically, but mentally, as our leader comes to the pits, Antonio Giovinazzi gets out, Looks like uh, Pierre Guidi is going to be uh, taking his turn behind the wheel. And there's a driver change here. Jim, I'm going to yep. uh, love you and leave you and yeah. uh, replace <laughs> myself with Story of my life. Graham Goodwin. Story of my life. <laughs> So the driver change is complete. As soon as the fueling is uh, done, we'll uh, see a new set of Michelins go uh, onto 
the Ferrari. There uh, looks like they're uh, medium Michelins. Welcome back, Graham Goodwin. Did you have a good rest? Uh, uh, well, a little breakfast. Uh, replacing the Ferrari of um, David Sullivan and Travant and myself. Um, it's, uh, this, is, this is developing into quite the world's only cardboard car. Right. It's, it's yes. It, it, it's, I heard what Ant said about 20 minutes ago about this is the best Le Mans that he can remember being a part of. And I absolutely echo that. This is an absolute classic. It isn't quitting. And the best thing for it about, uh, 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 from, from my point of view, is it's not just in the top class. It's in all the classes. Yeah. And this three-class system has come together beautifully. Uh, great the, battles uh, up and down the order. Sorry to interrupt. Is the Ferrari oh, serving a penalty? He's being held, isn't he? Yeah. He's being held. Now, is that being held because he's got a penalty or being held because he, they're working a problem? No, there's the, the, there's nobody working. There goes the Toyota. Turn the mechanics switch on. Now they could turn the mechanics switch on. That's a problem. Could he not that. get it started? Could he not get it restarted? Well, could that be a problem that shows itself more than just Oh, once? my heavens, that is uh, drama. Uh, that's that's open to right back up. Five and a half hours to go, and <laughs> hello, we've, we've got a race again. 65 additional seconds on pit lane with that issue yeah. for the previously leading. 51 yeah. Ferrari, Tota, Kazoo Racing take the lead at the Mans with five and a half hours to go. This thing has got more twists and turns than, well, this racetrack. Yeah. Uh, and that's quite a lot. It's absolutely astonishing from beginning to end. Have you ever seen a race like this here, Peter? No, no, I haven't. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm just looking down to the GT Arms again, and I'm just seeing Iron Dames have retaken the lead in that. So the lead is just changing. Different car, different car, different car. We had the Corvette fight its way back up. Okay, so but the gap is 5.8. The gap is 5.8. Show them what you're made of. <laughs> well, here, here, we, here we go. Versus Boemi. That's quite mouth-watering, isn't it? And then you add in Toyota, the dominant force here at Le Mans for, well, half a decade, five consecutive wins, looking for their sixth Ferrari back as a factory team with the top class for the first time in half a century so many potential storylines and well we said there'd be more drama there's one of them it was a dramatic moment but the outturn oh, certainly yeah. was the outcome of the moment has uh, provided us with a whole bunch of drama we've gone from the toyota almost a full minute behind to now leading by 5.6 seconds as they uh head down the Molson straightaway the first time on their outlaps. The battle, by the way, in the P2 still goes on between into your competition. What a famous win that would be if they make it make this one home. Astonishing from Team WRT and then Duquesne team with Neil Janney, previous overall winner here, and now in a podium position in LMP2 for the team that uh, won the LMP2 class, not the overall LMP2 win, went to a Pro-Am team, but the overall LMP2 class in the opening round of the European Le Mans Series this year in Barcelona. Alessandro uh, Pierguini there you saw from the onboard camera taking uh, advantage of the slow zone to be able to hook up his drink spot. Let's hear from Eduardo. It seems that the repair on the guardrail is taking another 10 to 15 minutes. We still don't know but the slow zone will stay there until the, the guardrail is properly repaired. That is, I presume, down in Indianapolis, where we've seen both it, Lickin' House it's been and Jota. It's been a couple of years since I've been here. Have, have we seen this much uh, guardrail repair in, in the recent <laughs> past? I, I don't remember. I, I don't recall had, it. I mean, um, sure, when Rocky had his, his shunt and yeah. Alan McNish, had his, you know, Careless, you know those kind of yeah. crashes. <laughs> they, well, they were, they were, they were massive crashes. crashes. But, but we've seen some, some guardrail repair from, from fairly innocuous hits. In fairness to the, the guardrail repair at, uh, at that particular location. Oh yeah, it, it punched. A, we've had three cars in the same. Yes, place. exactly. Um, exactly. And when we saw the, uh, the incident after, I think it was, was it the clicking house? The last time, no, sorry, the Jota car last yeah. time. But, but 
don't get me wrong. I'm not saying oh, no. they shouldn't be repairing it. I'm it's just unusual. trying to remember. Yeah, I don't, just don't remember it happening. It, 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 we we have this, this conversation earlier this morning off air, weren't we, Jim, about um, sort of quick listening before we get to that about what's going on aboard the 51 for Alexandra Pierre-Greedy. Hey, sorry, the radio is not working from you to me back there. I think you can hear me, but when I know something more about the issue, I'll tell you. He's on a used tire. He's on a used tire. It's Buemi again. So it's interesting that uh, we had a problem getting the car back underway. Now we're having problems with communications. Yeah. Yeah. There's a common factor as well. Yeah. That is electrical issues. The gap's coming down, though. 4.3 seconds oh, now yeah. between the two cars. Well, one of them's on new Michelins, the other's on used. That should uh, that should have a little bit of a difference. Plus, uh, the Ferrari has been quicker. Just, just frankly, it's been quicker. Trey Bertolini looks on. A man with a proud mm. history with Ferrari. And amongst the uh, honours for Andrea, who is the nominated test driver for their competition class, has driven all bar one forms of Ferrari Formula One car ever. Absolutely astounding, but it's well into the hundreds the number of Ferrari chassis he has tested and shaken down for Scuderia, including all the historic fleets, including all of the Corsa Cliente cars. There is one car, I think it was a short-lived car from memory in the 80s, that no longer exists. It's the only Ferrari from the world. Even the, even the shark nose? Because, I mean, there's no, to the best of my knowledge, there's no shark noses, real what a, shark whatever noses the, left. Whatever there is, he's driven. He's driven. And in addition to that, does the same job with more or less all of the contemporary sports cars as well. Wow. Um, so, Andrea Bertolini, super guy as well. Lovely outlook on life, always a smile, uh, but super focused. And he drove a Maserati as well, he didn't did. he? To the GT1 yeah. World Championship. That's right. That's right. That's That'd be a good job for you. You can test everything that comes out of the British Japan factory. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go and work with Graham. <laughs> no, no, no. You're, you're not the tonics taster. <laughs> <laughs> What do you want to say? What do you want to say? Uh, 25 car, by the way, still with that uh, Luke's bonnet, the rear left corner on the Aston Martin, but it isn't stopping them. Uh, ORT by TF Charlie Eastwood, 52 seconds back from Rahel Fry, Ben Keating a further two seconds back, and that is a change. That is the ORT by TF car taking second place. Uh, they've, they've actually, while you were gone, they've actually meant to the front. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, these five, four cars, the 85, 25, 33, and 56, have kind of been swapping positions based on you know, a little bit on the racetrack, and then, and then, depending on which driver's behind the wheel, and then there's pit, pit stop sequence. Well, Ben Keating's been it very clear. This will be his last GT drive here. Mm -hmm. um, he loves the GT cars. He's not particularly interested in moving to the GT3 formula. There is Ben behind the Delarge and Liveried 48. If we see him back, it will be an LMP2. That is where his future lies. He's had a astonishing array of machinery uh, here at Le Mans, ranging from LMP2 cars and two different eras, uh, Vipers, Ferraris, Porsche, Aston Martin, now uh, here aboard the Corvette. Uh, it's been nine starts at the Mans for Ben Keating in eight completely different cars. The the patina that these cars get oh, yeah. at this point. Filth. And, and that was the other cool thing about going through the museum is many of the cars nowadays are just left to where they were. In fact, Audi actually lacquered one of them, so it wouldn't go the patina. Just make sure the Ferrari didn't pass anyone after the next loop. Copy. No stone unturned. Come Separate on, Seb. Never change. Just, <laughs> just drive. <laughs> that is the gap. That's the gap with three cars between the two battling for overall honours here. Do well, wonder, he got an extra snowball. Do, do wonder, gentlemen, whether or not they're going to take the opportunity whilst that barrier is prepared to do something about what's a growing ditch behind the curb, uh, which is what's causing the problem. Um, mm, well, off from, short, uh, short well, of sticking a whole lot of new gravel in there, I don't think there's much they can do. And the guys will just abuse it and start digging another ditch. 
had three significant incidents for hypercars yep. in the last couple of hours at that point. Back up to speed now after they clear the slow zone. And there is the Ferrari moving past uh, traffic. Now the next on the road is the Toyota just ahead of him as they go through the Porsche curves and then through karting. And what I will do, by the way, in the next uh, hour or so is a quick review as to where we stand in the Pro-Am standings. Not just where they stand on track, but more particularly as we approach kind of five hours to go, who has got non professional driver time to burn. And that's a very significant factor for many of these teams. I have yep. to say, astounding level of attrition in GTM. I think we've lost half the field. Yeah, almost half the field. It's how many um, in GTM. That is not something we're used to seeing. There are a lot of incidents, unfortunately. Yeah. At least two of them were GT on GT uh, mm -hmm. incidents that saw both cars retiring, the 60 and the 16 getting together, the 55 and the 21 getting together. Difficult conditions earlier on in the race with uh, the rain coming and yeah, going. Sure. Slow zones. We, we've seen quite a, quite a few impacts as cars have come into slow zones. Car in front slowed down and caught the ones behind by surprise, and, and they've concertinaed up. You see a good shot of uh, Pierre Guidi right out of central casting, isn't he? Oh yeah. I need a Ferrari driver. That you'll do. There yeah, you go. Go. On, go on. And the name for Ferrari. it. Ferrari. The name for it as well, into the garage for oh, the number six. six. Car. That uh, car was troubled early this morning after a, how we put this, Peter? A spirited attack from Kevin Est. Yeah. Uh, it was yeah. good to, to see, to... and he was, he was driving hard, and that's why he's there. Just unfortunate, uh, small mistake, put him off into the barrier. Down in 20th place overall, 11th in the class. But not this man, Sebastian Buemi. And his teammates have been right at the pointy end of the spear on this centenary celebration of the 100th uh, anniversary of Le Mans. The redundant department of redundancy department there. Sorry about that. Um, uh, and he has been at the, in the battle for the top three the entire race, as has the 51 car behind him, Alessandro Perguini. And then comes Earl Bamber in the Corvette. Uh, yeah. Camara, uh, yeah, come on, get with it. It's a yeah, GM absolutely. product. It's yeah. a sim. Get that the C. 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 Cadillac. Uh, that car, by the way, has been stopped under investigation for the caddy. Uh, three yeah. minutes and 46 seconds through the slow zones behind uh, the lead back. So keep an eye on what not that might have. For Thank you for saving me because that's where I was trying to go. And that's <laughs> Be, we've heard from a lot of freighters it'll be some little while with this slow zone in place for that barrier repair. Driver's right between Indianapolis and Arnage. And, uh, that's there because the uh, gravel trap has spat a couple of hypercar cars at it as well as the Toto. Okay, Seb, if there are no marbles, try to minimize distance. If there are no marbles, try to minimize distance. Minimize distance. Minimize distance. To what? To the, if there's no marbles, so that would mean edge of the race. It means track. going oh, offline. It means, it, it means going, taking the optimum line, doesn't it? It means yeah, not meaning, running wide it or, means, or track limits. Yeah. But he's on a. He's 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 he's. Don't get that one. That's, yeah. a, not, that's not a message I recognise or no. heard. Twitter will now write up that we're being oofs and uh, a bit big so that we're missing something. moment we're expecting oh don't blame you potentially I can't talk. Uh, potentially an update on whatever the issue is at Ferrari yes who just joined us um, cars are in this order in this slow zone coming through the instant site now we can see top of the picture that's where the barrier pair is going on John Elkin the president of both Stellantis group and Ferrari changed into Sunday morning clothing uh, and a very designer Ferrari outfit on yesterday, John. And, uh, and here we go. Again. As they go through Arnage, hard on the gas. The Ferrari battling, losing over a minute and the lead uh, with the car seeming to be unwilling to refire after a pit stop. Oh, now that's going to yes. hurt his pace and that's going to oh. give the Ferrari a chance oh, to get heavens. on the back of the Toyota. The 
And a P2 Pro Am leading Elgar Brokart was exactly where the Toto wanted to be. And now we've got nose to tail action again. I do think he made the right call there, yes, though, yes, because yes. that is a well. We saw it with uh, Kevin Estra. If you, if you try to overtake into that corner, you might well come a cropper and have contact. So he, he just decided to be cautious. No point to throw it away there. Well, the no, choice live to fight oh. another day because absolutely he can maybe he can hold him off. Well, the choice he made means that uh, might be a slightly smaller gap by a couple of seconds, but he still leads the race. Kevin Estra right. made a different choice. He's down in 20th position now, the car back in the garage. Better to have your mirrors full of Ferrari than to have your mirror in the, uh, somewhere over the fence. That's the, the, you know, when we were talking earlier with Anthony, that's the, the difference between leading the race and having a yeah. little bit more caution and then full attack from behind and deciding to roll the dice yeah. a little bit. And that dice sometimes comes up on the wrong number. I think uh, Sebastian Buemi would always pick a fight with Pierre Guidi than a fight with a crowd oh. crap. Yes. And <laughs> that's what we've got now. It is the number eight Toyota in the hands of Sebastian Buemi. Huge success here at Le Mans up against, the, well, not the newcomers that have been with us in GTE for a decade mm. at the pro level. But that effort and a whole lot more besides transferred with a resumption of history for Ferrari back in the top class and side by side exit. almost on the exit, slightly bought there by the Honda Motors Ferrari. But Buemi's not had any luck in traffic. That's twice now uh, in the space of half a lap he's been blocked by traffic and now he's going to lose the position unless he can just, he's got the inside position going to the chicane. He's going to force it here. Yep. And he gets it oh, done. Oh, my heavens. Alessandro Pierguidi. Much to the delight of his crew. Passion. Passion everywhere. Said we'll not give them this, this one up. Not passion. It's, uh, no. <laughs> uh, ten seconds out by the way, as we watch this. Still developing. Lead battle. Five hours, 12 minutes to go. The lead changes again. This is going to be an interesting turn. Yeah. No worries, Seb, no worries. Still five hours to go, mate. Head down. Into the slow zone. He'll be seething. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. lost momentum, didn't he, coming through that first chicane. It, was, it wasn't quite done, but almost done there. Almost toughed it out here. Ferrari much quicker in the first phase of that straight, but the Toyota came back at him. That's ultimately, as he did at uh, the entry of the Porsche Curves, Peter Dubrek, uh, decided discretion was a better part of valor there. Again, yeah, I thought for a second he might try and force it back down the inside, but yeah. he decided, nope, get out of it. Let's live to fight another five hours, and we'll see how it goes from there. <laughs> boy, oh boy. Back into the slow zone. This is so, and, and see, this this slow zone now helps Wemi because he's not going to, Pierre Guidi's not going to be able to pull away. No. Because he's, the momentum uh, is lost. He can use the entrance into the slow zone to uh, to pull up on him. Let's go back down to pit lane and Louise Beckett. I was just waiting on an interview from James Allen from the uh, 45 Algarve Pro, and he is constantly on the radio to George Kurtz, who's in that car at the moment, who you saw Gwemi come up behind. Can you imagine how that driver must be feeling as he uh, is his first Le Mans, as he can see in his mirrors, Boemi and uh, Pierre Guidi behind him. Guys, I'm gonna tell you something. Just try to look. When you think that the slow zone is gonna be lifted, you anticipate the stop. We anticipate the stop like Burton did. We try to be in the, in the garage, refueling, while they are removing the slow zone. Yeah, copy, Seb. We'll have a think. We'll have a think. So he doesn't want to be in the pits when they remove the slow zone, because then that gives the competition yes, the, the chance to run flat out. But whatever you do, Seb, do not tell Ferrari.
Denise has gotten that interview in the Algarve pit. Let's go back to her. I'm with James Allen from the 45 Algarve Pro. You've been talking on the radio. I thought you were talking to George, but no, you've been talking to the pit wall. Is that correct? Yeah, I've just been talking to David to make sure what the plan was going forward. So, I mean, we've, we've got a, a decent lead over the next prime of course. We're, we're focusing on that. So, realistically, we're just going to be relaxed, make sure we get to the end, and hopefully we'll take a trip over the end of the day. Yeah, you're currently leading the Pro-Am in the LMP2. George has been in a great run right now, and he made a lovely move to move out of the way for the hypercars behind him just then. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that, could have, that could have gone a bit wrong. I think there was a bit of confusion between, between Sebastian and, and George, but uh, luckily everyone came out of it, so it's, it's really good. And George has been amazing all week. He's, it's his first time here, and he's really picked up everything really, really quickly and really well. I'm quite happy for him, and, and I hope he gets the result he deserves today. Well, hopefully we'll speak to you later. Thank you. Thanks so much. Jens Pierre Guidi's put the hammer down. Two seconds to the good. Yeah, he's uh, pulling away. Uh, Pierre Guidi. Quick word about uh, James Allen, by the way. He's uh, looking at a second 24-hour win in the B2 uh, this year after the astonishing finish at the running sort of Daytona. He took the win literally on the line from the car he's now driving in. That would have been interesting conference and, uh, switches switched across from the winning car at Daytona to this campaign with CrowdStrike Racing by EPR and uh, like a pro racing right four laps of the good in LMP2 program that's another class by the way that's had significant attrition it's a 2.2 second gap for the the lead overall in the hypercar, three minutes and 45 seconds for the top three. Transfer that to an MP2 Pro Am. Just looking here, it is about a pot of 10 laps for the top three. As a, an outsider, if you like, coming in once a year to come and sit beside you guys and have a chat, Pierre Guidi has been incredible so far. Yep. I mean, this week, my, my my feeling, Peter, is this is a new and extremely important program for Ferrari, and they've made the choice that the vast majority of the the driving squad have come from their GT. Um, slow zone is back to green, and it looked to me like, if anything, Toyota got the better run there. Sure did. We did hear from Ferrari that uh, they were in trouble talking to Pierre Guidi at this no. circuit. And that has paid off for them. But you're right, Pierre Guidi, he's had his moments where it's not gone all his way. Big hiccup for him at Seabring with uh, a reasonable shot that uh, sent that car tumbling down the order. I do wonder, Peter, he's absolutely came in as a multiple world champion GT Pro, uh, one of their stars, but then young drivers in the other car, the pressure being exerted. There's been moments when I have been concerned that maybe that's getting in his head a little bit. Right, you're a driver that's had a long career. It must be tough when you're at the top of your game and someone new comes in. It's always going to happen. You know it's going to happen sooner or later, so... You know, maybe maybe this is just giving him his second wind. You know, he's what 39 yeah. years old. So to be oh, to think getting, getting into a hypercar at 39 for the first time and doing this kind of job, and I, I, I want to knock on wood because I, I don't want to jinx him. But yeah, he's doing a great job. There, you go. cheers, Thank Jim. You. Yeah, it's just making oh, there. Me. So a double yellow flag's just about just behind them at Forge again. Treat 
tonight so far. Still five hours plus of this to go. And if you've been tuning in with, in with us throughout this great race, thank you for being with us. I hope you're enjoying the developing storylines. They are legion. Ferrari still lead Le Mans from Toyota, but it's close, very close. Looming just a little way back, still on the lead lap. First of the Cadillacs, number two car in the hands of Il Bamba. So three different Le Mans makes on the lead lap with almost 19 hours in the book. They're on in. It's a Cadillac. It's the first of Peugeot's, and they came in. There's a Marta Ferrari, the AF. Grande of Corsa, and who would have written the script for Peugeot up until problems hit them in the middle of the night? They really did look very strong indeed. Uh, this is the dog out. I was just going to say we've got the uh, AF Corsa, we've got the, the Ferrari, Toyota, Cadillac, Peugeot, and Porsche all in the top six. Yep, and all of them have had their moment in the sun yep. with the lead of the race, and all of them have had issues. Yep. So. Well, the great part about this era now, this is really the first time it's bloomed, with absolute respect to Toto, to click on us, to help for that matter. The great thing about this is, if you're going to win it, you're going to have to fight for it. And boy, have we seen some fighting here. We, we often talk about other codes of motorsport, and I hope that people will discover just how good this is. Well, judging by what we've seen on track here, gentlemen, transfer that to other forms of mixed martial arts as well uh, because it's been epic stuff Peugeot flying over the curbs there first chicane the first of their cars down in fifth place this bodes very well indeed for the future of this race and for the future of the FI World Endurance Championship the future of the Emerson Weather Tech Sports Car Championship, yeah. their GTP equivalent of these cars. Yeah. This also, for me, in some ways, harkens back to the Audi victory where Lena Gade was the engineer, and I believe, if memory serves, that that was the year that both Rockefeller and McNish had their crashes. pitch battle with Peugeot and it was right down to the final half hour when they were making decisions about tires and, and that sort of stuff and Lena made all the right calls that brought that car home. Uh, the great conversation on the radio between her and Andre Lotterer that you've got to do this, you've got to bring it home and, and they did and it was a, an outstanding victory and this is what comes to mind here, Ken Toyota carry on going for a fifth consecutive victory that would put them with the likes of, of Audi and Ferrari and others with the consecutive win streak or will Ferrari be victorious on its return 50 year return to top class racing here in Lamont or to will they both hit problems and Cadillac yeah, pop out yeah, from yeah, nowhere yeah, and who's going to say or right. each other I think is the other thing it's close enough oh, that when yeah. we get down to uh, when it really Brass matters tags. Um, we did ask a little earlier whether or not anybody might have any ideas about that uh, we thought was a cryptic uh, message to separate me about the shortest possible distance. And delighted to say, Michael Salavari uh, down under in, uh, in around the Adelaide area. Uh, Michael, lovely to hear from you. Come with the overall instant uh, for part of uh, Delhi Sports Car, Michael, and a keen part of online communities that support this uh, great area of racing. And I think he's nailed it. He thinks the message to him Boeing is about the slow zones. Take the shortest possible path. There you go. There's no mark. There you go. Well done, Michael. Clearly, both my intellectual and fatigue have combined to provide less compliances than you ever could.
five seconds now. Pierre Greedy to Sepuemi. Shouldn't be too much longer before we see this slow zone come to an end. I think it was about 15, 20 minutes ago that Juan Freitas was predicting 15, 20 minutes ago. Gilles de Cain there, enjoying his morning croc monsieur. This team, the Duquesne team, the sister part of the organisation. In fact, that has worked back to green, hasn't it? We're full green again. Slow zone has been withdrawn. Also uh, part of the LMP3 landscape, Gilles de Cain, taking on what was previously the Norma programme. It is now the Duquesne D08. As you can see, uh, Gilles in the wheelchair there to the right hand side. and. Also, the only driver in the days of GT3 uh, hustled no less than Dodge Viper uh, with some success. That controls in that car. The fastest lap of its race for the race leader pushing on now. The Santa Pierre Greedy. And the same lap, Earl Bamba, obviously with the uh, track back to green. Seventh. I think the two car is going to have a five-second penalty added to its next pit stop as well, so trying to uh, carry on with that. So reposing. That's uh, when you uh, call the business uh, team. Yes. Yeah, that's on the output. Sebastian Buemi love deleted, so that's definitely number five. No, yeah, yeah. If, if, if it's not uh, if it's not six, that's five. We may see uh, we may see a warning flag. Look after this. Is the, the last thing you want is a drive-through penalty at this stage. That could be the defining moment. This is the race leader in the middle of those three cars, the 34 behind Edex Sports. Blue livery is running fifth, and the Panis Racing car fourth. That is a battle for fourth place. Panis and Edek with the race lead battle between them. So he, he, those cars. he pushed by a minute ago, uh, just on the exit of Porsche cars. So he's got in between. So obviously now he's lining up. We know the 34 car's got great straight line speed. So. Good chance he'll tow by now. Looks like he was going to do that. Fabio Scherer, by the way, if you didn't join us earlier this morning. Um, an injured foot after being run over, we believe, his foot by the Corvette. Uh, not sure whether or not there's a break. Who is that? That is Fabio Scherer, who's leading oh, yeah, the LMP2 yeah, race. Yeah. Uh, but certainly in some pain uh, with one of his feet. But it's not stopping him. He's currently a minute and 38 seconds clear of the chasing WRT. One car. This is an epic run from its European competition. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the battle he was in between there is for fourth in class. Panis racing the hands of Timo van der Hel. Netherlands on our turf, Germany. Two very talented young men. I suppose if it was your left foot, you could not lift the brake. I think that's it. it. Yeah. Kind of it's the old fashioned heel toe stopping him. He's, he's got by. Yeah. One of the all-time great and P2 oh, uh, yeah. runs in this modern era. We've seen some faultless runs from the acknowledged super teams from Jota, from WRT, from United Autosports here at Le Mans. But you know, this is a team that's been bubbling under a little, it's been challenging there for podium positions throughout the season in the FI World Endurance Championship. But this is four we've not seen from them before. We've seen some great stints from a number of drivers who've driven for the Polish flag team. 
Fabio Scherer just seems to find more, more, more. Came into LMP2 with United Auto Sports a few seasons ago. Seems to be in a happy place here. What are we looking at here? This is a replay of his move. But that's the uh, the large getting by. Yeah, the 48, 48 going by 65. Yeah, that is good. First season of LMP2 racing as a full season driver. Um, big success with DKR Engineering principally in LMP3. He's a rapid young man, Lawrence. Noticing from the helicopter shot, no one has gone home. <laughs> Why would you? Quick, quick lap times, Peter, are coming. All of a sudden, the last lap, Colin is lighting up blue. That's quickest laps in the race so far. Wow, yeah, number of teams, 328 for Seb Wabey, 328.8, 328.7 for Earl Bamba. That's the second consecutive fastest lap of the race for that car. 329.7 for Paul De Resta with the Peugeot. 3.30 for Esteban Gutierrez in the 708 uh, Klickenhaus. And then we get into Fabio Schirro with a 337.5, uh, the fastest lap for Inter Europol, which, by the way, is nowhere near as quick as the fastest lap for the Team WMT cars, which consistency that's winning the day there. Here, though, is the leading car in GTM. Sarah Bovi climbing aboard as out of the number 85 Porsche climbs Rahel Fry. And we saw that the uh, number 25 Aston Martin went by to take over the lead, Charlie Eastwood, behind the wheel of that car. See how far back Ben Keating is. He was only. 30 seconds behind, so he may come by as well. As the driver change is done, as soon as the fueling is done, it looks like that car will get some new. There goes uh, Ben Keating, the aforementioned uh, Corvette driver, now into second place. That puts the Iron Dames back to third. So they've got plenty of time. They will get out of the pits in front of P.J. Hyatt yep. in the Project 1A Porsche. So this is going to move them back to third position. Routine pit stop, four new Michelin tires, new driver, uh, Sarah Bove, as uh, Graham rightly pointed out. Back into the fray with her, against her, uh, her arch nemesis in, 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 a, in a good way, Ben Keating. And these two have had some outstanding qualifying battles throughout the season in the World Endurance Championship. And that's, that's the great thing about the, the new qualifying format. It's uh, it's proven to be it's just very exciting. It's, a, it's an extra day of great racing now Absolutely. than we have in the World Endurance Championship. Just uh, an update from uh, the FIWCs. We did another get Rachel Cavers, who's been working hard through this race. And she updates us with the condition of Fabio Scherer. Says, not too bad. Is uh, feels it when he's not racing more than he's in the car. Brendan will do that for you, won't it? Pushing through, still left on braking. He will be fine, but I, mean, I think you and I, and certainly you, Peter Dumbreck, will know that's going to hurt later today and certainly tomorrow. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, the adrenaline does get you through. He, he, he's hopping out of the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't even put any weight on it. Yeah, yeah. he's. He's to the point where when they do the driver changes, he uh, one hops. Yeah. Yeah. You so you can into the pits for some new painkillers and back out again. Three cars for 327. So that's three to Bamba with another quick lap in the caddy. This time, Alessandro Piagridi responds to the attack from Seven Baby. 327. But it's a second quicker than the fastest lap from the total. There is P.J. Hyatt in the Project 1 AO Porsche, Rexy. With the big teeth and the short arms. Could be the king. There is your LMP2 leader. Fabio Scherer. Thumbs up from the uh, Goodyear technician. See if they uh, decide to stay with these skins or if they'll put some new tires on.
the 34 car. Um, if my numbers are correct, I think Sarah Bovey's got a stint and a half still to do in this car as their bronze driver, which is a good bronze, but she will be ceding time to drivers around her. As you can see where they can see where PJ Hyatt is in this order. PJ is about where he needs to be. He's, all, he's five minutes and 57 seconds at the six hours he needs to do. So that bodes well in this battle between those two Porsches. How about, how about well, if, if Bove does a double stint here, then she'll be good. Uh, but she will lose time to the gold and the, uh, and the silver drives yeah. in the other cars. Uh, Amadal Harty, meanwhile, needs about another 40 minutes. Not quite a full stint uh, for the Amani driver. That's now our new leader, John Eastwood, pushing on. But Keating, uh, he too is about a minute away from his six hours. Uh, and here is the often mentioned sound of the NASCAR Camaro. Jensen Button behind the wheel of this car. Looks like Again, a good right out of casting. Give me an English format. <laughs> A big smile, and there you have it. He has just had a ball driving this car. We had John Doonan in around 11 o'clock, and, and the whole team Small. is just Small. over the moon, just yeah. absolutely over the moon. So, I, I think mission accomplished. There he is, there he is, that, and that's the trick of the devil. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, there is coach Jordan Sailor flexing. And this has been to see uh, Chad Knauss and some of the other people who are such veterans putting their foot in the water of this type of racing. People with, you know, championship pedigrees who know the sport inside and out uh, is just uh, absolutely fantastic. And to see them have this modicum of success is, is just outstanding. 34th overall, that's not quite as high as I thought they would finish. I, I figured they would uh, they would get into the 20s for sure, maybe even crack the top 20. Yeah, but there's still stop. time. Yeah, yeah that's been stopped 11 minutes on pit lane, yeah. so there's clearly yeah. been a, a, some form of issue. Gloriously filthy, that car. I have zero doubt that whatever happens with the Camaro ZL1 after this race, it will be a car that Hendrix Motorsports, Jim France for that matter, will treasure forever. Truly historic, 75 years of NASCAR, 75 years um, of stock car racing in the United States. And they've come here all guns blazing, loving every moment of it. To explain why, by the way, Jordan Taylor is in the garage. He's here as their reserve driver and also as driver coach. Lots of experience here, Jordan, particularly in GT cars. And uh, with the full respect of the NASCAR family, Motorsports on all three drivers. He's been a uh, key part of the test procedure here. Does look odd seeing that car, but he handles well, Peter. It's not bad, isn't it? Uh, to put in the lap times it's been doing, it's been quicker than all of the GT cars. So it's not just quick in a straight line, it can go around corners as well. Well, I hope this encourages everybody around the, the organisation, not just at this race, but other races too, to just take a look in the books and see what else can be done on these lines. I just think it encourages more people to be enthusiastic in more depth. It's great to have people who are really enthused about a battle for the overall lead in a great race like this, but it's better still when you've got more of the storylines to write. And I know one of the things that John Dillon was telling us last night it's the thing that has blown them away more than anything else, aside from the, the welcome here, which I think they expected, but have still exceeded their expectations. It's the, it's the level of media interest in that program. Welcome back this morning to Martin Haven. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning again, everybody. Good afternoon again, good evening again. A um, little tweet two minutes ago from NASCAR Garage 56 account, NASCAR G56, 2,000 miles. With 230 laps of Circuit de la Sarte under our belt, the next-gen uh, G56 has blown past the 2,000-mile mark, or 3,218 kilometres. <laughs> it's almost three and a half Coca-Cola 600s. What I like is the respect with humour. 
Yeah, I, mean, and, and I think that's absolutely mutual. I don't think there's anybody oh. in the pit lane that goes, well, they're taking the garage that can be used by a proper racing car. No, and, and there's, so. So, as we said to John Dooley in the middle of last night, there's a, a, at least 300,000 big smiles every time that car gets around this track, and that's just here. There is nothing bad whatsoever about that effort. John Eastwood, by the way, from second place in uh, a, a GTR on pit lane. That puts uh, Cyclist Ben Keating back through to the lead. Might yeah. better get my Zumba class going. Absolutely. Like, and just zoom that in the, in the back of the, uh, the booth while we're watching Earl Bamba in the caddy. Uh, so, the story of the 51 Ferrari, which has retaken the lead after briefly losing it in pit stops, that was a power cycle for the car. It wouldn't fire, so it had to do the control on to lead to the Try turning turn off and on again, so that's exactly what they did. Um, it seems to be perfectly okay. The slight worry, obviously, is every time you turn it off, if it doesn't fire up again, you can lose 10 or 15. But, of course, once you've done it once, it doesn't bite you quite so badly. The next time, Peter, you, you go, oh, OK, it's that again, right? We'll do that. Take 30 so, seconds so the recovery will be quicker. Yeah. In fact, while the change is going, while the uh, power change is happening and everything, it could be maybe... Except you can't table. fire it until all the men are behind the line, so you can't try to fire it until all the men are yeah. behind the line. So there is, yeah, you can switch the ignition on. In fact, I think quite a lot of time they probably leave the ignition on just so there's radio comms and everything else. Um, but yeah, once you've, once something's caught, yeah, you think about the Jota car a couple of years ago that ended up winning here, which was in second place for most of the morning, and its air, onboard air jacks failed, so they basically got one of those inflatable yeah, bags yeah. you use to sort of jack up vehicles on soft ground and they were having to pump it up at one end in a pit stop and then the other end in a different pit stop to swap tyres a pair at a time, front to back or side to side. Um, it had a misfire as well, and, and they still managed to find it to get it to finish. Second page over there. We're we've got a lot of hours oh. beside cars, so yeah, a lot of retirements. Well, there are 20, or well, have been already 20 retirements out of 62 cars. That's the highest in quite a number of years in terms of retirement. Okay, so box this lap, box this lap, pit confirm. Box this lap, driver change to Brendan. So Harley about to take the wheel off the second place car is eight point seconds the gap we have four hours and 42 minutes still remaining and it has changed the balance of power between these two cars before when Hartley has come in he's immediately been very quick now the last time that happened was day to night and I wasn't quite sure how the dialogue worked there because Hartley was very quick initially and then gradually got reeled back in. And I wonder whether they'd gone with a softer tyre on the Toyota to give him that initial edge. Okay, Ali, box this lap, box this lap, fuel only. Box this lap, fuel only. As you can see from the energy graphic, okay, Peter, okay. the number three Cadillac is the outlier there. It's only recently stopped. The others, 6%, 7%, 5%, they're all coming in this lap. So. Your top six, barring one car, with four hours to go, are on the same lap of pit window. Never mind on an approximate uh, e equivalent strategy. Yeah. It, it's really easy, isn't it, to get sucked into the, um, the mindset that we're closely under this race. It's almost five hours still to go. But what we are into now is a phase of the race where the leading two cars are going to have to hit a problem for Cadillac to win it. Well, that's entirely possible. Or safety car, because that brings them onto the tail yep. of the pair. And that is also equally possible. We've had safety cars predominantly because of incidents in weather, but not exclusively so far in the race. And I have to say, this is as frantic a lead battle sprint as I can remember in quite some time. And we're, we're back to... Audi versus Porsche versus Toyota, yeah. P1 hybrids, you know, absolute full oh, combat. Oh, and that was three teams. Yeah, that was you know, 50. What we've had recently is the, the Toyotas controlling the race, and it's going to be one or the other that wins. And they're obviously not going to attack the same way as Toyota will attack Ferrari now. 
it's a better pit stop this time. It's an underlaid pit stop. Yeah. One minute and 16 seconds on pit, uh, the pit lane for the leading Ferrari. Cadillac, 132. Only. That must be a full service stop. And here comes the Toyota. Right. Right. Just one Toyota left in this race. Behind the Ferrari there, coming out to the third place car in LMP2, the uh, number 30 Duquesne car. So that has, uh, well, that was coming into the pit, so that has dropped out of the top three. LMP2 into your Molder 34 car, green and yellow. WRT, the 41 car, still in second. Louis Delatraz not able to overhaul Fabio Scherer, but Scherer must be at the end of some epic stint. 65, Panis. Timon van der Helm again. He's been in that car a long while, keeping that car up towards the sharp end of the field. And in GTE Pro, from we're nowhere, we might as well pack up and go home territory. Corvette Racing's Ben Keating leads from arch rival Sara Bovi in the pink Iron Dames Porsche. Mike Dyer for ORG by TF lies in third ahead of Thomas Floor. That 54 Ferrari relentlessly right in the podium hunt there from start to finish. And then Gunnar Jeanette in Rexy, the Project One AO Porsche, has dropped down to fifth with uh, a pit stop he's just made. Before I forget this, um, uh, a word for Thomas Fleur. We've not mentioned him very much in this race, but his level this year has been raised absolutely dramatically. I don't that's know what he's been having his breakfast cereal, but it's working. Well, maybe he's had time. Yes. Know, and that's so much of this with these drivers, is finding the time to actually focus on their driving. Hey, Ali, just for info, previous lap we had a track limit in Tete Rouge. That's the fourth one, OK? significance of that, Peter, is if you get five, then you are all the way into the pit lane for a penalty. So five is the warning flag, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Six is the penalty. Six, yeah, you have five warnings in the entire 24 hours. So basically in eight hours of absolutely foot welded to the floor racing, yeah. you can transgress five times and no more. So we've seen no penalties so far from any driver yet. It does mean, though, when we get into, let's say, four hours and 37 minutes to go, let's take the four off the beginning of that. It's entirely conceivable that with 37 minutes to go and maybe the prospect of one little fuel splash before the end, we will still have a four-second gap between our leaders, well, whoever so. they might be. And that's entirely possible. I'm not counting out one of the tightest finishes ever in history. It's 19 seconds, the gap at the moment. That is significantly less than a drive-through would take. Yeah. And that's why that's important, because the first penalty would be a drive-through penalty. If you carry on doing it, it would be a uh, it would be a, a, a short stop, it would be a stop and go. Yeah. And then it starts to get five seconds, then ten seconds. So it, it can't just be frenetic pace at any cost. That's what that rule is there for. It's about keeping it fair. It's about making sure that we're all racing the same racetrack and not uh, an alternative line. And, and Peter, t taking the shortest distance means the shortest distance, but within the white lines. Absolutely. Uh, we were talking, Jim and I, about the drivers basically pushing the envelope as far as possible. But sometimes you overstep and pick up uh, the potential now to pick up a penalty for running away. It's, it's just getting harder and harder. And actually, the more severe penalties are unlikely to come from the stewards if you're running out wide, because there have been so many incidents, there's so much debris, there's so much gravel, so many sharp little bits yeah. of carbon around. And actually, running out beyond the track limits is just looking for a sea of comedy tanks to puncture your tyres, isn't it? Yeah, and, and you know, exit to Indianapolis, we've seen at least three of the hypercars in the wall there. Yep, 38, and both the click and else cars all spat out of that uh, growing ditch behind the, uh, the curb. With drivers who have all got plenty of ability. These aren't the fumblers, these are not, you know, rank amateurs. These are highly professional drivers, but, as, as excuse me, as I was explaining earlier, it's a, it's, a, it's a ramp with a vertical drop at the end of it, and if you go off the vertical drop, you can't ease the tyre back off. Likely to puncture the tyre if you try and wrench it back on as you are to get spat out with gravel trap. So there is probably a need, I think, for that to be either rebuilt as a much more level curb or built with an upslope and then a downslope into the gravel trap, from which you can hopefully learn 
reverse your car. Yeah. It's so easy. I mean, I mean, it's a it's a ridiculous comparison, but it, it bears the 30 seconds it will tell to take the story on the way back to the airport. Uh, the WC race down the hill from the hotel. A large commercial vehicle on the way down a, a, a narrow country lane, but slightly on the road. are built to take in a phenomenal amount of punch. The guys nice mission were saying the left rear in Spa from the pit lane is taking 1,500 kilos of downforce from the pit lane. And they were saying, and that's the issue there with a cold tyre. It's not up to temperature, it's too stiff, the pressure is too low at a normal sort of setting that would use with a heated tyre. And so that's why they were having to ramp up the, the base pressure so you go out on a cold tire that's also overinflated quote uh, so that makes the, the, the warm-up even harder uh, the way we look at this is 20.7 seconds to the gap between Pierre Greedy and Brendan Hartley looks to me at this phase of the race gentlemen that Ferrari have got the pace it's now about just trying to edge away where you've got the pace with no error whatsoever well, I, think, I, I think, Peter, the way they've gone about this as if they've been doing it all their lives. And, and to a degree, they all have, but not this. Yeah. Not this in hypercar, not trying to win them on outright. A lot of the Air Force team have got that experience from their GT programme. A lot of them have got winning, trying to win overall experience from Formula One. But this is the first time they've done this, and it's the first time they've brought the car here. But they're just running a natural race. I mean, they just look so relaxed in the way they're doing everything. The same professional manner of going about it that Toyota have exemplified over the years because they've been doing it for years. And I'm, I'm just so impressed with Ferrari. Absolutely. Overstressing or overthinking or second-guessing anything. They're just making the right calls at the right time and driving hard and fast. And staying cool. We saw that with the, the full reset with the car. They lost one minute, but there, there was no big panic. They just went about their business, they got back on track. Um, Pierre Guidi hunted down the Toyota, got by him, back into the lead. Yeah. Ben Keating had just a little moment there where the car was not quite going to make it around the Dunlop curve. She came as it is, so. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> Nicky Katzberg is the uh, as Nico Veroni is the next. Moroni is due to get in, and here is the arch rival, the second placed Iron Dames Porsche, Sarabovi. Ben Keating and Sarabovi have produced so many entertaining qualifying battles. In qualifying in the regular World Endurance Championship, like in Hyperpole here, the bronze rated drivers have to qualify, and Keating and Bovi have just been going hard at it. Then at the end of a I'm going to have to check triple, possibly just quad stint. Literally and, just looking right now. And the team were saying this will be the end of his minimum drive time requirement. So uh, that will bring him, uh, can bring him to the end of his drive. Time. Six hours, 16 minutes as we uh, count uh, for Ben Keating. What about Sarah Bovi as well? We've uh, seen, Sarah's got a way to go, yeah. We've seen them regularly cycle through between her, Michelle Gatting and Rahel Frey. The Iron Dames keeping the pressure on at that Corvette. So it is, remember, it's the bronze and silver drivers that need to complete six hours, both in GTM and in LMP2. Sorry, we're so. back to us there. See the cap at the far end, Andrea Piccini, one of the Piccini brothers that uh, runs the Iron Lynx operation. It is an hour and eight minutes that Sara Bovi has got to do. OK. Now, it's, it's no slur on Sarah's ab uh, ability. She's been stellar at uh, defied bronze level, but she has got time where she's going to be measured against not Ben Keating, but silver and gold on that and the platinum rank drivers to the end of this race. And actually part of the way that they've got the Corvette back in has been to have some of their, uh, to have their pro drivers, Vicky Casper, Nick Moroni, driving through the night. Same with Sarah Bovey. Although actually the Iron Dames have rotated through in, in, in regular rotation, Sarah's not been sort of parked overnight or when it was wet, they have all stepped up and all done their, their stint in time. Didn't see at any stage where they sort of changed the rotation, it's all been 
uh, as was expected from the start. Also, uh, 25 minutes and 24 minutes to the to double line, they're going to be able to start back to get aboard the car. Yep. It's been a very popular addition to this crew. Ever smiling, tall, young Argentinian driver. Just think he's coming to work as well. Well, in the, in the era of uh, GT racing here at Gaon, the only GT3 class. I think a teamwork minded, young, fast moment silver rank driver is going to be no small thing. And whether or not he retains his silver rank and goes to gold, I think you're going to find that that young man is with Corvette for quite a long time. That is the lead battle in GTE Am. Third is the ORT by TF Aston Martin, the orange Aston Martin, for those of you watching in Technicolor. And, uh, Michael Dyer and Gunnar Jeanette in the green T-Rex livery. Project One Porsche is fourth, uh, fifth, fourth. Uh, fifth is GR Racing's Ricardo Pera. That's the car that's black with uh, orange highlights on one side and orange and blue golf colors on the other side. And in sixth position, and also in the pit lane, or has just been through the pit lane, is the silver AF Corsa Ferrari car number 54, Davide Rigon, heading out on track, staying in that car. So driver change as Ben Keating completes his minimum driver time. Looks like Sarah Mervyn will stay out on track for another lap or two. Right behind her is the car guy, Kessel Racing Ferrari. That's Daniel Serra. He's not passing her for position. He is a lap behind the Brazilian pro. Then there is the car in yeah. third place, though, that orange Aston Martin, and that gap is coming down. Yep, I didn't lead the race. ORT by TF have led the race. Corvette Racing have led the race. Project 1, they own. That's led the race. race. 54, uh, that's led the race. That's led the race as well. Kessel, they've led the race. They absolutely uh, have. Oh, oh, I don't remember. I don't think the they have. They had an early problem, if you remember, with the yeah. bonnet latch. And I don't think the 911. Yeah, they, that, they had two problems. They made contact with somebody, it popped the bonnet up, they fixed it in the pit stop, and it then popped up again. So then they properly fixed it. I assume they used a larger hammer the Six. next time round. Porsche, by the way, back into the garage. Looking less and less like it's going to be a great afternoon for this squad. This is the car earlier this morning involved in a battle for that Andre Lotter getting out of the yeah. car. So That's this is not going to be quick work. No. Andre Lotter um, having to miss the Formula E race in Jakarta or opting to miss the Formula E race in Jakarta. There's uh, about nine drivers from Formula E who did race in Jakarta on Sunday and then came back from Indonesia for qualifying and practice. Yes, well, it was that um, had the problem with the car in spirited pursuit of a potential podium position, so chasing down the Cadillac. So this, is this has not been a change for the Luigi game to reiterate the car guy Ferrari, which is absolutely flying at the moment. Daniel Serra, that yellow car, has just unlapped itself from the class leader. That's the Iron Dames Ferrari. There's the second place car, and a Corvette by dint of that pit stop drops around half a minute behind into third place. But again, these cars all slightly out of sync with each other. And so, Peter, the teams of the people will know absolutely... They won't care what the hypercars are doing. They won't care what the LMP2s are doing, which we're trying to follow as well. They will just be watching their peers, their class rivals. That's what the focus is. Yeah. Winning what you can win, never mind what everybody else is doing. Well, it's essentially three, three races taking place in the one race. And you know what? It's great to be the overall winner. You, you know, you really want to be that. You only be in the hypercar, but the LP2 and the, and the GT, they're as valid winners as the top class. You know, the, the fights are just as big. The uh, competition's just as strong. And it's, it's great to see. I mean, we're, we're spoiled that we've got three races going on here which, that we can watch. Which have none of them refused to, uh, uh, have, you know, they did just refuse to stop being exciting. They are all really, really close races and again you know if you're on the podium in GTE Am or LMP2 or hypercar you're going to stand up on the one of the most famous podiums in any sport anywhere in front of 300,000 people and receive one of the world's most famous trophies that I don't care what you're driving that is a reward for a year and more of hard work that's got you to this point 
Daniel Serra, by the way, uh, can I think do the majority of this race from here. Uh, Takeshi Kimura has now completed his uh, required six hours minimum driving time. He's got Hothaker, it's well over his required time. There is the trophy. Yep. It's fabulous it's trophy. trophy. It's been around the world. Uh, this, but still can't find his babies. <laughs> so Daniel Serra is in with because he's not going to go and do four hours and 24 no, minutes. He's not. So, he can't. so who else is he? Scott Hothaker, I suspect, will. Have a, a stint in the middle of this one. I think we're going to see Daniel in for a while. Like he's got Africa in, a, in maybe a couple of hours' time, and probably Daniel back in for the finish if well, there's the, anything the, to be gained by that. He can do no more than four in any six hours, uh, in which case he'll do four hours. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh and that's trouble for the nine. Uh, nine that's, no, well, that's Michael Fassbender. That's Michael Fassbender. Oh, no. And that's, and that's a lot of tyre wreckage now. He's got again into the Porsche curves. Wow. Uh, Michael Fassbender coming towards the end of his driving stint here. Uh, he had 18 minutes left to complete his six hours. Well, he's going to have to go back out again then because that's yes. not going to be completed yeah, in the here. Lane. Got it's wide. Yeah. The car spun back again and that's a big hit. That's a big hit. Yeah. Well, it's climbed the tyre barrier. It's still driving and that's it's just one of those classic the one accidents. That it's one of those places where you'll see it time and time again. He's, he's trying to keep the car within those white lines. Yep. Yep. Uh, but in that instance, he should have just opened the wheel and run the car wide. Took, yep. took the, the penalty that was coming his way for going over the white line, but now he's going to have to spend some time in the, fit, the pits to get that fixed. Yeah, that car coming in from ninth position in the hands of Michael Fassbender, the Irish German. It's going to win. This is the end of a, a five-year program. It is to come to, to to bring his driving level up to the level where he can compete in Le Mans 24 hours. He's raced in Porsche Carrera Super Cup. He's raced in other GT programs. He's raced here on Road to Le Mans. There you are. There's a, a few guys on the podium just that's, having that's a, a photo. Yeah, it is. PR guys there. I would suggest to you that's probably this year's voting committee for the media award. <laughs> Let's hear it from... We put the car inside the garage. Fuck! Apologies for, obviously, the excitable language and exactly as you said, Peter, he was just trying to tighten the line when he realised he was going to run out wide. Now, take a bit of a clean up yeah. as well as a rebuild of the tyre barrier. There's going to be a longish slow zone because all those tyre stacks need to be replaced and probably rebuilted back in as well because that's all part of the safety uh, on the corner that is homologated. A little bit of arm waving going I'm on. About is that, 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 corner, is that, that end of game I arm waving? I, yes, does body language in the back of the garage is not at all encouraging. Louise Beckett is down in the pit lane, Louise. Or is that Steph? I think it's Steph. Steph. Yeah. OK, you are at the garage, Steph. What do you know? Well, let me tell you, this car does not look good at all, and the marshals are frantically running around, uh, the mechanics, should I say, are frantically running around for the bits and pieces that they need. In reality, there could be a front and back change to the car, but there is just too much damage to that right side of the chassis that just will not be able to be fixed and replaced. So it could be that this is the end of that race. All right, well, if you can hang around there and try and get word from the team, thank you for that. We'll see if we can get a, a final uh, word on that. But again, even with, with four hours to go, there's a lot of time to fix the car. It depends how much of it is actually fixable. Just watching uh, Peter and Brex, uh, facial expression with the hit that was the grimace that was a big hit yeah it was a big hit and i was looking at the marshals <laughs> they were yeah. very close behind the wall as well so thankfully everything held up and um no no um parts of the car went over the wall so uh i'm hoping that is not the end for michael fassbender here as a well worldwide celebrity often when you put your head above the parapets and do something different and do something with passion. A lot of people out there that choose to criticise and to mock, so I can tell you.
multiple, multiple experiences of watching him apply his chosen trade here. But uh, he's done it both with passion and with absolute commitment. It's very easy to stand at the sidelines and go, OK, well, he's not good enough to do that. He is good enough to do that. Much, much better drivers than him have made the same, if not bigger, errors. And so, yeah, I was going to say the same thing. We've yeah. seen some very, very professional drivers make yeah. errors of that magnitude. And, you know, it can happen to anyone. There's He'll no be work super going on that frustrated car, right? because last year the car got away from under braking down to the first chicane, ended up in the barriers, now the game. You know, and this is all, you have to, you have to be honest, everyone's going, oh, well, he's been doing it for five years. Well, you can probably count the number of races he's done on his fingers and toes, in, almost in total, whereas anybody else of his age, or, or, or of any age, when they get to this level, will have been racing full-time for at least a decade. Yeah. Probably more like 15 years if they're in their early 20s. And he does not have all of that instinct yeah he's good he's quick he's competent he really addresses himself to the racing but you know all of those years of having crashes and learning how to avoid them then that takes time to build up he's doing it all in public that's that's yeah. over it is over that's, i'm afraid that's... that is the end of the road for michael fassbender and the rest of the crew of 911 martin rump in the cap there in the background shaking hands with the boys richie leeds as well yeah. that's uh He'll take his time just to gather his thoughts, but I'm sure we will hear from Michael. I hope he's OK, that we're going to rattle his cage a little bit. Yeah, think tough. about it this way. Just go, think about doing something completely different you've never done before at a level you've never done it before. Musical instrument is a good example of this. Go and learn a musical instrument. How long does it take you before you don't make an error? And you're a concert pianist or a concert violinist. And, and that's the level we're looking at. It's not being able to play along with your local, you know, a string ensemble or something. This is absolutely virtuoso performance at the, at the highest level. There is nothing more demanding than this in terms of driving sports cars. And the Porsche is still, these are not easy things to conduct with. You hate to see it for any driver. And the Clara publicity is clearly going to be an opportunity. To see that from the inside track that is part of the deal that's been done. The same way that we've got the WC full access, there is Michael. Well, look, it's part of what they do as actors. They expose themselves, they leave themselves open to criticism and ridicule by becoming something that they're not. Now, this is a whole different level of becoming something that you never were before. And he has applied himself with just the same you know, exposure and vulnerability. And uh, I always uh, admire anybody. I mean, all the bronze racing drivers in the GTM class, the gentlemen drivers who are racing and lady drivers who are racing in, you know, on a non-professional basis in anything around the world, they're doing it because they are passionate, not because they wanted to be Formula One world champion or because they wanted to win when they were kids. They're doing it because they've not only discovered it later when they've got an opportunity to do so. And, and it, it just, it, you know, the, yes, it's fun. Yes, it's exciting. Yes, it's demanding and thrilling. And Steph, uh, but he's got the same passion we've got, yep. and that's the beauty of this form of the sport. It's not the same for every level of elite sport, with all the barriers between us and the people we'd like to talk to. There's no difference between Michael and the guys at the absolute elite level. I always tell young journalists coming into this trade, you go into a conversation with the assumption that these guys are as passionate as you do, and if you're not boring and you are respectful, that they are good to be keen to talk to you to tell their story. And that's exactly what I found with Michael when you've given him the space that he needs to do the things that he's doing. And if this is the end of Le Mans, it's not the end of his race career that will uh, complete the European Le Mans series. And I think we'll still see him racing somewhere. Um, but if that's the way that his Le Mans journey ends, then I'm very sorry. Maybe he needs another five-year project to, to go again. I've got to go again. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but uh, I'm enti P2, entirely in awe. P2. Entirely in awe of someone doing two things at elite level. Yep. And he does two things at elite level. He's a stunning actor. That is his trade. This is his passion. And the time that he must have dedicated to the physical and the mental preparation uh, to just do this is pretty awe inspiring. Some onboard audio from either the Ferrari or the twice. It does sound like the Ferrari, but uh, you were watching there the battle at the top of the LMP2 class into Europol's Fabio Scherra and have Louis Delatraz and the WRT car number 41. That's the red, red, white, and grey car. And the black car with the green highlights to Kane teams, Nico Pino. Now we are ready for WRT to come into the pit lane. So this will be the car in second place. Delatraz has been in for a while, I think. Uh, so let's see whether he comes in through the slow zone. There he is. And the into Europol car, easy to spot. Green and yellow halves to the car, basically. Long slow zone into the Dunlop curve, uh, into the uh, Porsche curves rather, and then all the way through the chicane out onto the start finish line. You can see vehicles heading off in the direction of that impact to Michael Fassbender with repair equipment aboard. Until that tyre wall is repaired, the slow zone will remain. Thierry Tassin watching on, another of the great Belgian racing legends who are involved with the WRT racing crew. And a Duraball lead, by the way, is going out over two minutes now. And uh, their silver driver, Kubat, has done his six hours. So if Fabio Scherer is fit enough, we've, he's got that problem with his foot, we've been told this that much of an issue oh, aboard the car. You need to go and have a little I look saw for, for some of the video. Up, hopping out the posted, car. Yeah, hopping, literally hopping the car around it. the car as if it's some sort of added value pit stop challenge <laughs> lark. But no, he, he was run over by the 33 Corvette. Yeah, but, um, um, the team originally said they thought he'd probably broken bones in his foot and, and that may transpire to be the case. If even, frankly, even is it just severe bruising, uh, having suffered that um, once before, um, that is no joke. Well, I broke a couple of toes in Sebring and I've only really stopped feeling it about two or three weeks ago. And that's a long time and I've not been driving race cars. No, indeed. Uh, by the way, the lead gap between Alessandro Pierre Guidi and Brendan Hartley is still hovering around the 19, 20 second mark. So that's, uh, that's not really moved so much since we went through the last pit cycle. There's a battle on track. WRT car just leaving its pit box. There goes the Alpine. That's sixth and seventh, you can see on the graphic just leaving the pit lane, so there's what between them, what was that, sort of 10 seconds maybe? That's come That's down with a pit stop, battle, isn't it? That's uh, 20 seconds taken out of that gap uh, with Mathieu Vazivier. That will be a change in... Ferdy Habsburg. Full service, Ferdy Habsburg. Yeah, quite slow full service team car for WRT. That's not like them. Very much not like them. Also recently through a pit stop is Jeronic Van in the uh, Smith Porsche, the number 93 car. Dan Smith has come to join us from uh, fresh from breakfast at United Auto Sports with a little mini tube of refreshers. That's going to go really well with my double espresso. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a love heart. Is that going to be like what's its names in a bottle of Coke? <laughs> <laughs> they're actually love hearts, so uh, oh, thank you. Oh, there'll be some messages there, that'd be lovely. Absolutely. I'm sure that was Richard Dean's personal idea. He's got that kind of album. <laughs> so this slow zone in there. Good, good morning, Guy Smith. Morning. Uh, the slow zone in uh, the Porsche curves, and this as a result of Michael Fassbender getting spat out as so many have. Actually, this heli shot, if we hold it, we will see what the result of this. This is turning off the public hi highway, the first element, and then you come through this right-left sequence, and as he turned left, look at the impact there, he was trying to avoid running out wide, and in fact, he said it on the radio exactly as uh, as Peter Dunbrecht had suggested. He was trying to avoid running out wide there and, in, and getting another track limits infringement. I don't know how many he had, whether that might have been a drive-through infringement, but he was desperately trying to avoid it and just tighten the line too much. Car looped into the pits. LMP2 leader in the pits. Yep. Share a state support, so we won't get a chance to see whether or not he's still hopping around on that. But he uh, will still be hopping around. The, 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 the hopping not around will not have stopped. Whether the foot's broken or not, it what? is clearly far too painful to even walk on. What did you ask, Guy? This, we're now close to 20 hours into the 24 hours of Le Mans 2023. 
and the way this racetrack develops, multiple, multiple, multiple incidents, gravel everywhere, bits of tyre debris everywhere, bits of car, carbon everywhere. How filthy does this track get through that? It's, it, it, there's places where it's barely a single line. Yeah, it, it's pretty treacherous, but at this point in the race, the track is not in great shape and obviously the marshals do a great job and if there is an incident they obviously clean up we saw that at um, Mulsanne corner but um, and also the cars now are starting to become a little bit second hand the brake pedal might be getting a little bit long there might be there's you know a, a gear box issue or whatever else so really the end is in sight and um, you know while there's many people still fighting for position some of these guys are just literally just nursing it to the end at this, this point and um, they just want to get that finish weather remains sort of fairly constant, presumably sort of in the time early morning is, is about the zenith of the track and then it just continues to degrade as more and more muck gets thrown out, more and more gravel and tyre debris and, and it, it becomes, although the grip level is good online, there's quite a lot of the lap in any lap you're not online. And, and that's it, you've got the marbles, the marbles of rubber, little, little pellets of rubber offline and while that's okay if you're driving online, when you're not online, which these hypercars and even the P2 cars, when they're making the passes around the outside of the Porsche curves, they are risking putting two or possibly four wheels into those marbles. And t let me tell you, when you got those marbles, you got marbles for a reason, you, you might as well hit a wet patch. So if you imagine it being like a single line on a dry track, it's a very similar situation. So these guys can't switch off, although the track is dry, one small mistake, run a bit wide, and they will um, pay, pay the price for that. Leaders on pit road, number eight, in and out. Full tank of gas, no driver change. Sebastian Bre uh, Brendan Hartley remains in, no tyres. And you saw Alessandro Pierre Guidi. There he is, coming down pit lane. Was, uh, the, uh, who was that coming down the pit lane in front? Uh, number six, Porsche Penske car, I think. Oh. Uh, Steve Jones in the oh. 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 car, just coming down pit lane as well. Oh, six that's cars the other WRT garage. car. Yes, it yeah. is, from second AMP. That, that was the red car, the red tail that I was thinking. Oh, there's the, uh, the uh, Ferrari, but it's not. So, Toyota and Ferrari no longer stopping on the same lap. No. Their last stop was on the same lap. The stop before that was on the same lap. We've seen the leads change in the pit lane on the same lap. You can't do that if you're stopping a lap behind somebody else. So Ferrari crept another lap in, or have Toyota somehow been forced well, to stop a lap short? I can see what short. I can find on the state lane, some, uh... Because, Guy, these guys have been going at it 11 tenths. There is absolutely no sign of any backing off between Alessandro Pierre Guidi in the Ferrari and Brendan Hartley in the Toyota. They've been going at it absolutely hammer and tongs. So I have the last pit round of pit stops, I don't know if you saw it, but Pierre Guidi was in first from the lead, and the car wouldn't restart when they dropped it onto its wheels, and then they, they had to power cycle it, lost about 30 seconds. So Brendan went by, or Buemi, Buemi went by at that stage, retook the lead, and then it's like somebody had lit the blue touch paper. Alessandro Pierre Guidi came after him like a woman scored. He just tore into him and went straight by and took the lead. And Do now we... he's a was. I mean, I guess the concern is, is we know that the Ferrari's got the pace, it's got a pace advantage, but, you know, that issue... Oh, Ooh, slow zone, slow zone. 311 Caddy, wasn't aware of that. That's 311 ready for Caddy it. is very marginal energy, it needs to come in right now, 6% Yeah, this, is, this will be his in-lap. It, it, well, the, the last pit stop, the most recent one, where Brendan took over, uh, there was no drama at all, Ferrari dropped down, gone. Yes, right. So, you know, it's, it's there's a power recycle required you know, for the right. Ferrari. We've all, got a, we've all got a laptop, we've all got a phone. But no, switch on, you stupid thing. You, you were fine five minutes. I mean, it's yeah. that, it's, yeah. that's exactly what it is. And, and, you know, in a million pound race car, you hope that the electronics will be, and they are, much more resilient. But on the other hand, everything has a, has a limit somewhere. James Collado said, he said, you know, even though they've done multiple long distance endurance testing they're still kind of in, they're kind of in the unknown at the minute i think they even this is surpasses what the testing have done yeah. so um, we are in the unknown but yeah it's super impressive by these uh, two top two cars just been at it hammer and tong all race long and most of their distance testing was actually pre-season as well they've done one since the season started i think a poor car they did a couple of winter tests so actually one of them was wet so they've got knowledge but at that stage they had little knowledge of the car 
you know, now they've got a lot more knowledge of the car and also therefore, you know, ramping up the knowledge of what it can and can't do in the wet on a real racetrack or on this racetrack, which isn't a real racetrack, if you know what I mean. So, you know, and, and again, I'm sure in, all, all the way through your career here, there are things that you have to do here and you cannot do here that don't relate to anywhere else you go because of what it is, because it's public highway. What, what, what's impressed me actually is the, uh, the AF course team, how when I saw them in Sebring, they looked like they'd kind of just been thrown together and kind of were in a car, a very fast race car. And now they look like a proper, well-oiled race team. And not, not dissimilar to how we were with Bentley. I mean, they've only done a handful of races together. Now they've got people that have worked together previously, but when you try and merge different groups of people together, it takes time. Mm. And, and with a new uh, car, and a complicated car. Absolutely. Uh, at that. But, the, but the, the, the spirit in the team is just so relaxed and on it. It's it's quite remarkable for what you say. It's, it's right, it's a pickup crew and a brand new one. I mean, Porsche were in the same deal, but Penske Porsche team at Sebring, they had engineers working on the car who hadn't even been paid because they'd not been in the company a month. That's how new some of these programs are. I mean, the fact that we've got a battle like this at Le Mans, you know, in those circumstances, is remarkable. Uh, three points of interest here. The number six Porsche confirmed they're changing the hybrid battery in that car. Um, confirmed, too, that that was an early stop for Toto. Waited to find out exactly why. Well, the, the key to, we'll have to wait until the uh, written reports well, come out on Thursday for the, that, I think. The, the key to that is the level of energy that still has left aboard the Ferrari at the point which that happened. It's all about the slow zone. The other point of interest, and guys pointing it on the screen, is being called to race director immediately as the team manager of the leading car in LMP2 into your competition. Now, has somebody overstepped their drive time allocation? Have they the, got... Uh, the only thing is that it's a minimum, minimum six hours. They're on maxima. Um, I don't think they're close to that. Four hours in any six is, is the main maximum figure. Yeah. Meanwhile, nicely executed driver change. James Calano with fresh rubber. Brendan Hartley up to speed with tyres that he's already done a stint on. But he's been in really good form in this race, Brendan Hartley. Just seems to have had a little bit of pace over his teammates in the number eight Toyota. The big change here is, that was 20 seconds. It's now four seconds. And that's the full service for the Ferrari as opposed to the fuel and go. Gas and go takes a lot less time than if you're also, because you can't start the tyre change until you finish the fuel, the driver change can go on at that stage. That slightly seems a non seconder to me, but there we go. Um, so, yeah, there's Alessandro Pierre Guidi. Let's have a, a media quick duties. Chat. Yeah, quick chat with uh, Lecky, one of the French network, sporting network. Lecky, uh, one of the biggest sporting news. That's just out the pits, the third 311 car, the hands of Jack Aiken. Was he coming into the pits then? Out he, was. The pits. he was coming into the pits oh. when they had that lock up. Oh, yes, yes. And so that was it for the stop. I don't Jack think he was Jack in the in car. The yeah. At that point, I think Jack's just got aboard the car. Now we're at four hours and one minute to go. What happened here? On some corner. Oh. That was actually the first chicane, that's, wasn't that's it? That's not Mulsanne Corner, that is the chicane he crashed in in the wet. Crashed on the exit, didn't he? Crashed yeah. here at the same, same place. Base. He almost met exactly the same fate. My goodness. It was a strange, kind of a strange accident, really. Well, kind of stepped out of the rear, hit the kerb, which knocked it straight. So we're going to go to another slow zone. We are about 20 hours in, less about 30 seconds of this race, gentlemen. If you like, a European Le Mans series race to go, and the lead gap is 3.7 seconds. That was very strange. That is really deja vu. That is that is almost the same instant he had, the same instant jean eric Verne had in the 94 Port Peugeot, straight off into those bits of barriers. And in fact, all, in fact, all the advertising hoardings are back shows how much work has gone on there, because they've been repeatedly uh, assaulted and attacked. Not just those two cars, a, a, hard, a huge number of them have. Our class leaders with four hours to go, James Collado, Fabio Scherer, and Sara Bovi. Stand by to clear slow zones eight and nine at 12.30. 12 0030. 12 
Well, there is the engines for Porsche Curves. The tyres that Michael Fassbender removed with his crash have been replaced. That was Our work the... marshals are back at it. Yeah, that is about to be removed, whereas we've got one just about to be introduced, or is introduced, at the first uh, chicane. Yeah, that will go from uh, Tetra, just before Tetra, the end of the S's, down to the exit of the first chicane. The slow zones are in sort of standard blocks. So again, Tetra is to first chicane, first chicane to second chicane, second chicane to Mulsanne Corner, Mulsanne Corner to, corner to Indianapolis Arnage. So to, to allow the cars to go by and still continue without really affecting the race, but allow a slow speed of car progress so that marshals can work at the side of the track in relative safety. Bamba on pit lane, and as Earl comes to halt, the number six car after that uh, hybrid battery change leaves pit lane. And uh, its next target will be the car that's in trouble, three laps ahead of it, next express car. Andre Lotra rejoins in 25th position overall at the wrong end of the LMP2 battle. It is still, though, the 51 Ferrari being chased. Here is the view from ben, Brendan Hartley's windscreen of James Gillard, who is now aboard the 51 car ahead. The number two Cadillac, meanwhile, back in the hands of Alex Lynn, currently shown as being a lap down. I don't think it is. We'll see that uh, change again when we see a timing sector change. So Ferrari, Toyota, Cadillac. That slow zone for the recovery of the 311 Cadillac, the hands of Jack Aitken. A bit of a whoopsie at the first Mulsanne chicane. It's been the graveyard of all sorts of ambition and fortune there today and yesterday. See the safety monitors inside each of the cars there. Showing Red and Hartley is a slow zone, reminding him of the speed. Though they will all have an automatic speed limiter button on their steering to press. to go at Le Mans, Martin Haven. Le Mans winner Guy Smith and Graham Goodwin in the booth watching the action with you. We're in a slow zone down to the first chicane on the Mulsanne straight after Jack Aitken got caught out in the Action Express Cadillac on his outlap from the pits and uh, dropped the car off the road and lightly into the barriers. Not a, a big impact, Guy Smith, but at this stage, just another frustration. He had a, a crash early on. He will be really beating himself up for that. Yeah, it's had a, it's had a tough race. Um, I mean, those guys have been uh, incredibly strong in the US, but um, you know, at this point, they've just got to put it down to experience. Um, I think it, it's probably Jack's first time here at Le Mans, so he's having a bit of a, a tough baptism of fire, but um, you know, he's a great, great driver, and I'm sure he will learn from this, and uh, I'm sure they'll be back next year. Yeah, I'm sure. Stewards of the IMSA program, the IMSA WeatherTech series, and the ability to run the same car in both has not been lost on them. Full course green, full course green. My shoulder, that's exactly right. Both slow zones have been removed at the same time. That's a nice little bit of synchronicity necessarily intended as the work has been tidied up. So we have a green racetrack, four hours to go. That is a, a European Le Mans Series race, as Greg Goodwin said. And we have 1.2 seconds in our lead battle. Third place, we have got Cadillac. Fourth place, Cadillac. Fifth place, the remaining healthy Mojo car number 93 is creeping back up the order. John Eric Van in the car. He crashed it heavily in the rain early on Saturday evening. That car is now back up to fifth overall, and in sixth place is the number five Porsche Penske Motorsport car, Dane Cameron. That's here from the number eight Toyota team. Okay, Brendan, plenty of energy available for override or no cuts. Plenty of energy available. The energy deployment of these cars has a maximum value and it is constantly monitored in real time. Now, there is no rule as to where the energy can come from. It can come
come from squirrels yep. on a treadmill or internal combustion engines or, or electricity or think. anything else. But there is a maximum. But what that is saying is that you can now deploy the energy. We heard that happening with the Ferrari when we were on board during the night. At times like when you're in the flat shift and the engine, the, the engine, the internal combustion engine keeps revving, as the clutches change gear, you're not transmitting that power. What the clever electronics can do is instantly and very briefly transmit the electric power. So your maximum power remains exactly as it was, even for the fractions of a second you're changing gear. And when you change gear, I don't know how many thousand times in a race, all of those fractions, those add up. And that's the kind of freedom he's been giving. OK, they had a problem with their charging system. Clearly, they've worked around that, and they no longer have a problem with their charging system. So what's been going on uh, while well, we've been going through this, though? So it's a 311 car, by the way, has been recovered to the pits and is now back on track. Uh, again, the hands of Jack Aiken. Uh, the question is why the bottom over the curbs there coming through Ted Rouge from the uh, number at eight car. Why the early stop? It was to take advantage of the slow zone to say to effectively grab back some track position. Boy, that has worked. And from 20 seconds down, uh, the Toyota now two seconds down. We're going to have to do some hard sums to see whether that's going to count back later in the race because that's what they've done. They've traded track position for their fuel window. The other factor that's worth keeping an eye on here, gentlemen, there is the leader, there is a second place car, and there. Is the number 50 car, which is sitting seventh, but could be a factor here in Ferrari strategy. Vector one even, gap 2.0. So, what James Carter for sure is hoping for is the cavalry to form a big up the leader, the 50 car, can be a, how can we put this, a confounding factor for Toyota's attempted attack here. Any pressure from behind to unlap from the second Toyota is going to take some of the brake power that's going to be required from an attack on the leading car for this race. And there's under four hours to go. And the other thing is, there's no guarantee it's going to remain dry. We might get a massive cloudburst. The leaders might all end up in the wall. There might be a safety car. If the 50 Ferrari can unlap itself from the leaders, then it's got a much better chance if it's on the lead lap of being back in the frame all of a sudden. And, and this race has taken one or two weird twists already. That it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that the, the script writers haven't finished with us. Yeah, if, that, if that number 50 car can get in front of the Toyota, it will just be thought of the side because they just want the straight fight. And if you're going to get the 50 car in there, it will just be a puff up between uh, two cars. Excellent Sector 2, Brendan. Excellent Sector 2. Gap 1.3. Almost 50 RS range, isn't it? If <laughs> we had such a thing. But again, gives a great indication. I, I think really my biggest takeaway from the quality and, and actually the survivability so far of these hypercars, because almost every issue has been predominantly human inflicted, scenery inflicted by the humans. My takeaway here actually this is a little bit like a spec formula race in that the driver seems to make a bigger difference to the total equation than i can remember in a number of years you get somebody who's really on top of the car and suddenly it's just a different car and, and that is changing with which driver is racing against which in, in their rotors and it's also great to see the tweak in the strategy you know maybe the, the slow there's a slow zone so we'll pit lap early small little things there just to try and gain some time here gain some time there and it all, all that's collectively as up and clever thinking that Toyota have not had to do in recent years because they've not been under the cudgel like they are here this is an absolutely knock down drag out knife fight of a race no one's got an advantage Everybody's got a ball in everybody else's throat. And, and yeah, this is, they're absolutely having to really think that they haven't done since the Audi, Porsche, Toyota, LMP1 hybrid days. They've not had this level of, this sustained level of intense competition. Yes, the Alpine hypercar was quick, but it never had the fuel capacity to, to match them on, on endurance. So it would be quick, but we always knew it was going to fade. And so they didn't have to match it in the same way that they have to match Toyota and Porsche and Cadillac. If they let them go by sticking too rigidly to plan A, they may know they're coming back.
Yeah, you've got to be flexible and thinking on your feet, and that's what these guys are doing. And it's great to see Toyota having this battle. We know we know they're a brilliant team. We know they're a, got great drivers and uh, you know well organised. But this is them, you know, backs against the wall. This is really seeing what they're made of, and you know they're really stepping up to the plate here, showing why they are you know multiple the long winners and, and world champions. And yet, for all their experience of this race and their third year now here with their car. Bucks, the new kids are on the block, Ferrari, Cadillac, Porsche, Peugeot. Peugeot, although they know the car, have never raced it here. They're all right there. They were all right there. And again, Graham, that's that's a, an indication of just what a good rule set this is by giving you targets to play rather than a box to be constrained by. It's allowed some free thinking with a lot of very different concepts. But the end result is. They've all hit the they've all hit the goals. That all they've their darts them. are in the ball. Let's have a listen. What's going on with Toyota? You're doing well, man. You're doing well. Keep pushing. It is a battle now. The other point I was going to make here, gentlemen, is we're lucky. We're sitting here and watching fantastic pictures of a fantastic motor race. But what's better still is there's never been ways to follow this racing. Oh, who's that gone off? And where have they gone? Something got away with that. The Toyota just catching the... Was that the Toyota? It's like smoke, wasn't it? It looked maybe the car, or whoever is in front of the road. Oh, no, it's a 57 oh, car. It's off the road. Somebody had gone off. That's, uh, it, is, it is Daniel oh, Serra. Yeah. He must have been getting right towards the end of a monster stint in that Kessel Racing Ferrari. He was absolutely flying, unlapped himself of all the class leaders. And we'll hold for a moment to see whether or not we get another view of that. We saw the dust cloud. I thought for a moment it was just one of the leading cars that came off the edge of the track. I've come back to the point I was about to make. The dust was in the air before they got there, but I couldn't see anybody ahead of them on the road, and we didn't see initially anybody in the gravel. So that's Team Jota. It's a 38 car. Quite a battle ball. It has been a difficult one. It is a double yellow at Marshall's post 24 25 to protect that instant site for yeah. Daniel. Looks like they're preparing to get the car back on track, but uh, obviously any chance of uh, a good result is going, other than a finish, which would still be a good result. Yeah. The point I was about to make there was there's never been an easier way, uh, easier, or rather, more choice in following endurance racing. It is a complex sport, and to do what we do, to do what the fans I know at home love to do, you can't do it without timing screens and data and different ways of crunching it and the way in which the geniuses in our production uh, facilities manage to translate that into graphics that are useful for us and for other people to follow. We talk a lot, don't we, about the manufacturing partners here and about, uh, you know, about Michelin and about Total Energies. We don't talk very often uh, about Alcamel Systems who have provided us with solid service. Uh, as part of the history of this World Championship. Well, it's more than it's a 20-year-old company. They've got a lot of experience. Not only does everybody rely, and this, this is not just us, this is the teams and the drivers on all, you know, looking for all the sector data for every driver on every lap. But their willingness, in fact, their enthusiasm for constantly evolving the graphics package to include more information, more for the fans to learn, because if it's written there on the screen, or written on our timing screen, the information is the same, but getting it to the fans is easier. And, and they've been such a part of, of keeping the information. Okay, Brendan, you're going. doing great. The slow zone will be active from turn 14 to turn 17 this lap. Uh, we'll remind you when you're closer. Slow zone from turn 14. Still. Yeah, I'm pushing hard, but that's pretty good concentration. I'm pretty good to go. So the basic stuff is on the radio, the slow zone or full course yellow, the red flags or whatever logos at the top, all the key, you know, the timing information, the new energy level oh, indicated a, for this season. That's a lifesaver. And, and what, we'll, what we'll talk to the guys about when we finish the race is working on a way in introducing the tyre information as well. We've, you know, we know basically what's going on in Land P2. If it's raining, it'll be the wet. If it's not, it'll be the slick. But in GTE, and especially in hypercar, and that's really where the focus is going to be over the years, 
knowing who's on the soft or the medium or the hard at the beginning of the race, for instance, would have told us all sorts of great information. The Toyotas have started on the soft. It's 40 degree track temperature. Wow, no wonder they're going away. You know, those sorts of things, when you learn about them later, explain a lot. But having the ability, and I'm sure somehow, the guys at Alcabell will make that happen. That's the kind of thing that the fans will see. The same as the manufacturer's logo and the car number and the car or the driver. That time information will be, uh, it, you know, when it's on screen all the time, it's just constant drip, drip, drip of information to the fans. And, you know, those guys have been great for, for pushing that along within our, our on-screen package. There's, there is that uh, that phrase, isn't there? A little knowledge is a dangerous thing, but having a lot of knowledge <laughs> is absolutely brilliant. And uh, the thank you to the guys to us, yeah. and the girls at, uh, in Alcabell Systems. They've been working hard again through the whole week, in fact, two weeks uh, here. So listen again into what's going on at Toyota. Well, actually, what's the plan? Am I doing another step? What, what is the plan? Yeah, we'll talk outside of the slow zone. Come here. Look at how close the second Ferrari is the back of the Toyota. Yeah. That says caught up going into or in the slow zone. That could be an interesting moment. But that is Brendan Hart, you know, under the pressure we predicted he might be a lap or so ago. Uh, he's looking to get eyes forward onto the first of those Ferraris, but the 50 car oh. in the hands of Miko Molina is right there with him. It is six laps off the lead lap, the number 50 Ferrari, so he needs to get a few more back. And that's not going to be possible in four hours of racing, three hours 45 of racing. So uh, there's not a chance he's going to end up on the lead lap. But again, that constant distraction. The last thing that Brendan Hartley wants now is uh, a Ferrari in his mirrors when he's trying to look forward and chase down James Glider. He wants to be uh, eyes forward that gap and it looks like the 50 is behind him he's flashing his lights making his intent that he's right behind him and wants to force Brendan into a mistake well wherever you've been for the last 21 20 and 20 quarter hours uh, if you've got the opportunity to, to stay with us for three hours and 42 minutes to see who wins this three hours 45 minutes only American Le Mans series race it's a uh, it's a great opportunity to see who may end up with the trophy at the end of the Centenary Le Mans and how that's going to work because again we've got no indication. The chances are it might be the 51 Ferrari or the number 8 Toyota. Chances are equally easy that it could be neither of the above. Okay Brendan, so the plan is to keep you in for a third stint. We are wondering if we can keep the tire. Do you think the tire can go three stints? Question. Okay, he's complaining that the 50 Ferrari is gaining too much in the slow zone. Probably actually the 51 Ferrari is gaining too much in the slow zone. I think he's right. I think he's right. That car is significantly closer than that. Now, what we didn't see is where the gap is. That car is significantly closer than that. Now, what we didn't see is where the gap was. Well, now, there's a couple of things going on here. Obviously, all three cars are being driven by extremely professional drivers under extreme pressure. The deal with the slow zone is you must be doing no more than 80 kilometers an hour by the pit entry line as you hit the line. Except there is a very slight leeway. It is a very slight leeway, but there is a very slight leeway. So a, a little moment early in the morning where Two cars with nose to tail in LMP2 in the slow zone, and the car behind is closing on the car in front. It's so close you can actually see them almost touching. Is it a tow going for the yeah, pass? This is exactly what he said might happen. He's, he's trying to lap to himself. This is pressure for Brendan Hartley. Yeah, he's got his own race to run. Well, it's it's more than that, isn't it? Because the pace we're seeing now from the Ferrari to unlap himself for one of how many? Six, Six laps. Uh, might not be replicated if he gets by. Well, it will have to be because he'll get blue flags and have to move aside if he is in front and holding up the Toyota. Track is back to green then. Track is back to green. Everything is green. Now, the deal here is, actually, in the short term, this could not work particularly well for Ferrari because if Molina gets by and is just a tick faster than Hartley, what happens then, guy? Hartley 
sits in the slipstream, it helps the Toyota speed up. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just cars will be faster than two cars the first time, I'm sure. But I think the Ferrari has the speed to break. If he gets past the Toyota, he can break the tow. And, um, and, and just basically sit there in between the two of them, probably get close to the 51 car and just kind of play rear gunner as he were. Well, and again, then those two would work quicker than the Toyota on its own. So, yes, there is definitely that element of the Toyota. Drama in the P2. We said that the team manager of car 34 had been called to race control. It is car 34 reported to the stewards for a safety car infringement. Lead at the moment, 49 seconds. That is going to be at least, Martin, at least a drive through penalty. Yeah, at least. So, Interior Paul's Fabio Scherer has got enough on his plate, but uh, a tiny safety car infringement. And it, it won't be a monster thing like passing a whole load of cars because these guys are far too good for it will be something fairly small but still a significant rule break. And by the way, when we're talking about small and breaking the rules, Ted, you need to put on sunscreen before you go to the beach to say hello to the family back home. It's Matt and Morgan. Uh, enjoy your day on the beach. And Ted, put the sunscreen on and then Gaga will talk a bit more about racing cars. So, a couple of uh, bits jobs and you have to do. Uh, confirmed 911 as we thought, the 911 uh, 911 is a retirement. Yep. Uh, the other one is a bit of a drama for the Hendrix Motorsport Camaro new gearbox aboard Ooh, that car. Okay. That is the first significant delay yep. for that effort. They're fitting the new big gearbox and we will see that car again by the look of things. Uh, that little bit of pressure and the traffic has played into the hands of James Collado because what was 2.0 seconds as the gap is now close to five. And don't forget, Colano's on fresher tyres. This is his first stint in the car. Brendan Hartley coming towards the end of a second stint or deep into a second stint. Now, whether they're going to triple those tyres or not, we might get the answer to that. The engineer was saying, we'd like to do a triple. Do you think the tyres can take it? Stop talking to me in the slow zone. <laughs> OK, is that a yes or a no? We never quite got to the bottom of that, but I guess we will find out. I think he's, I mean, if I was Brendan, I mean, he's, he's trying all he can to keep um, Collado yeah. close by. He's, he's also got um, Molina right behind him, and they're asking him to stay in and do it on new tyres. Consider lowering front anti roll bar. Copy. Chasing the track in this car all the way through. And a number of messages from Sebastian Buemi during the night chasing the track in that front roll bar. It's the front end of the car that's seemingly more of an issue than the rest. They, they seem to be making more changes to that car. It's almost like on the oval with the uh, weight jacker. They're, yep. they're constantly tweaking and playing around with that car, whereas we've heard nothing from the Ferrari guys about any kind of changes. The track's obviously quite quick. You've got Phil Hansen there, set the fastest lap in the United car, 22, and likewise uh, for uh, Jean-Eric Verne. Yep. Just did a quick time, so the track's still quite quick. Well, track temperature's nearly double. It's now up to 38 and, and above. It was barely 22 in the middle of the evening, and of course, then it was damp as well. So that rain helped to cool down the tarmac like it does at home on a normal road, because this is a normal road. Most of it, at least, this bit's on the racetrack. But it does bring the temperature down, so they ran the softer tyres and what have you through the night. The temperature now has climbed. It's nearly now as hot as it was at the start of the race at 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon, and I, I don't doubt that. There is broken cloud overhead, but there is sun coming through. I think the track, I mean, you can see the heat here is shivering. It, it should get quicker and quicker. Air temperature's up to 23, nearly 24 degrees now, so it's a much warmer day this morning than was yesterday morning. We're sitting in our air-conditioned splendour in our hoodies, but it is quite hot out there. OK, Brendan, quicker in Sector 1 and Sector 2 this lap. Great job, mate. Let's not forget the guy in front is on new tyres. The guy in front is on younger tyres than you. I just it's remember him, I'm sure that he'll see the gaps. There'll be frustration. And off the track uh, briefly for Brendan Hartley. Um, he took a little bit of advantage in doing that by avoiding... Rexy. Um, yeah, avoiding Rexy. But at least he avoided Rexy, and that's what he'll want to have done. Gunnar Jeanette in the green Porsche coming out of the pits, the Project 1 AO car, and down in 
is uh, fifth place in its class. That's his outlap, so he's trying to build up speed out of the pit lane. The Toyota coming in fully lit and battling for victory. Oh, the, I suspect the worst that will happen there is uh, uh, an addition to the list of track limits violations. Absolutely. And, uh, that was, let's put it this way, in the, from the book of Canny and Foxy, Cunning, but uh, I'm sure whatever happened with the, uh, the second Ferrari closing in on, in, on his game oh. Now that was, that was accident avoidance. That was taking to the hard standing to get by because the alternative was hitting him hard from, and it would have been a hard hit from behind and that would have put them both out of the race. So there was, there was no option there, was there, Guy? That's one of those whoop, twitches in as a race of pure, pure, pure reaction. It's just a pure avoidance. It will be the most investigation. Deep that's confirmed it was an overtake off the track. So we'll be interested to see exactly what comes out from, from that. Well, they will look at the data and see how much more slowly the Project One car was going than on the previous lap. And the team may have told Brendan, car leaving the pits right in front of you, watch out, he's going to be slow. But even so, you're not sure how slow he's going to be. Nick Nielsen getting ready to get aboard the number 50 car. So this is going to be interesting because we haven't really had eyes on the 50 cars strategy, where they are if they're in the same pit stop rotation. I'm not sure that 51 and 8 are due in just yet. Uh, they're, they're one different strategy to remember now, because the total stops. Uh, yeah. Nothing more. Oh, no. no I think it has. Uh, the so Ferrari was stop something like 30% energy when the, uh, the Toto stopped. Let's take a look at the energy graphics, boys and girls in the truck, and uh, see what it looks like. It's not, it's not like your fuel gauge in your car. If you drive a if you drive a mild hybrid, then it's much more like that. You've got a, an ICE and an electrical power source. And it's that total energy that is the maximum for the car. And that is what we uh, what we represent in what percentage of this basically of their power for the stints they've got left. Now back in the LMP1 hybrid. Was, have a maximum that you can deploy per lap, that's no longer the case. Okay, Brendan, doing a great job. Gap is 5.9. Last time around, car ahead 28.2. You are 28.5. You're doing awesome, man. They're really encouraging him. They're really kind of, not coaching him, but they're, they're really supporting him and yep. giving him some positive feedback, keeping his uh, positive vibe. Yeah. That's exactly right, and, and, and keeping him in the right mind frame, keep attacking, he's getting away from me, it's okay, he's not getting away, he's just creeping away, and he's got fresher rubber, it'll come back to us, and it's all those things that stop you as a driver doubting yourself, and what's wrong with my car, why is he getting away, I was quicker than him last time, yeah. it, it's all of that, it's all part of the psychology of the, of the sport. best relationship between the driver and the engineer is all about that. Yeah, we know it sucks to save fuel, but you're doing exactly what you need to do, and this will pay off for you. Just, we know, you know it will, we know it will, we discussed it, we just know it hurts a lot right now. You know, there's that sympathy level. And you can see the, um, the 50 car in the back of the number eight, but because it didn't get the pass done, it's kind of just momentum. You get to that point where if you don't get it done within the first couple of laps, you find you in their dirty air and you start to gain, lose a little bit of damp force. Maybe you work the front tires a little bit harder and it then becomes harder to make that pass. With an Hartley, purple first sector on this lap. Wow. Uh, Fastest so beginning... lap of the entire race, potentially. Yeah, That's so... now helped by Antonio Fuoco in the 50 car. For a long time, it was Sebastian Borde in the number three Cadillac that was set on lap three of the race. Fuoco set his fastest lap 227 laps later. Significant penalty, by the way, coming for the 709 Glickenhaus. That's the car running in eighth position. That puts on aboard the car, speeding in the pit lane. A stop and a 30 second hold for that car. That will lose it in position to its sister car, yep. dropping back down to ninth place. Seems unlikely that be a repeat of last year's podium finish for. House. Brendan, any further feedback on the tyre? How does the tyre feel? Question. Didn't quite get that one, I'm afraid. 
I think he said it's sort of stabilized. I think he, he clearly feels good in the car. This is them trying to claw back 10 or 15 seconds without having to make that uh, that uh, tire change. Well, he did the fastest first sector and the fastest personal yeah. uh, sector too. So clearly he uh, is confident in the car. Yeah. Well, this could be a new fastest race lap. His last lap was a 328.3, the fastest race lap of 327.4. He doesn't have to be an awful lot faster in sector three, and the road is relatively clear. Nicholas Nielsen, we know, is standing by to get aboard this car. Is it going to be this lap or yeah. the next? Looks like it's this one. lap. He wouldn't be taking the tyres out of their blankets and rolling them through the front of the garage unless he was due in imminently. They're not going to leave them sitting there for two or three laps. It is Brendan Hartley in pursuit. Under six seconds, the gap. 50 car rolls down pit lane. First time it, under three minutes 28 for that car. Will be Nicholas Nielsen with an extraordinary record of success with Ferrari, with Air Corsa in recent years. I think I said earlier in the show, at least one major race win or title every year since 2018. And right in front of him was the Air Corsa 54 Ferrari, the silver car that is currently in fourth place yep. in GTE AM. Davide Regan, I think, getting towards the end of his stint. We saw Thomas Floor sitting in the garage. I wouldn't mind betting that he's about to get back into the car. Just double check as if he has to, as he has to. Uh, and Corbett works his way to the top of the uh, GTE as well now. Yeah, he's over, uh, over any rival drivers recently. Yeah, Thomas does need a further 54 minutes. Yeah, so it'll be a, 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 another stint for Thomas Floyd. I kind of imagine this might be the right time to put him in. Track yeah. is cleanish, weather is goodish, he's rested ish. And by the way, we saw the orange Aston Martin that uh, the Toyota managed to clear. That is uh, with the pit stop for the 54. That means both the 25 and the 56 move ahead as well. The 93. The Peugeot. Peugeot. This is the fifth place car. To the garage. Back in the garage, that's bad news. It's not always really bad news. Essentially, when the car is on the pit apron, you're allowed a limited number of people to work on it. Correct. If you need to do anything other than routine service, back in. Change the nose, change the tail, that, that comes under, you know, the stuff you do on the petrol forecourt. Anything else, back into the garage. Then you can throw unlimited number of people at it. The nose is off. Hose is blowing stuff out of air holes. Is this power steering issue? I'm working at the back of the car as well. There we go, warning flag for car number eight for overtaking beyond the track limits. Mm, okay, so it was a warning. We know why you did it, but it is illegal. Just don't do it again. Okay, fair enough. I, that's pragmatic to me. Yeah. You know, it, it was either that or risk a very big accident. Because you have a big car right behind. If he got sideways, the 50 car would have been right in there as well. Uh, meantime, Nico Veroni is putting the hammer down and has been the fastest lap of the race so far for the 33 car, 350.439. Now 78 seconds to the good over Sarah Bovey, still working her bronze driver time in the 85 line Dames car. Now, when she finishes this stint, will she be done? Uh, so apologies. When, when she finishes this stint, she will be done. She, she, yes. she might be they rotated yes. through and then we'll go to Michelle Gatting, the silver raced, uh, silver graded driver, and then the gold. Louise Beckin is at Peugeot. Good morning, Louise. I'm on my way to Peugeot, but the 93 is back out uh, and on its way to track now. Okay, so whatever it was, it was swift. If you could ask what it might have been, that would, uh, I know, obviously that would be in your remit. Uh, it was a fairly quick in and out, much more than about 90 seconds. Sarah Bovey, four minutes from the end of her required minimum of six hours. Okay. It's a drive-through penalty for the LMP2 leading car. Pro will take over the safety car. So Fabio Scherer, 47 seconds to the good. That is going to leave it mighty tight 
for the lead of LMP2 with under three and a half uh, hours to go. And that's why he's been rocking on like a man possessed. But I mean, he has anyway, but even more so. Miguel Molina looked like he'd been working hard for a living there. It's uh, it's pretty warm in the cars. Cadillac number three. That's a ring of van der Zander when it came in, but the driver changed there. And uh, the old Bamba, I think, the white helmet. I oh, know he's the number two car. Okay, Brendan, box this lap, pit confirm, box this lap for fuel. Copy, box this lap. Scott Dixon, this is the Kiwi flag, so that was Scott Dixon taking over that car. Box this lap for Brendan Hartley. There's the 34 car, Fabio Shero. That's another two laps to get by. Yeah, behind the drive through penalty. Oh, 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 fully twitched up, and of course, what you can't do is combine it with a routine pit stop, so if they need one, when they need one, They'll have to do that separately. Uh, meanwhile, by the way, as uh, Miguel Molina gets uh, late exclusive uh, views of track of its warning flag, but he's out of the car now. Yep. Uh, but there is a battle firmly on the way for third place in LMP2 because Neil Gianni is being caught by a flying Paul Loup Chatan, pole sitter. Last time around, uh, two seconds taken out to advance advantage, and it is a two second gap. Nudo's going on to the front, number three, Caddy. Don't know if it's new, new. Seems to have gone through a few body panels, most of Caddy's hand. So the nine click now skip the pit lane with Nathaniel Berton at the wheel. Let me serve a lap penalty. There is 41, the remaining healthy LMP2 WRT car, Louis Delatraz, comes in and hits his marks. He comes in from second place. As you said, Graham, the gap was very small, and uh, Louise Beckett is there. I'm at Peugeot 93. They had a lack in hydraulic pressure, so they just needed to bring it in, get it resorted, and, and back out again. And as the, as the team have just said to me, they did a fantastic job to do it so quickly. They did indeed. Thank you very much, Lou. And that's a change to their transmission system selection. They went from uh, electronics to hydraulic. It's a transmission that Peugeot build themselves. They didn't do what Audi did, go to Ricardo. They haven't gone to X-Track. They well, may have had some input from X-Track. We saw X-Track guys in the garage with the team, but uh, it is a uh, self-constructed transmission. And that's been really the Achilles heel of the car in terms of reliability since its debut at Monta last summer. Into the pits is our GTE app leader. Only stays in. See his knees tucked up right behind the steering wheel there. He's a considerably different height to Ben Keating. He and Nicky Katzberg both uh, a bit taller than their France rated teammate. They have to tuck themselves in into the convoluted space. Now goes Robert Kubica in the 41 WRT car. And Kubica passed the team of the car that failed on the last lap of Le Mans two years ago. Went from being briefed by the ACO officials in the garage. Okay, now what happens now is when the car passes the chequered flag, we'll go with you, we'll stand by it underneath the podium, then the driver will come in, in the car, then we'll oh hang on a minute, and they walked over to the other side of the garage. I mean that's how close they were to winning Le Mans. That's tough, isn't it? And you can imagine that the same was probably happening with Toyota back in 2016 as well. I mean, yeah, everything was in place, ready to go and receiving service number eight Toyota, Brendan Hartley stays in, no change of tyres, it's on the medium, they'll be good for three stints, maybe even four. We heard his race engineer saying they wanted to triple them, looks like that's exactly what they're going to do. And actually Guy Smith, his pace has been pretty good all the way through the stint, hasn't it, so that might well work. Let's catch up with Louise Beckett in the pit lane. I know it's probably old news, but the 9-11 uh, Proton competition of Michael Fassbender, uh, the door has just gone down. Such a shame. When I came back this morning and saw they were still in the running, I was really happy for them, okay, but random, their race go, is go over. Yeah, 9-11, confirmation of its retirement. All the body language, I'm afraid, when the car came in was that ain't going anywhere, had a big hard slap on the wall. Uh, first pass of the Porsche curves, as many cars have. That's kind of, there's been some parts of this track that have claimed more than their fair 
number of victims this year. I mean, the race of attrition in that particular element of the Porsche curves and the first she came on the ball side. Boy, the number of people who've not had an incident there is probably smaller than the number that have. And Indianapolis as well as, as the exit of Indianapolis is uh, also good. Just going back to the tyres, we said about Brendan Hartley now on his, uh, would it be his second stint on these tyres or third stint? Third, third, third stint. Okay. Yeah. So the car can feel pretty good by the end of the stint when you're on low fuel, but now when you fuel the car up, you've got a lot more weight. Um, the tyres are obviously are getting older, so it becomes more and more difficult um, as the stint goes on, obviously. But uh, his pace has been good and, um, you know, absolutely no reason to be changing tyres at this point. Fabio Scherer in the pits, that was a fuel stop. He will be in again next lap. He still has not served his penalty. That's so, the drive through, isn't it? That was not the drive through, so he's going to have to do it, yeah, because yeah. he's already pa passed by once. That's the second time past the line. It will need to be this lap. Where in fact, it won't be Fabio, because there is Fabio. You can tell, not just because it looks like Fabio, but also because he's limping like John Wayne on a bad day. So he is out of the car and he's being driven again by Albert Costa. And yeah, look, he can barely even stand on the foot when he's been running around the car, Jim, for the pit stops. He hasn't been hopping. running, he's been hopping. hopping. That's right. So yeah. I missed it. What actually what happened? happened? He was run over by his foot. His left foot was run over by the Corvette. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, yesterday, now, yesterday this, evening. Is this drive-through just, I'm catching up? Just no, that's just the driver yeah. change. That's full right. service driver change. They still have a drive-through penalty for Four. passing another car under the safety car. Okay, that's and what so, I wanted to find out. Yeah. Have we still had anybody uh, get a penalty yet for track limit? There's been don't go there. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, there hasn't been. actually, that led to the demise of Michael Fassbender's car because he was coming into that first left, a really fast entry into the curves. Mm -hmm. yep. and knew he was going to run out yep. wide and tight the line in. and spun the car. And he, on the radio, he, uh, Peter was saying, yeah. he was trying to avoid track limits. And on the radio, he said, sorry, guys, I've hit the wall. Damn it, track limits. Yeah. That's what he was trying to avoid. So, And, and it's a combination of you put the lock off because you're mm -hmm. tight the corner, and then you think, okay, I'll need to lift as well. So you lift yeah. off, and and suddenly the car... Especially with the Portion. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, All and that it, unsprung weight in the back, even though that engine's still been going way up. He was still, really lucky. He was just trying to do the right thing, and it unfortunately caught him out. And he almost climbed the wall there, too. That was yeah. the other thing. That, that, Nicholas Nielsen in the Ferrari, the number 50, just on the fastest lap of the race on a 327.3, <laughs> so... They are pushing hard still. They are six laps down to our leader. There is the number eight Toyota. Just fresh off uh, a few stop. There goes the 51 back out. Uh, the irritant, the, uh, the grain in, uh, of sand in, in the shoe of Brendan Hartley that was the 50 Ferrari, because that stopped slightly out of sync and it dropped back a little, Nick Nielsen's no longer in the position right behind that second place to it. So, so, so that annoyance for Hartley has gone. He was able to just distance himself a little bit, got a couple of breaks in traffic and then he was gone. And then that sort of... That, magnetic attraction was broken, wasn't it? And, yeah, and, yeah. and the 50 car never got back up to him. And again, I think yeah, every time Hartley has been in the car, he has made quite a difference to, to the way that the balance of power is swinging. And, and it's, it's like a, it's like Newton's cradle. It's like going yeah. from one side to another. It's just constant motion right now to tell which is actually in the better place. The Ferrari, which has got a cycle fresher tyres. The gap is 10 seconds. The gap is 10 seconds. It's interesting. What's the gap? I don't see him. Yeah, three hours to go. Mm. And uh, we're, I don't see him. That's fantastic. But, but, you see, but I mean, that, that, that they're close enough. He thinks he should be able to see him. He, he could before they both stopped. So let's hear from the Porsche team, see what's going on with them. Right. We're not going to hear from the Porsche team. That's been waved off. Well, there's the 56 Porsche, the Iron Dames car, that still remains in second place. 85, beg your pardon, uh, in the 
GTE AM class. It's still the Corvette leading, Nico Moroni, Sarah Bovi. At the end of this, did will have done her drive time. So uh, silver and gold rated teammates, Michelle Gatting and Rahel Frey can finish the race. Three and a quarter hours, or three hours or so, so it'll be there. And Ahmad El Harty, ORT by TF now, he claimed the first ever World Championship pole position for an Omani driver when he put the car on an amazing pole at Spa. We were watching the battle, as we often do, between Ben Keith and the Sarbog, and then boom! Yeah, out of nowhere. The most yeah. astonishing lap from Al Harty. Now, he's got plenty of experience at Spa from his British GT racing days, but that was a, that was a, a proper run. And he might be in a position now where he becomes the first Imani driver to stand on the podium they are in third place and very much in contention. In comes the number two caddy, Alex Lynn at the wheel. And this car, well, it's in the all Cadillac battle for the final podium spot. That's going to have to be a tough one. They're, they're actually a few laps apart, but it doesn't take much to happen to the number two car to swing the balance to number three. Well, I guess either way, it would be a caddy on the podium, which would be, I think, all, all things considered, a great result. I'm yes. sure they would have liked to have been yes. fighting for the win, but I think... Um, they just not quite uh, got the pace of the, of the leading two cars, but uh, still, third place would be no end. 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 And they've not had the luck either. Both, in fact, all of the Cadillacs have had an incident or two, three, four. So that's taken them out of the hunt. We saw the number two car open. For viewers of a certain age, no, that is not Derek Bell. It's uh, a Derek Bell replica helmet, including down to where he had the Union Jack on uh, at the top of the forehead. That is Alex Lynn. He wanted a helmet. So many drivers have got different helmets, specifically for Le Mans. See, Miguel Molina's got uh, his regular pattern, but where it would mm. normally be white, it's got monochrome representations of Ferrari's racing history here. Alex Lynn has gone for this. Um, who was it who in the, the Panis car? Jop van Eutert, yes. instead of having his own regular helmet, secretly had had his helmet painted in the livery of team owner Olivier Panis in the helmet he wore when he won the Monaco Grand Prix in Ligier. So that was a, a little touch. So some of it is the more relevant. The guys in the 50 car have all got red and yellow Ferrari livery, like on the car, and the 50 on it as well. They've sort of taken their own livery off for this race. So there's a lot of that going on. Nice little touch of Alex Lynn. Clearly, Dinger is a bit of a boyhood hero for him, as, as he is for many of us. I try, try not to remind him too often of, of the fact that he was in, the, in his prime when we were still young, but he's, he's still very much in his prime. And uh, clearly, Alex, yeah, reflecting that. So number two car rejoins, still in set in third place. It is a lap behind the leaders. A safety car could change that mm -hmm. in a heartbeat. Your safety car regulations, if he ends up in a queue in a safety car with the leaders behind him, and there's a two-thirds chance that that would be the case, because we have three safety cars, and the way they fall is kind of arbitrary, he could end up on the back of the hypercar field and on the lead lap, and suddenly that could change the dimensions of this race and the dynamics of this race. And that's kept the race more alive even maybe than it might have been in all three classes. Yeah, I mean, all the way through the, the, the grid, there's, there's action. Um, obviously, the battle. we've got the uh, It's a Europol car. Um, I believe it's now done its driver, so um, we'll see exactly where that shakes out, whether it stays in the lead or not. Um, should have done, shouldn't it, by yeah. now. Its last pit stop was 32 seconds. Well, there you go, that's what a pit lane delta is, yeah. 32 seconds. So, yeah, drive through, 32 seconds. Anything beyond that, there's been work done at a standstill. And holds at 15 on its 16 second lead. Yeah, so that 50 Good. seconds that he had in hand after the pit stop was very, very important. On board with Andre Lotterer. Just the 10 wins in the World Endurance Championship racing. Interesting that the chassis number of the 963, 963 number 111, it's not that, they didn't start at 001 and have built 110 before they got to this one. But that will be great for um, 
for chassis number geeks in many years to come because he won't just have it written down on a, on a piece of paper in scrutineering, there'll actually be video evidence That's right. of the car. And normally you can go round the outside here, but you see he's have to keep it more in the middle of the road because of all the marbles. At the beginning of the race it would have been a no-brainer, but... Um, Sunday drive with Granny. You know, you change down a couple of gears, ready for the gap to come, and then, yeah, it, it, it definitely affects the speed of the car. Of course, this Sunday drive is a little quicker than most, hopefully. Hopefully, not that it's quicker than most, hopefully. Hopefully, most Sunday drives are slower than this. And you can see how recently he has been in the pit lane. Yeah, well, graphics there on the right hand side of your screen showing brake and throttle application and also the energy state of the car. So that will be its mild hybrid system and also its internal combustion engine. On the left hand side, the gear selector position, five up to six, goes up to seven. And on the left, watch the speed. 321 is the magic number that takes you to 200 miles an hour. Anything north of that is into slightly scary territory. Right up to the limiter, not quite to the limiter guy. What is actually the fastest point on the circuit? And the reason for that is because if you get into the slipstream of a car at those speeds, you want to have a little margin so you can take advantage. Because yeah. 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 as soon as you hit that limiter, the car just stops accelerating, mm -hmm. which is obviously not what you want when you're trying to make a pass. So that'll be set at sort of 77, 7800 RPM with another 250, 300 RPM in hand because when you're in the turbulent air behind the car, close behind it, it's less hard, if you like, for the car to push its way through than, than standing air. And so you get that little advantage. You will have felt it yourself in, on a, in a road car behind a big truck. I mean, especially when you go past a truck, you feel the bow wave, you feel the yeah. wash. You know, you can see it with a boat. It's no different with a truck. That's why, that's why aerodynamics is called fluid dynamics, because air is yeah. a, it's the same way as very thin water. Very, very thin water. But, but it's got that, you know, you see cars side by side on the straight and they're bobbling around. Well, that's why, right, because you imagine two boats, they'd both be bouncing off each other's bow wave. So, so that weight, that air weight, is very much, uh, even though it's tied up in boats, it's tied up even more in racing cars. To help take hot air out of the car and all of that, it's still, you're still bouncing around on these cushions of air. When you first get into this, when you first get into high aero dependency cars, that must be an absolutely mind warping experience to, to get to grips with why these weird things happen that are invisible. And, and again, it's, you know, when you, with these cars, in theory, the faster you go through the corner, the more downforce you have, so the more the car is being pushed into the ground. And, and uh, it's, it's getting your head around that. Louise Beckett. I don't know if you've seen on the pictures yet, but the 38 Hertz Team Jota is in the garage. The driver's out of the car, they're not going anywhere, they're cleaning the car up, and what they're doing is waiting for the car, um, waiting towards the end and aiming for the car to be classified. Okay, and can you ask Sam how close to the end of the race does he need to go to actually make sure the car is classified? because that, that will be the main thing. I'll come back to you on that when Thank they're expected to go back out. Right. And uh, enjoy the tea while you're there. So, uh, he's at uh, Hertz Team Josie. Yeah, the 38 car has had a trying time, it is fair to say, at uh, Hybrid. Uh, the first car in private hands. Next time out for the World Endurance Championship, Monza in July. If you quite fancy a bit of watching this stuff trackside, and particularly, actually, there were fans in Portimao who could not get who could not get uh, tickets for Le Mans. There may well be other fans from Europe who couldn't get tickets for Le Mans who decide to go to Monza instead. 
Um, that's yeah. You can you can watch these cars track side, and you'll be able to see all of that going on. You'll also be able to see Proton racing their customer Porsche as well. Into the garage again. Problems for Porsche. Last time it was 93. This time it's 94. Now the 94 car was crashed earlier on as well by Gustavo Menezes. So both cars have been in the barriers. 93 was crashed by Jean Eric Van. A brief chip into the garage. They had a hydraulic pressure problem. Uh, their hydraulic gear selector shifter, I would think, would be the problem there. And I wonder if that is the same deal with the 94 car. John Eric Byrne going through the Porsche curves. You see the, the wear and tear that these Coopers go through. The wrap is coming off the right front fender. Yeah. It's lived a life, this car. A box V slap, box box, driver change. Okay, so he will come into this. And then by that, look at the pitot tube on the mm -hmm. left hand side. Mm -hmm. Barely even attached, it's bending yeah. right back. Now that measures airspeed. Why do you need that? Well, you correlate it with the wheel speed, but wheel speed can be affected by weather. So aircraft have a pitot tube to measure their speed over the ground, whether there's a headwind or not. Uh, they correlate their airspeed with actual ground speed, and that's exactly what you're doing here. Whoa, ho, ho, ho. Is that Valentino Rossi backing the Toyota in? Brendan Hartley taking some tips from the doctor, but he needs to stay on the other side of that white line because it's not just the marbles, it's the gravel as well, Guy Smith, that is such a big factor late in the race. Every gravel trap has been visited by everybody. their third stint, but that, that's down at Mulsanne Corner. That's a handful. Yep. Okay, Brendan, you need to control brake pressure. You need to control brake pressure in those places. I know it's difficult. The tires are getting old. Yeah, copy. Some apprentices there at TGR. What did you take? As, as a driver, what did you take from that? Controlling brake pressure. So he can't play with the balance anymore or the harvesting anymore. That all seems to be optimized. And these things take a lot of stopping. There's a lot of pedal pressure. Yeah, you can actually modulate the pedal. So usually um, with a downforce car, the first hit is normally a hard hit of, of, of pressure when you've got the downforce on the car. And then you actually bleed off the brake pedal as you go into the corner. And as you roll off the pedal, you carry momentum and roll speed through the corner. But that first input is so important. And it just seems that while the grip of the tires is, are going away, perhaps that first input, been aggressive, is just unbalancing the car. So he just needs to be a little bit more, possibly make a yeah. fraction earlier and a, just a little bit lighter. Well, John Elkin, the uh, CEO of Automobili Ferrari, has changed out of his Hawaiian shirt of yesterday. He's a little bit more dressed up Sunday if he's off to church later. He has that look about him, looking very sharp this morning. He was looking very chill. In, uh, I, I didn't quite, we didn't really quite get a look at the shirt close enough to see what all the different coloured patterns on it were. I'm sure it was very Ferrari Le Mans related. Let's hear again from the eight Toyota crew. Okay, Brendan, we have a question for you. Is four stints possible for you physically? Is four stints possible for you? Question. Yes. The codicil to which is, as long as I don't stay on these doggy old tyres, if you give me fresh rubber, I'll do it. Louise Beckett. Well, if you remember, that's exactly the same call that we heard earlier in the race, right at the beginning, exactly the same answer. He said, yes, I can stay in, and I'm not sure if the tyres will last. Yeah, put me in, coach. Definitely he's up for the fight. And, and you know, he knows what it means to win Le Mans. He's won it with Porsche, he's won it with Peugeot, and he wants to win it again, and he wants to win as tough a Le Mans as there's been in a decade and, and more, and probably certainly in his knowledge of Le Mans. I, I'm, I'm struggling now to think of another one where it's been so cutthroat and so cut and thrust all the way through. 93 for, uh, Porsche, uh, oh no, 93 Peugeot has been and gone. 94 Peugeot still in the garage. Let's hear from Louise again. Yes, I don't know if you saw what happened on track. I, I didn't. Um, the 93 Peugeot came in and had a nose change. Now, that's the one that had the hydraulics issue as well, which was a quick turnaround. But I don't know if you've heard anything or seen anything other than that on that one. Seen anything else? Again, that may well be an issue 
with Hydraulics. By the way, the, the reason that Peugeot, uh, that Peugeot Toyota stopped out of sync a little earlier was to come in while there were two long slow zones on the track, which reduces the speed of everybody else on the track, which then means that your pit stop quote takes less time. Yes. So it was a shorter stop, top themselves up, but again, you know, fuel and track position both that in that equation. That's the was Battle that the Cat's car ah, throwing off a bit of the uh, liner. Peugeot nose. The nose of the Peugeot. So that was where it lost bits of its nose. And that the replacement is on, but the onboard we saw a little earlier still had the 93 car with bits peeling off. So there's Carlos Tavares, himself a racing driver. I think I'm right in remembering that he's raced here at Le Mans. Maybe one of the support classes. Now, a few moments ago, we saw the Ferrari number 50 starting to close in on the back of the Toyota number 8. And earlier, you guys were talking about how the 50 had been hounding Sebastian Buemi, or, or it may have been Brendan Hartley. How much of that is, is bothersome, or can you just put that out of your mind? I think it's quite, it's a real pain, to be fair, because I'm just saying, I think that, um, you know, Brendan just wanted to focus on, on uh, the lead Ferrari. And when you've got the sister car behind you flashing its lights, basically just being a nuisance, it means that you're... Then why not, why not let him go? He's six laps now. Because then you've got another car between you and the leader, so uh, he, he, he can then can also start down. back yeah. you up, yeah. so yeah. it's yeah. just another yeah. Less than three hours to go. We're just past one o'clock here at the Circuit de la Sarthe, the centennial of the 24 hours of the month. We're going to enjoy leaving you to do your own commentary for 10 seconds while we swap Jim into the uh, commander's chair. And Anne Davidson will join with Guy Smith. And we will have our world champion and our Le Mans winner in the crew. Of us have done either? No, no, just those two. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, we'll take a quick pause. We we'll might have you in just a second. What's been going on? Give us an update. Well, we are pretty much in the same position as before with the Ferrari leading the Toyota. Still pretty close, but sort of 14, 15 seconds. It's kind of ebbed and flowed a little bit. But Looks uh, closer though than the last time I saw. I left when there was a minute distance between the two of them. So what happened there? Um, the Toyota made a it short stopped and did a pit stop under a slow zone. And uh, gained a little bit of time, actually got down to about two seconds from sort of about 10, 12 seconds down to two. So that was a smart move, but they gained uh, a little bit of track position, but um, obviously... Uh it looks like the 94 Peugeot that is in the pits is getting a new steering rack. So they had issues with the, uh, with the steering very early on in the race. We heard... Uh, was it Jean-Eric Verne? After the moment, only went off in Molsan and uh, got it beached in the gravel for quite some time. And he had a message saying, we need to cool down the, the power steering rack. Oh, really? Yeah, so uh, it's clearly a bit of an Achilles heel on that car. And now it seems like it needs replacement. I mean, that doesn't sound like a, a short... Yeah, a, a, a short bit of work down there, does it, Jim? No, not at all. Not at all. So yeah, Mark is, uh, Mark is hanging in there. He's, um, he's, on, um, he's on his third stint on the tyres, and they've asked him to stay in now for a fourth stint. Um, whether I, I doubt he'll stay on the, the tyres for a fourth stint, but you never know. They can do it. I mean, it's yeah. not unheard of uh, to, to be able to do the quadruple on uh, particularly the medium tire you know, with, Which, the, with the Michelin runners. So, yeah, it, it can be done. You obviously need to do a, quite a bit of tire management as well. And therefore, you know, around the high speed corners, just throttling back a little bit, not pushing them, overstressing them. And those are uh, higher energy corners. And you can see there the uh, the conversation going on down at uh, Peugeot with uh, Loic Duval in the background, suited and booted with helmet on. There's the Glickenhaus technical team. 
Yep, Keeping an eye on the data. Still got there. Two cars in the mix. I mean, they're P8, P9. You can't really see the screen there running in P9. And uh, they've, yeah, they've had reliability, but like many other drivers out there, their, their drivers have suffered as well. Been a mistake or two, hasn't it? Yeah, but you know, it's it's to be forgiven because I've never seen a Le Mans like this. It's 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 calmed down in terms of the conditions now, but uh, the problem is now the drivers are so tired they're absolutely sure. fatigued from yeah. what they've been through. This relentless, changeable conditions. And uh, yes, this is a hard enough race anyway, but this has been absolutely savage for them. Is this the type of time when it's just adrenaline that gets you through it when you're really, when you're that tired? This is where you are digging in. You dig it deep into your reserves at this point because you are tired. You know, you've not slept physically, mentally tired. And, um, you know, but you know that the end is close. So you've got, the, you know what the end game is. So it keeps you going. Particularly when you're embroiled in a, a, a immense battle like we got with uh, Toyota and, and Ferrari, they're essentially just down to the two cars, the Ferrari 50. You know, still that six laps behind, so you can count them out. So it does come down to just you know those two mighty brands fighting it out right through to the end. With two hours, 54 minutes to go. 14.6 seconds with, separates them. With two Cadillacs lurking. They're lurking. And, and, yeah, and that's, that's yeah. all. They're, they're lurking. That's like the vultures just yeah, circling yeah. around, <laughs> waiting to pick up the scraps. That's, uh, you know, it's all they can do, really. They, they have had the speed. But they've put themselves in a position to be able to do that. Absolutely. Which, especially for the three car, which has really had to work hard to get back into fourth position. It's not been easy for those guys. They've, they've had their, their issues, but um, but they're still running. And uh, anything that happens to the guys in front, they are right in the, the pound seats too. So just with just under three hours to go, as Anthony just said, we've got 14.7 seconds separating first and second overall. In LMP2, we've got 23.7 seconds separating first and second. And then down in GTE M, where we see the number 33 Corvette, with Nicholas Veroni behind the wheel. We've got three cars within a minute, all on the same lap. So it's the Corvette, then the Iron Dames with Sarah Bove in second position, 23 seconds back, and then the ORT by TF Aston Martin, number 25, with uh, Ahmed Al Harti behind the wheel of that car, a minute and eight seconds back. So it looks like Michelle Gatting is going to be uh, next in on the next round of pit stops. And she will take the, the next stint. Uh, Sarah Bove has now completed all of her drive time, as has Ben Keating. So we will probably see the pro drivers in these cars the rest of the way. Ben has been formidable this race, yeah. hasn't he? Absolutely. I mean, we call him, you've heard of Super Silvers, we call him the Super Bronze. And uh, I said it after qualifying, you better watch out because he's going to be elevated to a gold if he's not careful. His uh, actually, performance has been actually, that great. Actually, I remember exactly what you said because it made me laugh out loud. He says, that gets you in instant gold territory. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, such was his performance in qualifying, but there you're only comparing bronze for bronze. Yeah. Uh, as in the GTM category, you need to qualify in the, hy in, in the hyperpole, your bronze drivers. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately for them at the time, the, uh, the car we're looking at, 85, the Iron Dame, they weren't in Hyperpole. Uh, so, yeah, Sarah Bovey still at the wheel, like you say, Jim. And uh, so that's the bronze driver in, uh, in the Iron Dame. So uh, Ben has done his time. You know, it goes without saying, of course, the, uh, the pro drivers, the, the platinums, the golds, mm. they do have a natural speed advantage sure. still over, yeah. over Ben Keating. Um, you know, I only joke when I say he's uh, gold status. He's not. You know, he's he's just a fine bronze driver, and uh, he really has made the difference though today. He's uh, not single-handedly, of course, but he's clawed back and got that car from barely even being on the on the timing page. I mean, it's bottom of the second timing page. I think it's about fighting your individual battles. So you know, it's when he's against the other bronzes. Can he win that battle against the other bronzes? Yeah, that's and, a great and, point. and he can. And, and, and I think it's the same with the golds against the other yeah. golds, or the silvers against the silvers. Let's check in with pit lane and. Uh, well, unfortunately, it's not looking good for Peugeot at this hour. Uh, the 94 is in the garage. I think you've seen that. The team are working hard on that, but they just cleared. That's the steering rack. 
apparently. Um, they've just cleared the 93 garage area. It looks like that one is coming in as well. I can't speak to the team at the moment, but when I get any more info, I'll let you know. Yeah, it'd be really interesting, wouldn't it, to find out how long that steering rack change would be. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like it can be done in, in, a, in a blink of an eye you know, at all. It sounds like pretty hefty work to me, but, uh, and, and, you know, with that, are they even considering changing the steering rack? Having said that, Michael Jensen has just said his fastest sector one. just the way they naturally wear and uh, so the longer you take them in you know three stints maybe even four stints is pretty natural to get some vibrations particularly through the front because that you feel that through the steering uh, rather than the, the seat, seat of your pants with the with the rear tires uh, you feel the the rear tires vibration uh, the vibrations a lot less than, than the front tires yes, I was I was gonna say uh, before with the camera switched to something else that one of the things also about Ben Keating, and we just saw it right there, and that's what made me remember it, is his enthusiasm is infectious. So even if the team is down, had some trouble, I'm sure he's the kind of guy that, okay, boys, we can do this, and then goes out and throws down some really fast laps, like, see, we're, we're all in this. Follow me. He's got that I'll American the gates can of hell, do my attitude. brothers, and not <laughs> abandon you. <laughs> Yeah, that American can do actually. It, you know, it is infectious. You're absolutely right. And uh, and that's what you need within a car crew. You need somebody, you know, to, it's that relationship. You need to, when you're down, you need someone else sometimes to pick you back up. And and every team member has their has their chance to, to, to do that. And uh, that's part of the joy of... Uh, of Le Mans and uh, and sports car racing in general, it's not a it's not a selfish game. It's not you're not out there alone, as, as we see now. The 93 getting pushed back in, as Louise predicted. That car going back into the garage while the steering rack they, work continues. Now some teams will tell you that a steering rack could take as much as three hours. So, so they did this earlier on. They took the bodywork off and then they were blowing cool air. So it's almost like it was getting too hot. So they're trying to cool it down. Um, when the mm. car's stationary at the end of pit lane, I've heard it myself where it makes this incredible high pitch noise. It's almost like radio interference or something. And I asked uh, I asked one of the drivers, uh, well, what's all that noise about? What, what's, is it like a, there's a motor whirring or something inside? Is it something to do with a the hybrid system, or what is it? They said, no, it's, it's to do with the power steering. Wow. That was that was a long time. I mean, that was last year. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. Monza oh, yeah. last year, I, I noticed it. Whether it still does that or not, I, I'm, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I just thought, at the, at the time, I thought that sounded odd. You can see the suspension and the uh, brakes working on that Corvette. And also the aerodynamic effect yeah. as well yeah. from all the rain and the dirt that gets spread over the bodywork. Very cool. Model makers take hours trying to perfect that, that patina when, they, when they're going to make a car that has uh, got the dirt on. Yeah, I'm sure, and that's that's one of the cool things about the model is that afterwards, if you, the winning car, it's uh, tradition mm -hmm. to just leave the dirt. All the damage, bodywork, flies, everything, yeah. yeah. The battle scars. Yeah. And, and I think Audi even lacquered the car over once. Yeah, one I heard that. So that yeah. What did they do to you, one guy? Oh, there's a story behind that. In your garage, is it? No, there's a story behind that. They actually wanted to keep it, um, as you said, with all the battle scars on, and it went to a show, um, and somebody cleaned it. You're joking. It went to a car show, and, and they went, somebody <laughs> cleaned the car. Because it's dirty. No. No. You can't. It's not like you can fake and just let's just throw some flies and some some dust on it, make it look dirty. Oh, again. Dear. So it's 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 still got the, a few bath scars, but it's uh, hasn't quite got the, the full wall paint on it. Here comes that driver change for the Iron Dames. It'll be Michelle Gadding getting in, Sarah Bove getting out. 
So yeah, like you said earlier on, Guy, it's so driver, the driver becomes driver helper in GTs. Yeah. And uh, you can see the, uh, the shoulder straps going on into place and buckled in. And then they also do the radio as well. As I've seen on the outside edge of the seat like where the, the headrest is. Quite, quite often, yeah, but you have the radio on actually into the seat because it's uh, obviously it's accessible that way, yeah. yeah. But it's interesting, the, these girls have done fantastic again all day. They've been, they've been fighting all through these 24 hours, but you just can't help but feel that the, the, the sort of balance has swung now towards the Corvette. It, it's worked its way up to the front and it, it seems to have been the the it, quicker car. It's going to take some beating. Now. Yeah, especially now that we've got uh, you know the pros in the car. I think it's going to be uh, between uh, Verona and Casberg. Very very quick two drivers. I mean, there's getting pole position, and we've all said, oh, it doesn't really mean anything in, in the morning anyway. Uh, it's just a little bit of showboating. But uh, when you see the margin that Ben Keating took pole by, well over a second, you think, okay. If they can have a reliable car, surely when he's in the car, like you said, guys, when it's bronze for bronze, yeah, he's, that he's got the advantage. He's got a massive advantage. Yeah. I think that's what he's had around here. And usually, they're fairly evenly matched. We've seen that with uh, Sorobobi all year long, actually, in, in qualifying in the World Endurance Championship, the first three rounds we've had. There, it's always comes down to those, pretty much down to those two in quality. And it's separated by a few tenths and, and the race. They, in WEC, they have to start the race as well, Bronze drivers. So, uh, and it's always a bit of a showdown between those two. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it seems like Ben's just had the advantage the whole time. And the other thing that was interesting about Hyperpole was he had the, the pole sewn up and went back out and just, you know, hold my beer. I can beat that. And, and basically did. I mean, not just being thrashed, yeah, yeah, yeah. annihilated his own lap time. So, yeah, look, the car is clearly hooked up, but uh, bad luck certainly struck them at the start of this race. But my goodness, since then, they have more than taken the fight to the rest of the field. And now, head them with, uh, what have they got? Uh, about a minute lead, yeah. yeah. 13 seconds. Wow. Yeah, into Europe, again, doing a great job. 21 seconds ahead of the uh, WRT car. So, uh, yeah, just maintaining that lead. As you say, that's kind of how, that's pretty much level out. That's pretty much staying constant. So is the 17 second margin between Collado and Harvey. Front. That, for, since we've been talking about the GTs and other categories and Peugeot's problems, it was 17 seconds, it still is. It's kind of it's kind of like half a second a lap, just just chipping away, just adding a little bit each time, just that little bit quicker and gradually building that lead up. So I think um, Harley will be keen to uh, get these tyres off and get some new tyres on and see what pace he's got to go about trying to uh, close that gap down to uh, Collado. How does uh, Ferrari answer at this point if they do start to show some speed with those new tyres? just stick to their uh, entire strategy? I think at this stage they've got to stick to the, 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 the plan. Um, uh, it really depends if, if uh, Harley comes back with with some real pace and it's a concern with the speed which is catching, then they will have to go with tyres or be a bit more aggressive. But I can't help but think that they've still got that advantage. Um, even with with the older tyres, they seem to still seem to have the pace. So, yeah. um, it does it so the start of the race, you know, obviously not as much rubber down as there is now. Uh, slightly different wind condition. Cars in a bit of a different state. They've taken a, a bit of a beating, yeah. all of them out there. But uh, the Toyota more than held its own at the start of the race when we were in the hottest conditions. We're now back into the hottest conditions at uh, quarter past or 20 past one in the afternoon here. So hotter conditions, the sun's actually out. It's probably warmer now than it was at the start of the race, actually. And I feel like that's where the Toyota's at its best. Yeah. Um, now they're on the medium tyres, and yeah, I, you would naturally expect the Ferrari on fresher tyres to be edge yeah. away. Is, is, there any, is there any advantage, and I, and I certainly wouldn't expect them to do this with two hours and 40 minutes to go, but on the last stint, if they're close, you know, if they're if they're almost the single digits, maybe they're they're only 11 seconds back or something like that. Is it worth throwing a set of softs on and trying to uh, get it, or is it is it a misnomer that the softs are going to get you more speed, even if they don't last as long? 
So the softs, I mean, it's more complex than that. The softs yeah. are, it's not necessarily just soft, medium and hard in terms of compound. It's, uh, th there's, there's heat element yeah. to it as well. So you can have a soft, higher temperature tyre or a soft, lower temperature tyre. We've got a team radio here from Harbour first. Copy. Okay, Brendan, box this lap, pit confirm, box this lap, pit confirm. Vibrations are not a concern from the number side. So the team they can see. Playing. Yeah, exactly. So he, look, the driver has to relay the information. Obviously, he's concerned sure. that it might be damaging the car. So right. the no driver course. can yeah. take a, you know, quite a bit yeah, of yeah. vibration through the body and the hands, whatever. But he's more concerned for the car. And yeah, they're still right. two hours. Why is this doing? Yeah. I don't want this thing to shake itself to bits. So I relay the information. You look where you need to on the data. They have the load cells through the suspension, and they can see and report back to the driver. Don't worry. It looks good. We can take a certain amount of frequency, and it's well within that at the moment. Gotcha. So chill out. It's cool. Just carry on driving as fast as you can. But. We'll, if it's hindering lap times, we'll bring you in, we'll get you on another set. You know, when, it, when the time comes, which I think we can't see the energy levels uh, at the moment, but uh, I assume they're getting to a point where... Yeah, they're totally the box is lap. Yeah, so, so, so they'll, yeah. they'll change the tyres, and I suspect they'll keep him in the car. That's the, that seems to be the plan. But I didn't know whether it was because of the energy level, like the fuel load, the fuel level at the point, or because of the vibration. Uh, yeah. I, that's the thing I, I, yeah, I, I, I need to okay. confirm. So I assume it's their energy levels. Um, so yeah, he'll get on a, on a different set and he'll he'll be he'll be fine. But um, so oh, yeah, were, uh, it's, uh, Louise confirms from the pits that it's mediums uh, that will be going on the number eight car as uh, Hartley comes in. We saw the three car come in and make their pit stop. No driver change there. So Brendan Hartley will stay in. The fuel goes in. Going to take a, a tear off off the uh, windscreen. Saw them. Reaching up there, you can see just above the wheel well, those little white tabs just going off the top of your screen there. That's where they reach around and pull off one of the tear-offs. 12 per windscreen. And the windscreens come to the track with those are So the tear-off uh, request has been answered. He wanted a towel and some water. Ah, energy gel. He took some energy gel as well. Yeah, that's... That stuff's... It, well, that stuff's magic. That's that better living. Well, I, I had a story about AJ, AJ Foyt the Daytona 24 hours, and he came in, he asked for a, a burger and a, and a Coke, and he came in and he literally had a swig of Coke, went, left the pit lane with a burger in his hand, and apparently when he came in the end of his, his stint, he's like mustard all down his white overalls. Some ketchup. <laughs> you think he's kidding? No, I don't, no, I don't think it's a joke. I mean, yeah. you can imagine. You know, I'm, I'm surprised if it had a wrapper, if the last thing that didn't come out of the car before the door went down was the wrapper. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Very different. I mean, that's the only thing missing from that uh, NASCAR car entry. Okay, Brendan, new set of mediums, new set of mediums on the car. Go get them. That's the message you want. Em. Yeah, exactly. A minute and 41 seconds down at this point, but obviously the, that will change drastically when the 51 car, James Collado, has to come in for his pit stop. So this is the this is the that classic racing, the, the, the in lap, the out lap, you know? This is this that, is tough. Uh, yeah, this, this is, is tough. Like, especially this time of, of the race. Absolutely, you know, Jim, 22, yeah. 21 and a half hours in, yeah. It's hot out there, you're sweating, you feel it running down your face inside the helmet, yeah. You're so tired, you're drained, you're nothing left. But somewhere within you, you have to dig even deeper in these moments to try and find that lap time that you know the car can do. But it, it, probably the only better radio transmission you're going to get from your engineer is that you're the winner. Then go get him. In this day and age of, oh, we need to save fuel, or we need to conserve this, or don't do that, easy on this, no, go get him. It's a head game. Yeah. You know, you've got yes. two cars very evenly matched in performance, very evenly matched, and you've got two drivers very evenly matched. It's, it comes down to a head game. Box this lap, box this lap, driver change. Uh, uh, driver ch so driver change, Colado will come out. Interesting, uh, two American voices as lead engineers on, on these cars.
Yeah, he's uh, he's been a bit of a revelation this year to us uh, in the World Endurance yeah. Championship. Justin Taylor, the uh, yeah, Car 51's engineer. He's come out with some quality quotes. Is he former Audi? Was he an Audi, I think, before? I believe he yes, was. Yes, he was. Then yeah. he was doing IndyCar yes. as well. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. And he was, uh, he, he was kind of an understudy to... Um, embarrassed. Here's some more radio. Radio, drinks tube, radio. A slice of pizza. So, yeah. <laughs> so wow. I mean, it, you, you get reminded, obviously, when you come down the pit lane to detach the radio uh, and uh, remember your belts as well, because uh, when your car stops, you need to loosen them before you unbuckle so that the next driver getting in isn't compromised with the seatbelt still in the, the tight position because the driver helper won't be able to buckle them in. So, uh, yeah, all those things can really... Uh, Hold you back, and you see there, Pierre Guidi, uh, sorry, uh, Giovinazzi in, and he's pulling down on the shoulder straps, right. getting himself comfortable, making sure they're on the hands device in the right way. Yep. You don't want them slipping underneath the hands device or twisting in any way. Um, you don't want anything to, to compromise your uh, your focus. And with the Ferrari bit at the, the beginning of the pit lane, it gives you the option to be able to tighten your belts while you go down the pit lane, you can tighten them up. Brendan reporting that the car feels much better with these tires, so maybe that spotted him or something like that. Uh, the, the name I was trying to get, uh, the guy helped me get, Brad Kettler. That's he, it. Was, he was an understudy of Brad Kettler at Audi. Yep, yep. champion racing. That's back right. In the day. Yep. So, yeah, you asked me earlier on, Jim Ballard, you know, why wouldn't you put the set of soft tyres? So, Brendan is obviously he's on the mediums, uh, as is uh, Joe Bonazzi. And uh, the reason for that is it's a high-speed circuit. I mean, there's only one or two uh, relatively slow point. corners. Uh, Arnage and Molsan, so on a high-speed circuit, you get a lot of uh, movement within the shoulder of the tyre. The softer tyre, in its construction by nature, flexes around a lot more, and it spooks the driver. It's it, part it, of what makes it softer. Exactly. That, yeah. It's just basically more squidgy. So that's why they put it on in the, the wet, damp conditions. It's your best chance of survival in those in those lower temperatures, gotcha. and because you then you need the pliable nature of the tire to be there. Yeah, and, and it heats itself up a bit like a squash ball. You know, you yeah, whack yeah. it against the wall and it heats up physically. It heats up through the kinetic energy, and that's what the tires are doing. Uh, but the hotter it gets, ambient and track, and the faster you can go, and the less moisture on the track there is, you can then afford to start running a stiffer construction tire, the medium right. or a stiffer a stiffer compound. That gives you more of a platform, so when you're in the corner, in the Porsche corners, the tyre is a little bit stiffer, the shoulder of the tyre is a little bit more solid. So you can feel, effectively, it's almost like feeling the grip, because when the tyre is moving, it, that's when the car feels like it's squirming around, and it doesn't feel like it's taking a set. It, it, it makes your contact better. It does. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but after, the, after the exchange of pit stops, it's now 16 seconds, so... Brendan Hartley's outlaps and his uh, time on those new tires. Let's see how Giovinazzi can respond as he can, is about halfway through his outlap. I can't, Jim. Let's dramatize this bit. It's 15.8 seconds. Come on, let's get into the driver's heads here. 50, no, forget it. Let's just call it 15 seconds. <laughs> Brendan, yeah, you're 15 I, I seconds to, behind. I used to tell our announcers in the United States, and somebody says, well, that's, a, you know, they pretty much got this in the bag. It'd be like, well, that loud click you heard was everybody turning off and they go to watch something else. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Not in this case. Nobody will be going anywhere. This is going to be right down two and a half hours remaining in the centenary celebration of Le Mans, the 91st running, the 100th anniversary, 1923 was the first time that they got together to try and prove the automobile and prove that the innovations and the technology was safe and that the car was, the car of automobile was going to be reliable. Well, we're doing the same thing today. It's all about innovation. A hundred years later, the first fully subscribed year for the hypercar here at Lasarth, and they have delivered. They have delivered. The uh, front of the field boasts Ferrari, Toyota, two Cadillacs, a Porsche, 
two Glickenhauses, a Ferrari, and a Peugeot, all in the top nine. So uh, absolutely stellar first first time out here at Le Mans for a full hypercar field. Not the, not the first time for hypercars, but uh, to clarify, a full time for the hypercar field. Yeah, literally all of the major manufacturers, Ferrari, Toyota, Cadillac, Porsche, uh, Peugeot, have all had a, a, a chance to lead this race. Mm -hmm. That's something I didn't think we would see. Honestly speaking, yeah, yeah. This, in this event, uh, the centenary, I didn't think, based on what we've seen so far in the World Endurance Championship, you, you wouldn't have put money on the fact of that happening. So I, I, I joked earlier on when I said that the first two hours of the race, I thought, I can't. I don't think I can keep up doing this for 24 hours. <laughs> like, it was like a sprint race. It was changing positions all the, all the way through. 33 car out of the lead of GTM. Driver change, Nicholas Brody out, Nicky Katzberg in. And they show you how it's done, don't they? Yeah. The Corvette garage crew. They really show you how it's done. This year it's a combination of not only the Pratt & Miller guys, but some of the Labra competition guys many years the European answer to Pratt and Miller in the United States with the Corvette when it was the, the C6 models, uh, but the C8 here is the C8R is being run by a combination this year. So Romain Dumas in the Glickenhaus has just done a 329.5, so it's a pretty impressive lap time, you know, not, not a million miles away from, from the uh, the rest of the hypercar, so, you know, well done to those guys. And that guy doesn't give up. I don't care if he's racing here in the Clicking House or he's in a Galaxy 300 at Goodwood Revival. He does not give up. And there you see handshakes all around for uh, Nicholas Brody. That's a great feeling, you know, yeah. you get out of the car and the whole crew is high-fiving you. I suspect he's done. Well, they done, but also, you know, that's a job well done. Yeah. But, um, you know, there's, there's no better feeling than that. And, you know, it's, that's, it's, that marks the difference, really, for me, with, and, and highlights exactly what sports car racing is all about. That real family feeling with the team. You can share that emotion with your other teammates as well, and success is, is trebled in that way, yeah. And it all, as we said before, it goes back to the attitude of the, of the team leader. But not only that, that is the, you know, you used to see the same thing when it was uh, the full factory effort. You know, Dan Binks and, 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 and the guys in, in the Corvette squad, that was the kind of reception that the drivers would get after a job well done. There's our, our LMP2 leader, the Inter-Europol uh, competition entry, number 34. Albert Costa behind the wheel of that car. They have uh, had a running uh, race with the team WRT. Robert Cooper's at number 41 for, gosh, at least the last uh, eight hours or so. There have been others that have tried to come up and challenge. Uh, Paul Chatan now is in third place in the number 48 car for the uh, EDEC Sport. And the other team that's been been right there in the hunt for the podium has been Neil Yanni and the Duquesne team number 30. But everybody's been chasing 34 and 41 for for the last little bit. And it continues on with just under two and a half hours remaining. I wonder if they'll ever change their car back to that luminous yellow and green concept that they had the whole time. Like more like their, their garage hoardings, actually. Yes, yeah. That's the color that well, they that, have well, been running. But that's the color of the other car. Remember, they started two cars in this race. Yeah, uh, but usually the solid colored car, the, the it, white is, car, is yeah. the luminous yellow. And uh, I always felt like it really clashed. And I do prefer this. Tell you what, if they win this thing, they're never going back on those colors. <laughs> <laughs> that's the difference right there, surely. I think the only people in, in the sports world who are more superstitious than race car people NHL hockey. Hockey really. Oh yeah. You make the playoffs, you're not allowed to shave until you get until you get knocked out of the playoffs. All these guys look like lumberjacks by by the end of the playoffs. So they don't wear the same set of socks until they, they fall apart. I mean it's it's yeah. insane. The car's gonna grow a beard and they're never gonna uh, change back from that uh, golden golden yellow colour. Still two hours twenty-five minutes to go though. The, uh, the competition, the number 
41 WRT. Behind his sister car, actually, 31. And is in. Where? This is. What is fifth? Fifth, yeah. Not fifth. that far off the hunt. Wow. Alvin Freund's. There's the, uh, the Jonas squad. They had such high hopes at one point, they were leading overall and they were leading LMP2. And what an accomplishment that would have been. But it's going to be an accomplishment just to get these two cars to the finish line as they have the, those crew guys. They're going to they're going to deserve their uh, their post race adult beverages after this one because they sure have earned it. Yeah. And at the front, the Ferrari uh, and the Toyota, the gap now is 15 seconds. It's pretty much kind of been 15 seconds for well, since they did the pit stops, it's maybe gone down to sort of 13, 14, and back to 15. So Hart is not really making any inroads into Giovinazzi's lead at the minute. It doesn't seem to be. Uh, yeah, last lap went from 3.28. Yeah, high 28 for Brendan. And slightly lower 28 for Giovinazzi. And it's really, you're in the hands of the traffic, I, I feel, that the two cars are so evenly matched on pace at this point in the race that... Uh, you can have, as we often said as drivers, you can have the golden stint, where every car you come up, you just start taking a straight line. Yeah, <laughs> and you get the slipstream off them as well for good yeah, measure. Thank you, you. You come in and you go, oh, honestly, I had the golden stint. I always used to joke with uh, Boimi about it, and he, him too. Uh, you won't believe it, man. I had the golden stint. <laughs> <laughs> OK, OK, so don't worry about the fast lap time, do you? It's, it's not me, it was the traffic. Yeah, and then there's a stint right. where traffic just oh, appears from nowhere. Yeah. Just, every time. Yeah. Every where do you always be straight? They're in the way. Yeah. That's what you pray for when you're inside the car. You, you, you're constantly thinking, OK, right, I've, I've overtaken another car here. That was a good one. Oh, I've overtaken the car. Mm, that's a semi-bad one there, but I wonder what the other car in front's <laughs> going through. Hopefully they're having it worse than I am. Like the battle at the front that has kind of settled out at 15 seconds. This battle here in LMP2 has settled out at 22 seconds. There you see the, uh, the Lodge livery. It's amazing when you're in traffic how you become a mind reader. Because you're always thinking, what are they thinking? Yeah. I, I always try to put yourself in the car ahead's position and what are they thinking? What are they going to do? Because you're trying to second guess all the time. What, what are they going to do? And I'm going to do the opposite. And you're constantly hearing. If you're yes. Giovinazzi, you're hearing Hartley behind 14.5 seconds. And Hartley will be hearing the, the, the opposite of that. Yeah. And uh, how much further ahead the car is. And, and you're just you're trying to assess, you know, OK, right, they've just... I've caught the gap a little bit there, but I was a bit lucky in traffic. So maybe that's because they were a little bit more unlucky than me that time around. And then you hear the next lap, and the gap creeps up a little bit. You go, no, OK. It's, and my traffic wasn't so bad, that means that it, yeah, they're, they're, it was traffic that happened before for him. Oh, no, I'm not quite as fast compared to him as I thought I was. And you're constantly going through that thought process. This is our third place car in LMP2. You may recognize the badge on the nose of that car, Delage, if you're a student of history here at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, that is a nameplate that dates all the way back to the beginnings of the French motor industry and the early days of this great race in the, in the 20s and 30s. Here's your fourth place car in the class, the Team Duquesne car with Neil Yanni behind the wheel. Understand Neil is going to be moving on from this ride to the uh, Proton Porsche, which is a uh, great opportunity for him to get back inside the, uh, get back in a Porsche. Uh, I'm sure he'll bring a lot of experience to that team. A lot of prototype experience. Yeah, an awful lot of prototype experience. And the, uh, the number 30 car there, as you say, Jim Duquesne. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Matthias Kaiser has had a, a bit of a shortish stint in the uh, Vector Sport number 10. And it's now uh, Gabby Aubrey behind the wheel of that car. And he's in now, apparently, until the end of the race. I think with Neil Yarni, ex-Port Porsche factory driver, the links that he has with Porsche will help. Um, 
smooth the way with the Proton team and that kind of development well, yeah, path. I, I think I think they, uh, Proton themselves, as, as you well know, have great links to Porsche themselves. But what he, I think, will add to that is the prototype knowledge. And also, um, I saw that uh, Proton are going to be the, the first customer of the Ford GT3 for the Mustang. So, really? Yep. So they're going to be running the, the... So they could potentially have the, the Porsche in the hypercar and the Mustang in the GT3. GT3. Wow. Do you think we'll see a Ford hypercar if we're going to see a Ford GT3 car? Here comes the 93 back out. 3 back out. Much faster change than we, uh, than we feared. Yeah. Now, is that the one that had, had the steering wheel? Yeah, it, it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. So out they go. Great. Good team effort there by Pojo. They both had enough problems. They're starting to get them confused. <laughs> yeah, that's probably not what the team notes. were going for this, this <laughs> race. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Sorry, I, did, you. I did fear, though, and uh, yeah, I'm sure the team felt the same, that they've been riddled with lots of different reliability problems so far this year. And, well, since they come back to sports car racing, frontline sports car racing. And, uh, so yeah, we, I didn't expect them to, to to be quite as reliable in many ways as they've been, let alone the pace that they've had. So there is uh, Gabby Aubrey that I spoke about earlier on in the number yeah. 10 Vector Sport, gets lapped by the number 50 Ferrari with uh, Nick Nielsen, who started this race. Of course, last year in the AF Corsa, Sean had a, an early poor position, made a real name for himself, and uh, here he is now. Now, we just uh, a few minutes ago had a very interesting discussion, that I thought was a great explanation from you, Anthony and, and Guy, about about the soft tire. And then we see the, the LMP2 car, the graphic came up and showed that they were, as we see, the uh, the Camaro, the number 24 car, having some work done. Uh, looks like uh, looks like that's almost exploratory. Like they're trying to figure out what might be going on, as opposed to trying to fix what they know is going on. I but wonder why it dropped down the yeah. order now in uh, 39th as it sits in the pits, getting lapped. Uh, a gearbox is what we're hearing. A gearbox issue. So that would be that makes that you know that's that's going to be stressed on that car. But my point. Apart, sorry, sorry, Jim. But while we're still on the on, yeah, on that yeah. car. Just a question uh, for all the fans that don't follow NASCAR. How, so obviously the ovals, you're not, you're not really changing gear that much, but what about street, how long is a street course race for, for those competitors? Um, normally a couple hundred kilometers. Like an hour, an hour? Kind oh of no, more than that. More than an hour? Two yeah. and a half hours. Oh, okay. Yeah. So like the length of a, a, a Grand Prix or something. Long, a little bit longer. A little, a little bit, longer. bit longer than a Grand Prix. But no way as long no, as it's just no, done. No, so no. it's quite a good proving ground yes. for it then to come here. But oh, yeah. Than that, yeah. Than the oh, yeah. This, in, in 24 hours, this thing has probably lasted eight cup races. Right. So, you know. And how long would they usually keep the gearbox in? Do they have restrictions on that in the, no. in the series? No. no. Okay. It's just why whatever your maintenance plan is. Okay. I'm sure a new one comes at every event. But like you say, I mean, on an oval, depending on the on the oval, certainly on the super speedways, they're, they're very seldom shifting. But on yeah. the mile and a half, there's a lot of times you'll shift. Certainly on the short tracks, there's, there's a little bit more shift. But like you say, not, not like it is here. So Brendan Hartley now has just done the fastest lap of the number eight on a 337, uh, sorry, 327.8. And the gap's now down to 11.8. So Whoa. he's starting to to chip away now at that lead mm -hmm. and uh, make some inroads. We've got a race in our hands. Yeah, here we go. Two hours and 16 minutes to go. Just to put a, a finish what I, the, what I was trying to say, we saw the graphic come up of the LMP2 car with hard tires on. Now, what we need to point out is, is that they are not Michelins. They are Goodyear. So Goodyear comes at this from a completely different standpoint. It's a controlled tire. So they really just have kind of a soft and a hard they don't have a. They don't have that medium option. Yeah, exactly, Jim. So you know, controlled tire, like you say, you can you could go out and buy those tires if you're racing. Yeah, you can buy them. You can keep them. Um, you know, the technology is still very high, but it's uh, you know, there's no tire wall in uh, in LMP2. 
is so, you know, part of the reason that you know, defense, it, yeah exactly is to keep costs down um, you know it is a uh, they have the monopoly there uh, as a time manufacturer you know in many ways for good reason because it, it's, a, it's a privateer category it should be a privateer category with amateur drivers paying their way to go racing and uh, so it makes a lot of sense you just have the one slick tire the one wet tire and uh, you know, they, they brand it as a as a hard tire it's, you know, it's a nice bit of marketing as well and sure. you know, it's, it's, it's great for them uh, that they have LMP2 as, as their category and uh, it's great to have a good year involved of course for, for the World Endurance Championship but the tyres that you see on this car yeah the rain Michelin's you can't go and buy those no. tyres there's a lot of tech in there and uh, you know and, and if one comes apart the engineers are out there looking for Oh, yeah. Afterwards, these things, things. Yeah, they're actually, actually they're all going to get missing. Technically, they're a confidential tire, so yes, yeah. you know, they actually the, the teams have to sign a contract. Yes, to basically say that they will not Almost every like time FDA. Yeah, the tire has to be returned because they've got all their tech and their IP in that tire, oh, yeah. and the last thing they want is that to go to another manufacturer. Yeah. So, yeah. proprietary information. Now, here we go. Uh, we talked earlier. Uh, I asked kind of. Maybe it was a silly question. How much it bothered you when the car that was a couple laps down behind you harassing you? Well, now the tables are turned. The 50 car is now ahead of the 8 car. The 8 car is catching the 50 car. How wide is this for a suddenly? About as wide as the um, the circuit. <laughs> as wide as as wide as the uh, the blue flags will allow. Uh, yeah. that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, you gotta you gotta be careful. But uh, yeah, you Wonder can if... make life a little bit difficult. Get this down the next driver. Be careful if you put too much brake pressure and force it to lock the brake. Just have to be careful about the ventilation. Otherwise, you lock the rear brake if you push the pedal too hard. Great information. Great information. Uh, Brendan referring to turn 14. Yeah. Uh, I believe, unless they've changed things since I was there, turn 14 for them. Unlike our turn 20, it is the most open corner. Okay. It, where he had the rear locking, so yeah. it makes sense to me. So that, that's, you know, every, te every team I've ever driven for has their own uh, oh, references oh. for which corner numbers or names they give around here. So, uh, yeah, we, we go by the, uh, the ACO and FIA's uh, version of the track. So for us, it's turn 20. But that's very interesting to me as a, as a layman that, you know, tell the next driver. Be careful of brake modulation, and that's that's the that's the kind of things you might talk about. Uh, those are the things you might talk about uh, on an old driver exchange. Well, but it, now it it's might be, be done over the radio. It might be that you know we've seen before that under braking, the car's maybe stepped out as you braked into Mulsanne Corner, and he's just basically warning the next guy that this might catch you out. The last thing he wants to do is not warn him and. Uh, the next driver has an issue. Let's hear from uh, Nick Nielsen. Oh, that Toyota is coming behind. We'd like to stay in front. And they will ask for blue flag soon, so let's push as much as you can for those last uh, three laps. And we stay in front of that Toyota. Let's give it all. So there's your answer. Yeah, I mean, stay in front, but within reason. Within the allowance of what the blue flags yeah. which is much different stay in front is a much different command than don't let him buy exactly and uh, you know there, there's no it's not like a single seater racing where you've right. got huge wings uh, that get affected from even this far back the right car uh, you can get a lot more, a lot closer than that uh, as this now switches to the car 51 with Giovinazzi not to be confused with the uh, Number 50 cars further down the road. Oh, no. 11 seconds down the road. Oh. Nicholas Nielsen behind the wheel of the 50. So out on the racetrack right now, we've got Antonio Giovinazzi leading in the 51. Brendan Hartley trying to chase him down 11 seconds back. And then in the Cadillacs, Richard Westbrook is in the two car. Ranger Van de Zanda is in the, the three car. That's one of my favorite things. Christoph Bouchou and Renger Van de Zanda. Doesn't get much better than that. Frank Makaviki is uh, in the number five car. Romain Dumas is in the 708. 709 is Nathaniel Breton and Mikael Jensen 
is in the number 93 Peugeot. And when you said about the, the maps, the circuit maps, um, quite often, well, most of the time, actually, the team will print out a little map and they'll put it inside the car, whether it be on the steering wheel or on. And then whenever I've had it where people have sat in the car, they've, they've seen this little map of the circuit, say Le Mans, for argument's sake. And then we said, why have you got a map? Do you, do you not know where you're going? Do you not know where, where the circuit goes? And basically, it, it's for that very reason, because when you're discussing the, 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 the circuit to the engineers, they may, it's, it's to make sure that we're all calling the corners the same. So if they say it's turn 10, I look on the map and I know what, where yeah. they make. Or if I've got an issue and the car stopped, they know where, we're we all on the, talking from the same uh, page. Yes, it's more so for, you know, when you're in the garage and you're doing the debriefs between free practice session or during a free practice session when you're back in the garage. Yeah. You can even point if you need to. Yeah. yeah, and the engineer's got the, you know, got the circuit map usually just passed on their laptop somewhere. And, uh, so yeah, you're, you're referring to the same corners but yeah the reason you have it in the car for the race is like say guy if you've had a mechanical failure like we saw with uh, Kobayashi due to that is still I can't believe he's out of the race for what happened for those of you that missed it in yeah the, uh, the dead of the night uh, there was a slow zone a next slow zone on the run-up towards Tete Rouge and uh, he was about to overtake a slow moving AM driver in the, uh, in the LMP2 car so it's after this sequence of corners here, the S's on the straight towards uh, Tetra Rouge. Kobayashi goes to overtake the LMP2, realizes he's, a, he's in a next slow. At this point here, slams on the brakes. Two racy LMP2 cars come up behind him, one from Guido van der Garda in the 39 car. And there was an unfortunate GT Ferrari that was in the number 66. He got completely he smashed into the back from he van der Garda. Yeah. Sent the car flying, the Ferrari as a result, smashed into Kobayashi. Then the Alpine on the right-hand side smashed into Kobayashi as well. Car out of the race. Yeah. It wasn't Camus. He did exactly yeah. what he, he was played supposed to do. Exactly what he was supposed to do. Set as you can map. see, there's the map. <laughs> so when Kobayashi did pull over, he would have been looking at the map, yeah. and uh, the team would have had their map, and they would have been saying, hey, if you can get to such and such corner or such and such barrier near such and such, then you can get into a recovery yeah. position, try this with the car, try that with the car, but the car just didn't respond. It was uh, the red lights came on, the telltale sign that uh, there was a serious hybrid issue and had to be taken away on the, on the low loader and dropped off in Area 51, as they call it. There's United 23 of Top Longquist working his way back up the field after uh, some problems earlier in the race, but doing a great job. the United car with Stephanie down in the pits. Well, I'm in the garage with that 22 car at the minute. Um, it was in the garage a little bit earlier on for uh, some quite a bit of damage repairs. It's, got, it's getting a new front wing right now. Let me just move out of the way. Uh, but that car went out for one lap and has come back in. So clearly whatever fixes they have done have not worked sufficiently. Driver in the car shaking his head. Don't know how long this is going to be. Any time at this point is going to be uh, disappointing for those guys. Philippe Albuquerque is the one who was being when they brought the car in. There is the Alpine number uh, 36. You said Goodyear is going to go on that car. Phil Hansen, Frederick Blumen, and Philippe Albuquerque sharing that number 22 car. It looks like. Uh, they may be ready to come back out. Indeed, they are. And they'll wheel the car out, drop it down on the dollies, fire her up, put some new Goodyear rubber on that car, and send it on its way. Let's go down to uh, Stephanie. Uh, just on that, it seems that they've changed the front wing back to the one that they came in to replace. There is a little bit of superficial damage at the front of it, uh, but it doesn't look too structurally uh, unstable so they've put that wing back on after going out and doing one lap on the replaced wing. So it looks like Brendan Harley now is uh, closing in even further. He's got to try and get by the 50. He hasn't gotten by him yet. He's apparently reportedly on the radio asking for the blue flags. Yeah, there he is. Uh, I'd like to see another shot. Uh, 
can't wait to see that when it comes. But uh, yes, clearly he's uh, flat, catching up now. He's just dipped inside the 10 second bracket. 9.96 seconds behind. 9.871 has just changed. <laughs> and he's fast as well. down. And he's, yeah, he's properly got the bit between. He needs this little bit of uh, aggro, I feel. Yes. Yeah. Like something yeah, to wake yeah, him yeah. up. And although, you know, he's doing a brilliant job anyway, but this is the fire that he needs to uh, fuel him on in his bid to try and catch Giovinazzi. And that's only two tenths of a second off the fastest lap of the race by the Ferrari of Nielsen. So, you know, the, they're finding some pace in the late stages here. They've really kind of, uh, as you say, got the bit between the teeth and the fight is on. Definitely seems so. Uh, I wonder which drivers they have left uh, to cycle through. I think it's going to be Rio Hirakawa in the car next, but uh, you never know if, if the team feel like Seb is the one to uh, bring it home and take this fight to Ferrari, then, then uh, you can always adjust your plans. You I do think... whatever it takes, basically. I think this is Hartley's fourth stint now in the car, I believe, so he's doing a great job. Yes, it is. Remember, they came on and asked him if he could uh, physically do it, and he says, I sure can. Now he is, and here we go. Yeah, you need, you start needing blue flags now. At this point. Yeah. They're where he was before. Uh, he wasn't getting affected by the dirty, but you are now. So I think for a fair fight, I think the stewards have to do the right thing. The race yeah. director. Yeah, he is close to, enough now. He has to back out of it. I suspect the 50 car should be in either this lap or the next lap. Um, you could have a little slow lap, a slow, slow ride through the Porsche curves. Yeah, you, you just want to see a fair fight, and uh, you know that it's not his race. It's um... here we go. Let's hear what Brendan thinks about this situation. Yeah, copy. The car ahead will box this lap normally. The car ahead will box this lap even if he doesn't get out of the way. Well, there you go. And I don't think it's going to, uh, as they go around the number 33 car with uh, Nicky Katzberg behind the wheel. Imagine the penalties that would be coming, uh, be coming car 50s where Nick Nielsen's way in uh, yeah. Formula One. Right now, <laughs> imagine doing oh, yeah, this yeah, in yeah. an F1 race oh, with yeah. a lapsed car and the blue flags. Yeah. It's one thing in. Uh, Straight me as a driver and be like, oh, you know, the blue flag's there. The blue flag needs to get out of the way of the, the lapping car. Well, but I, I also think, and this is just my personal opinion, I think some of the blue flag stuff in Formula One, while it's necessary for some of the cars, I think some of it's a little over. You know, it, why should you have to roll over and play dead? You know, especially if you're in a battle with somebody else. No, you know, I mean, this is a classic case. He's not in a battle with anybody else. Oh, no, but if you're, if you're in a battle with somebody else, why should you have to roll over and play dead because Lewis is coming through? But no, they, they, yeah. Oh, you mean if, you, if you're a battling car with somebody else? Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. The problem is, the problem is, Jim, is that it's, it's all to do with the aerodynamics. Oh, well, I understand. It's just all to do with it. And, and just because you can't see the effect you, oh, yeah. on the outside doesn't mean that it's not there. It is this invisible barrier, and it's you know you, you start hemorrhaging downforce when you get even you know within three seconds of the car in front. Uh, you, you can't believe how it feels. So uh, I think that's why you know they are there. The you engineers get involved and they're overly vocal and you yeah, know they're sure. trying to yeah, make yeah. a point about it. But yeah, there, there's there's a time and place definitely. But most of the time. I think I stand by it. I think that it's, you know, you want it to be as pure as possible and, and as fair as possible. You and I need to have a bottle of wine sometime and get it. I don't disagree with you, but I, 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 think, I think it's a little too nuanced. Entertainment wise, yeah. yeah, you know, let them fight. Well, and I don't but even think it's entertainment wise. I think it's more, uh, again, if you're, if you're battling for that last uh, points paying position, that's, that's important to you. Absolutely. It's, as, it's as a team, skill. monetarily, and, and everything else. But part of the that's not why we're here to talk about Formula One. <laughs> we're here to talk about the the uh, race at hand, which is Brendan Hartley now less than 10 seconds yeah, behind both. our race leader at, in, in the American vernacular of what we call stick and ball sports, uh, which is anything but car racing. When you can 
get that if you're trying to come from behind. If you can get the, uh, the, the number of points you're behind into single digits, it's, it's very much, yeah, it's, it's very much uh, a mind game and it encourages, there you go. And there he is. Yeah, how far out is he? I can't see him. Well, now he can see him. How do you keep the red mist from coming in when you can see him? Yeah, is it a red car or is it a red mist? <laughs> And the two front cars in the, in the 27s, they are really, the pace is really hot. Almost matching the fastest laps of the, of the race. Oh yeah, Joe Bonazzi, Joe Bonazzi is not hanging around. No. He, he's, not, he's not lifted off, trying to save fuel, trying to save tires, trying to save the car. He's, he is uh, doing his best. We are now under two hours, under two hours to the end of this race. And it is all to play for still for just nine seconds separating our leaders in the overall category, the hypercar category in LMP2. 27 seconds separates our leaders. And we still have in GTM five cars all on the lead lap. Now the Corvette has a substantial lead of a minute and 19 seconds, but any sort of issue on the racetrack, that lead will evaporate and that will open the door for the Dames, who are in second place, and or the number 25, Aston Martin, who is in third. So with two hours to go, there's a look at the full running order. There you see that uh, GTM battle down in 27th position. Looks it, like the um, Garage 56 car is back on track again. Yes, they've gone, they've gone back out and some transmission issues. We've had uh, 20 cars retire from the race, which is probably a little bit more than, than if I had been forced to pick a number before the race. I don't think I, I would have picked 20. Uh, although with, with 62 entries, uh, th th that's not, uh, doesn't seem to me to be an overly large number. Uh, but I didn't think we'd see 20 retirements. Yeah, I'll There's Charles that. Leclerc. Charles, uh, hey. If you want to win this race, uh, I'm feeling pretty fresh right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, uh, yeah. I'm kind of light I, I as well. I got my helmet and boots out of the truck. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty lean and light. Yeah, it's uh, a bit of an advantage. Which, for those of you who don't know, the, the car has its weight with it in uh, in, in uh, hypercar yep. at uh, 1,030 kilogram minimum weight. It can be higher than that, with the, obviously with the BOP adjustments, but that's the minimum weight target for all the cars. So you can't be under that, but uh, the driver is just on top of whatever that weight is. Oh, really? Ah, so a guy like me would be out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> you get to the bar first, though, so it all goes where it comes around. Okay, Brendan, box this lap, pick, confirm, box this lap, change driver to duo. Uh, All right. Well, that's nice that you got uh, Seb there with Rio, helping him out, even getting ready, and uh, Sean's giving him every bit of advice that you can give him. Sure, Rio doesn't need it, but nice to see that uh, support that team to the yeah. car as well. Himself in a bit of traffic here, he's completely boxed in. Uh, you just wave a goodbye to speed on the straight. It's the worst situation. You've got the GT there and the LMP2, and you're much faster, and that's where the hypercar really makes it speed up on this track in a straight line. So, yeah, loses a bit there. The gap grows to 10 back to 10 seconds now. Amazing stuff. They know exactly how much fuel they need in the car now and how much they're going to need to get to the end of the race. Two hours to go, two o'clock Central European time, 22 hours down, two hours to go. Hands up everybody who knows who's going to win this one. Yeah, us neither. Ferrari, Toyota, and just if something really screwy happens, maybe even Cadillac. 
I was going to come out with a really cheesy comment there. And go, I know, I know, the fans. Yay! <laughs> they win. Yeah, well, 100%. <laughs> and also, an awful lot more fans than may have watched it in the last few years because of the influx of manufacturers into the hypercar class, the influx of competition, and particularly, I mean, particularly and especially the car that leads the race now, the F word, that we are allowed to say on air, Ferrari. That is going to bring eyes, has brought eyes, I'm sure, to Le Mans that have probably barely even heard of the race and have certainly never seen it. Brendan Hartley brings in the number eight Toyota after a valiant quad stint. Rico Hiram Carrillo here at Carwell will take over the young Japanese driver who joined the team last season. And right now, this is Coke versus Pepsi. This is whoever blinks first loses this race. And right now, Toyota and Ferrari are trying desperately to think of a way of outfumbling the other guy to gain some kind of material advantage. Because we've heard from drivers in both cars, who's just hearing from James Collado after his last in, he said, there is nothing between us. They haven't got an advantage over us. We haven't got an advantage over them in the long run. Sometimes you're on fresher tires, sometimes you've got a fresher driver, but the cars are pegged exactly as the rules had hoped to produce. This is the beginning of platinum era of sports car racing and it features the biggest name in motor racing. Antonio Giovinazzi, mo most consonants, <laughs> no, Ferrari, <laughs> Ferrari. But it does feature Antonio Giovinazzi and, and what a time for this young driver to get into a top flight Ferrari program. Wow. Yeah, so uh, let's see how Ferrari play this one. So all eyes are on you, Rio Hirokawa. Now, if there's ever been a time to shine, this is your moment, boy. Well, to answer a question from somebody who said, I'm, I've just woken up after watching them on. The only question I want to know is, is Rexy still racing? Answer, yes, Rexy is still no, racing. Right on cue. Right, right on, on cue. cue, exactly, exactly. So the... Uh, that is the Project One AO Porsche, which has spent time in the lead. Trouble for the uh, IDEC car that started on pole position. Left rear puncture, that will be from David Pulvey rather than contact. And that car with Lawrence Hur at the wheel, a multiple winner here at Le Mans in LMP3 machinery in Road to Le Mans with the DKR engineering team. That car will creep back. It is actually on an outlap as well, so that is double pain for them. Giovinazzi is just about to uh, come up on that car. And this is where you don't want a tyre to come off the car in front of the Ferrari. <laughs> it's also exactly the corner you were talking about earlier, Guy Smith. The corner you do not want to catch a car in the Porsche curves because you're going to have a big accident if you run out on the loose. Yeah, you can see how it really compromised his uh, entry to the Porsche curves. It's turn 19, had to go wide, get a little bit onto the marbles. And you, you've seen, like we said before, Guy, you're reading the body language of the other car and you think, hang on a minute, that LMP2 car, they're usually much faster than that. It's moving around a lot. Yeah. Just give that an extra wide berth. Now then, inside the final two hours, these cars will need at least another two stops to make it to the finish. Toyota will stop earlier, meaning they will need more fuel, meaning they will spend a fraction more time stationary. And it's on those tiny little twists of fate through the race that sometimes very close decisions get made. Leader in. Antonio was only into the car last time round. See a couple of times they've topped up a pressurised oil system in the car. There is some attention around the fuel rig. Just checking the tyre wells, getting rid of bits of build-up of tyre rubber in there. You don't want a, a big fist-sized piece shaking itself loose and attaching itself to your slick and then thumping its way round and round and round for lap after lap. Seems like an eternity when you're sitting in the car, leading the race, and the fuel's going in. And that man in the fuel helmet could be really critical at the end, because when they're going for a full tank, it's a full tank. When they're not, it's got to be to the tenth of a second. You don't want to put in a drop more than you absolutely have to, because this is, this is going to probably be as close 
a top-class finish in the real world, as we have seen. I mean, this could be down to metres. And in terms of Le Mans finishes, do we know what the closest one was? We do. Uh, I think the closest... Is the closest real one still 1970, uh, when 1969, when Jackie Hicks ran across the track, started, uh, walked across the track, refused to run, started last, and won by metres? There is the tire. spin from the punctured tyre. And that is a brand, well, I don't know if it's a brand new set of tyres, he is on an outland. That's a DKR engineering car. They've been in the wars, these guys. Yeah. They've run a tough race. It's been a torrid time. Charles Leclerc watching the action from the Ferrari garage. That's an unusual position for you, isn't it? To be in the Ferrari garage watching a race. Uh, he's, he'd never be in a good mood normally if that was the case. It's quite often the other way around, though. I see a lot of the uh, the WEC Ferrari drivers yeah. out of the F1 events. They, they work them hard. Okay, Rio, the gap is 16.0. The gap is 16.0. Let's hunt them down. Again, really calm voice on the number eight cars. Race engineer, there's been a change in their engineering setup. Uh, for a number of years, they've had a, a different engineer in the car. But this is working really well. There's the relevant positioning on this track. Antonio Fuoco in the number 50. Was that 26 nine. laps ago? Who set the new fastest race lap? So that car, although it's not on the lead lap, is still going very quickly. Had a really good in lap that's brought the gap up to 16 seconds. Really good in lap and a good stop. And again, we've heard this all the way through, either with the 8 or the 51. Doing all the right jobs, you're hitting all the right numbers, excellent work, keep it up, you're going great. You know, and it. As a driver, what, what does that mean, you know, when you're... Because you are sort of isolated, you don't have all the data, you don't have the big picture inside the cockpit with you unless you're really following somebody or they're really behind you. You need that continual update of how things are progressing, right? Yeah, when it's as close as this, you need all the information because, you know, you need to know if you need to be pushing harder, if you are, you know, making inroads on them, so... Any information at this stage is super important. Steph Wentworth in the pit lane. Steph, apart from it being hot and sunny, what's going on? Well, I know the battle is super hot in hypercar right now, but it's also going off in LMP2. Uh, the Panic... The 65 Panic Racing... Richard, confirm box, confirm box, box, box. OK, so... Cadillac coming your way. Tell us about Panis, the LMP2 car. So this has had a battery issue and has actually been in the garage for quite some time. It looks like it's getting ready to go back out. A couple of garages down as well. There is an issue with the 39 Graf car. Uh, it looks like front right axle damage, but it seems like they're immediately heading back out. Car tires are going back on the car and they should be running very soon. OK, one of your colleagues in the pit lane wearing a suit, uh, white suit for Le Keep. Uh, is the wife of driver Patrick Pillay of the 39 Graf racing car. So undoubtedly they will have an inside line onto what's going on with that car as well. You can see Earl Bamber waiting to take over the number two caddy, former race winner for Porsche in Le Mans. And the number two car, his teammate Richard Westbrook has that in third place. First time at Le Mans with this programme, first time at Le Mans with the Cadillac Racing Organisation for GM Racing Chief Laura Wondrop clauser And if they can pull off that result here for Chip Ganassi and all of the team, that's going to be an enormous result. You know, you look at guys like Chip Ganassi and Roger Penske and, and the, you know, the big names in US racing, they don't just race in single-seaters, in Indy cars, they don't just race in NASCAR, they race in the Inter WeatherTech series as well. And you know that they know the weight and, and the, the gravitas of Le Mans, and you know that they want to win it. And here's the first chance they've had in you know, half a lifetime to come and do so on an equal footing with the same machinery. And look how well they've stepped up to the plate. The, the Porsche Penske crews, the Cadillac racing crews have been right in there swinging from the moment they arrived. in, stops in the pit box, we saw El Bamber limbering up, getting ready, this driver change with Richard Westbrook, you see just unplugging 
They've got this driver uh, helmet cooler in that car. Oh, no, he's, having a, he's having a drink there, so he's staying in. Mm -hmm. So Earl was ready in case yeah. he decided he would get out. He's obviously going for another stint. Oh, number three going very slowly. The only luck this car has had is bad luck. Now, what happened there? Has he had a little moment, or did the car need a bit of a reset? Again, Sebastian Bourdais at the wheel. This car set light to itself. Not in a major way, but no fire in a race car is ever trivial because there's so much wiring that is potentially going to get damaged. That was in hyperpole and didn't get to set a lap. Well, not as fast as a lap, but... Do you think he's run wide in our nose? Yeah, possible. It looked like recovering from a moment. Arnage will maybe, you know, maybe just gathering it all up out of Indianapolis. There's no rattling from underneath the car, but then the stones will probably be long gone. Pits and he's back up to full racing speed. Either a transit van or the garage 56 NASCAR going into the pit lane in front of him. Is that car running again? No, it's still in the garage, so I'm not sure quite what that was. Oh, oh. and there's the trouble. Toyota. There is trouble. That is Arnage. Is there fluid down there? He's been hit in the rear, look. He has he's been hit. Or has he hit him on the rear. Or he's, or he's hit the rear. Oh, my goodness. Rio Hirakawa. And now again, forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards. He does not want to put the car in the gravel. He's missed the terra firma. He has been off backwards. Where's he been? Well, we heard uh, the information getting relayed to him via Hartley, didn't we? About that very corner saying, watch out for the rear because it's that tricky. Wasn't, that wasn't the Cadillac avoiding the stationary Toyota. No, but that was down at Arnage where we saw the recovering Bordet. That was coming out of Arnage before Porsche curve. So this is a separate so I think it's only just happened because yeah. I saw the yeah, yellow. Yeah. Here we go. Just not the rear yeah, brakes. It is the rear. So it, yeah, sorry, it is Arnage, but there. it was the rear. Oh. That's Flat exactly the front what Hartley and was the talking rear about. Off the barriers. That's exactly what Harley was talking about. So uh, Cadillac's up to second. You saw when the car stopped, did it have three marker lights on or two? Charles Leclerc. You know, th this is where this is where you cannot let your emotions take it all away from you. You know, you've both been in a situation where you're getting close and you're getting closer and you're getting closer. Don't lose focus on what you're doing because that's when it all comes unstitched. Let's hear from the Toyota. Okay, your box, 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 box. not how I thought it was going to come to an end, Toyota's challenge today. No. 16 seconds behind. He was keeping the gap around 16 seconds, but clearly driving so hard to maintain that gap. And, uh, exactly as Brendan. I think they've been struggling with the rear brakes. Something with that car from very, very early on in this race. They've been managing it well. Been chasing the balance a lot. Yeah. We've heard a lot of conversations. More front, less front, more roll bar, less roll bar. Changes made, changes reversed as as the track has changed. And 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 again, we talked about this earlier. The same may well have been going on, guy, with with the Ferrari team. We're just not hearing every message from every car. So it may be that some of theirs haven't been relayed on air, and they may have been doing similar work. Yeah, the number eight car, the, the radio traffic has been pretty busy, hasn't it, uh, back and forth. So they've, been, they've just been struggling um, with the balance pretty much for the second half of this race. But they've done a good job to keep uh, the Ferrari in, uh, you know, in, in striking distance, but that's uh, yeah, a real shame for, uh, for Raya there. Yeah, number two caddy on an outlap. Richard Westbrook still at the wheel. You saw Earl Bamber watching the monitors. So it's on the same lap as the number eight Toyota, but it has not yet passed it. So it is not yet up to second place. But there's Earl wondering what might happen. There is the number two car, still showing three red lights on the side. Red is the colour for hypercar. That's the backing number on the illuminated panels on the nose and on the doors. Three, of course, means it's in third place. Two in second place. Rio Hirakawa rejoins. Fresh nose, fresh tail. 
and hopefully nothing damaged in between, but the caddy is on the lead lap. We now have three cars on the lead lap at an hour and 40 minutes to go. So a three-car Grand Prix with the field spread out and Davidson, this could be highly entertaining. Yeah, it's just, uh, like I said, though, it wasn't, it wasn't what I expected. Uh, the team have done well to turn that car around. But, yeah, bitterly disappointing for Rio. Let's see what he okay, says. Okay, gap back to the Cadillac is three minutes and 18 seconds. Three minutes, more than three minutes. We're okay. So rather than the attention... So rather than the attention being forwards, it's now shifted to who's behind. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is very telling. But... You know, that's damage management, that's making sure he knows he's not under attack from behind. Get your head down, get up to speed, go get the leader. Did you see in the background that shot? You had uh, Kamui Kobayashi chatting with Pascal Vassalon in the back of the garage, just, you know, mimicking the overseer moment with the brakes and Pascal nodding along. Hey man, the Toyota just left pit lane, so he is almost a lap down. Again, no risk, no risk. And that, again, is a critical damage limitation message. In fact, <clears throat> excuse me, as the 51 car comes out of the chicane, there he is. The car in front of him is the number eight Toyota. We talked when you're hunting. We heard Brendan Hartley going, what's the gap? Where is he? Because he'd lost, in, in a, a change of pit stops, he'd lost visual contact with the Ferrari in front. Now, Giovinazzi has eyes on the second place car. Just pace yourself with him. Make him do the work. Don't overthink it. Just oh, he breathe into the rhythm. He doesn't have to think about uh, the car in front of him. He doesn't have to think about Hirokawa. This is the best radio message he could ever wish to hear. You're almost a lap ahead. Just sail it home. An hour and a half to go. Don't do any, no heroics. He doesn't have to care about the car in front. Just, just bring this thing out. And that, suddenly, that suddenly takes some of the fuel equations out of, out of the picture yeah. because they've got a little margin in terms of time. So if they need to spend time doing a splash and Toyota doesn't, then they're good. Both the those other teams were, yeah, so sorry, both those teams were pushing as hard as they could. That's yeah. what was so enjoyable about it. You, you mentioned at the time, Guy, like, look at their lap times compared to anyone else. They are, yeah. they've elevated themselves. They had elevated themselves to a whole new plane. And something was gonna give, something was gonna crack. But Giovinazzi can't, can't relax now because he, you know, once you switch off, you relax. That's when the mistakes can creep in. So you've got to keep the focus. But then you start to listen to the car, every gear shift. What was that noise? It's, it's tricky. Let's get down to the pit lane and see what the temperature is among some of our contenders. I am with driver of the number two Cadillac, Neil Bamber. It's, it's been a good race for you guys so far. As you know, it's not over until it's over, is it? No, um, I mean, it's been a wild race. We had a really good start. We led some laps, the first ever laps here for Cadillac Racing uh, in Le Mans, so that was kind of proud. And then we had the rain and the night. There's a lot of incidents, a lot of cars crash out, but we've managed to survive and still two hours to go and it's still one third of a normal WEC race and we see what madness happens in that. So, um, yeah, we just saw the Toyota have an issue, we could have our own issues. So, um, trying to hold on there for that podium position. And you guys are on the lead lap now. Is there any chance of you guys surpassing Toyota? We saw what happened to them. No, I mean, no, uh, I think they're throwing the Toyota's got a little bit more pace than us. Um, but I'm going to jump in for the last two cents and. Well, good luck. We'll see where we end up at the end of this. It's been a crazy race. The guys behind me have done a fantastic job. Um, you know, Cadillac's done an amazing job to develop the car in the last 18 months to, to arrive here and, you know, to, to lead and to be fighting is great. Well, we look forward to seeing you back in the car. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steph Wentworth. Thank you, Earl So, yeah, they're not getting their hopes up too much. The, the garage 56 entry still on the pit apron, but it's out of the garage now. Mike Rockefeller in the Henrik Motorsport Camaro. There it is. Looks like their transmission swap fix has been made, and they are ready to go back out. Out to comes the 93 Peugeot. This car currently in ninth place in the hypercar class, ninth overall. There's 
Paul De Resta, watching intently from the garage. Peugeot, uh, disappointing in qualifying. They didn't manage to find the pace they wanted to get anywhere in the high pole shootout. And as soon as the race came, the car really came alive and showed the potential that it had shown in free practice. And unfortunately, incidents robbed them of a chance to challenge for the podium. But it's been it's been a leader, as is Cadillac, as is Porsche, as is Ferrari, as is Toyota. I think the only brand uh, brands not to have led have been Glickenhaus and the all of the other main leaders in the hypercar class have been pretty much there on pace, and a, a number of the Porsches have led the race, both Toyotas, both Ferraris at one stage or another. that has helped keep the hypercars together, the LMP2s together, and the GTEMs together, particularly when the wind is mild, is the new set of safety car regulations, where the three safety cars that we've used for a decade or more here at the Mon are all scrambled to bring the field under control, and then once the major incident that's required a safety car is fixed, they all merge into one queue, all the cars merge into one queue, then waved around anybody who is in the queue ahead of their class leader gets to go around and join the back of the queue and then all three classes are organized in terms of speed so the hypercars at the front lmp2s in the middle and the gtes at the back and that's helped keep the racing alive it's stopped people losing laps unnecessarily just because of the uh, the quibbles foibles of fate and where you get stuck in the safety car queues now that could also bring our field back together if we get a safety car in the next half an hour because in the final 60 minutes of the race if there is a safety car we will not have the merge we will not have the wave around we will not have the drop back so we will go with three safety cars because it will take a good couple of laps to merge and drop everybody back after the danger has been passed so that can no longer take effect after we get into the beginning of the final hour. Nicky Katzberg on board the 33 Corvette, and he will do the final 90 minutes in that car. There is the current uh, challenger in third place, Rahel Frey in the Iron Dames Porsche. They've been in the lead battle, and Rexy, the Project One T-Rex livery in Porsche, up to second place. And the Corvette of Nicky Katzberg retains the lead after that pit stop, and the uh, Oman Racing TF Sport Aston Martin. That's the orange car in the background of the shot. That's fourth place. So we're looking at the gap there between Matteo Cairoli in Rexy and the Iron Dames Porsche. There's the challenge, though. The ORT by TF Sport, Charlie Eastwood driven Aston Martin, is the challenger for the final podium spot. Rahel Frey needs to keep that gap alive. Yeah, Charlie Eastwood's been uh, absolutely flying all race long in that car. And he's slowly catching, catching the whole time. Good graphics there at the bottom of the screen. He put in a, an absolutely brilliant stint uh, during the night. You see, see the work still all skewed as it's uh, taken a bit of damage at some point. Certainly not affecting the performance that, that much for, for Charlie. Yeah, he's probably finding the extra few tenths in himself that yeah. might be robbed uh, by that. The only, the only slight issue when the aerodynamics or the bodywork moves is the aerodynamics move and things like where the low pressure area is that helps suck the hot air from out under the bonnet, if that disappears, then you start to run problems with overheating because although you're going through the air at the same speed, if the air is trying to be rammed in by the movement of the car but can't escape significantly, then you you, know, you stall the air in the radiators, and if air isn't flying in your radiators, these cars don't have auxiliary fans, so you run the risk of getting into an overheating problem. So the TF Sport team watching there, the ORT by TF Sport, Oman Racing Team. Pole Citizen Spa, last time out, and looking for a first podium here at the Mon for an Omani driver. Ahmed Al Harty is the key to that program. Yeah. Yeah. 
we were, we were setting up the Ben Keating Sarabovi battle, and then yeah. boom. Oh, there he was. Watch this. Crazy like that, absolutely. Didn't quite find that pace here at Le Mans, but nevertheless, the car has been very resilient in the race. In fact, the only TF Sport car that has not been a right amount of pain all the way through. It's their only car remaining in the race out of three Aston Martins and an MMP2 car that they started. And he is closing little by little on Rahel Frey. So the Swiss driver in the pink car. Have to hang on, stay ahead. Boston and Charlie Eastwood. Iron Links, Iron Dames Garage. There, the Iron Links car, yellow car of Claudio Schiavone, out yesterday in the daylight hours with an accident. The key behind a lot of this Iron Links program. Effectively run by the Puccini brothers, they're the joint team managers. So it is back out of the pit lane. Well, my prediction was that we finished 19th. It's currently 39th, so I was even further away than that day to 29th. And it was jubilant for about two laps when it moved from 30th to 29th, only for them to move up to 28th. Uh, we had a brief talk about Paris. Because, well, as you know, it's the Start the car, yeah. which means you don't stop it, which means it's part. Just a few years ago, it was the same issue for, I think it was a G drive. Obviously, it was full. That helmet, that Paris helmet's not bringing in much luck, is it? No, not really. Might have brought him a few smiles from the boss, but uh, was it? Was that the one where they drilled holes in the rear no, deck so they could weird. stick that a stick in and hit a stick in the What year where they went to B2? Sorry, sorry, you're pointing at something. Uh, sorry, no, I just said pit stop for car 34 under investigation, so... That is our long-time leader in the LMP2 category, still in front of the inter Europol car, despite having to serve a drive-through. Uh, it served a drive-through this morning for overtaking the under safety the safety car. car, and it turns out, we find from the official notices, that the offence had been committed at 8 o'clock on Saturday, and the uh, penalty was applied at 9 a.m., I think, on Sunday. Yeah, so, so that's something of a... Quite a while to exact the details there. Across. You see how Rahel Frey is responding to the pressure from the Aston Martin. This is for a place on the podium. And, uh, important result this would be, come what may, because the results behind Corvette, if indeed the... Uh, this doesn't seem to be to see. Is it Ralph Wright? Is Ralph Wright? Leaping over the curbs. What's that that's going to do here? With... Uh, indeed to the title of the Corvette. Won't make it if we get the cars finishing broadly speaking where they do. The bigger problem in terms of keeping the World Championship to the WC alive is the large number of contending cars on out. Project One, oh yeah, Project One have just been in and out of pit lane. That's why the tail cut over the A. It looked slow going up through the Dunlop curves. I thought, oh, is that the normal speed? And B appears now to be fourth, not second. So this is now the battle for second place. Iron Dames Porsche versus ORT by TF Aston. And the Corvette Racing number 33 car still out front. Yeah, history awaits here, whatever happens here. Of course, the major round. headline is Ferrari. And yep. coming back 50 years afterwards, and boy, do they look happy about it. But there's all sorts of other records, one in particular about nations and drivers and winning in this 100th year of the Le Mans 24 hours. Should the 51 car win, I believe I'm right, that will put uh, James Clardo winning, will mean that uh, the same number of French wins per driver is equal by the UK. Oh, wow. Well, 
I ball the living daylights out of everybody by saying this is Britain's biggest motor race. Yep. It has been well, British entries, private or factory, have been a part of this since 1923. Yep. And against the advice of W.O. Bentley, a group of uh, well-heeled enthusiasts brought their Bentley over to take on the Continental makes and uh, fly the flag for the British motor industry. And then seeing how well they did, W.O. decided actually there might be something to that. Yes. He was always a, always a man with a, a great view on promoting the brand being a good thing. And somehow there was just a little germ of an idea there. And that led, of course, directly to Guy Smith winning Le Mans in the Bentley. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, eventually. In a roundabout way. Directly. Yeah, yeah no, no, not at all in a roundabout way. It's a, it was a, a direct response to the history of Bentley, when Bentley changed owners most recently, that generated the, the impetus to create, to recreate success at Le Mans and, and to relive those glory years. And yeah, you were part of it. I mean, to be a British driver, part of winning Le Mans in a British car, there's not many have done it over the years. And, and there's been a century of trying. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Whatever's under investigation here. Well, uh, if they get a drive through and they, they got they a drive through before, lead. it'll take 32 seconds. They're currently 26 seconds ahead of the second place Team WRT car of Robert Kubica. It's going to be very tight. They have got the pace advantage. They've had that throughout this latter part of the event. So if it's called now, she's still in that battle. They do stand, by the way to beat the first ever Polish class winners here as a team. I, that I don't find hard to believe. Yeah, I have been everybody in the 1920s, but... No, uh, 1933. OK, there we go. 20 years ago. Wow. And that was a DNF. And here is the battle for second then. Rahel Frey in the pink Porsche, Charlie Eastwood in the orange, Aston Martin. Last time round, up to Dunlop she came, Rahel, just two feet under braking, trying really hard to hang on to this, really, really hard to hang on to this. This is not about second place. This may be, in fact, about any position on the podium, and Eastwood's got the speed advantage, pulls out of the slipstream guy. He's put the car exactly where it needs to be, on the racing line. He's just got to try and hang on there, run the outside, and make it a clean pass. Brave stuff there by Charlie. He's in a rich vein of fainter form, isn't he? He just seems to be driving better and better throughout this year. Whatever he's driving, whether it's a P2 car, he comes here as the overall Asian Le Mans Series champion. And he put his trust in my help play there, didn't he, as a fellow pro. I'm on the outside, you can tag me into a big spin, but I know you're better than that. You know, they've raced against this pink car for a number of years now, and they trust the drivers, and you have to have that going on those outside passes. You've got to have that respect, especially at that kind of speed, and, and clearly that was there. But you know, she's fighting back. She's not letting this go. She she realizes this is a this is a, a fight for, for a podium finish, if not potential win, if anything happens there to the Corvette. So she's got to keep on the back of that uh, Aston Martin and keep the pressure on. Look at the rate of attrition in GTE Am. Fast. It's, I've never the seen it. Nine I've never cars seen it. running. And OK, the weather definitely played its part. We've had lots of wet races before, but it was the sort of mostly dry, absolute delage and dry again nature of the track, I think, that really caused the havoc. It wasn't just in GTM, but there were, there were cars off driven by very, very well-experienced and highly respected drivers in Remember all three classes. Four of those GTM cars were eliminated in two separate two-car incidents, yep. 60 and the 16. Um, effectively took each other out. It was the same with the 55 GMB Motorsport Aston Martin. And the 66 car was part of the multi car pile up as well. He was an innocent victim of somebody else checking up in a next slow rather than slow zone. The leader goes by the class leader. There was only one car in the invitational class. I don't think that's diluted, diluted in any way the enjoyment of the Hendrick Motorsports crew. 
Jimmy Johnson, seven-time NASCAR winner. At last, and uh, haven't had a chance to, but I would like to bet that Jensen's relationship with this program didn't come because he's Jensen Button Formula One champion. I sense that it came, and, and I, I don't remember it as a fact. I know that Jimmy Johnson has done the race of champions. I know that Jensen Button has done the race of champions. I sense it's off duty in a hotel somewhere where that friendship first has, has started to grow. And I think that was the, the link that brought him in. The Rocky Link, not too sure, but he's a uh, yeah, well known in North America, good pair of hands. I'm not sure if he's done road course races, but Henry Motors more now. But uh, it's a, a good addition as well, a man who knows what it takes to win the mark. Goes through the last 311 car just behind, so 16 very American cylinders. So Clayton in close formation. And one other thing to watch, we've got another 20 minutes left in this race. Burgos in formation two. The gap on the track between the lead car and the second place number eight Toyota is opening up again. Three minutes and 24 seconds. That means something like six or seven seconds on track between them. And if the 51 car pushes and overtakes, the number eight goes up down and the safety car is vagaries of making a pit stop in the next 20 minutes and somehow the Toyota stays out and the Ferrari doesn't and they end up but I mean that's all lifts and buts. Again a safety car is unlikely to be weather related. 50 on pit road as is the team WRT car second in B2. Yeah. track as well, having nearly had a 1-2, having had one car stop on the final lap and still claiming victory by what's probably the tightest ever margin in LMP2, one of the tightest ever winning margins in any class here. Uh, the Ferrari will obviously have to stop earlier, the fuel of the uh, Toyota when it came in for repairs. Another car on pit road, it's one we've been quite quiet about for the last few hours, but it leads its class, it's the 45 LMP2 Pro-Am car of Algar Pro Racing. With attrition in the LMP2 class, the Portuguese flag team got it round at the wheels and came in. Dominates that class right now. I think they still was that four laps the good over the second place cool racing car. That's the Jakobsen out there still. The young man signed, confirmed was signed recently as the, of the Persia junior driver. Third place in that car class and what much further back is the DKR engineering car. Well, I was looking at the DKR car and seeing, because next on the timing screen in 35th place overall rather than 34th is Prema Racing's, and that's not Pro-Am, is it, though? No, so a Pro -Am. Uh, the Graf Racing Pro-Am car, Patrick Pile, number 17, uh, number 39 car, oh, six laps is back. six laps further yeah. back. So third place looks relatively safe. Well, look out, it's back out and uh, running in the lead. Flag, by the way, for that uh, cutting across underneath the Dunlop Bridge. Well, oh, yeah. Pleased to see that um, race control making this play mistake I keep making with the changes of numbers between various championships we cover. 83 and 85 have been something of a removal piece. Yeah, is the 85 car against the warning. Corvette racing lead, a minute and 32 seconds clear. Nicky Katzberg and Charlie Eastwood. Further 3.2 seconds now to Ralph Rye at the podium positions into Europol with a pit stop under investigation. Lead 41 car from Team WRT just out back onto track. And that should be a full stop from home. Now, the other thing is that WRT now stopping and Interpol into Europol not having stopped now means that if there is a penalty applied immediately to take it immediately, they will emerge from the pits in the lead. How they then get to the end of fuel compared to WRT, I don't know. But the longer it goes now, the closer to the end, and we talked about this with, with the uh, Ferrari and Toyota, Toyota stopping a little earlier, the earlier you are now in the fuel strategy, the more it might hurt at the end of the race. 
Louise Beckett in the pit lane. What do you know, Louise? I'm standing right next to the Inter Europo 34 team now. The, the Lollipop guy is out. He's pulling the car in. They've got a fresh set of tyres for him. I'm assuming they're going to do the stop first. Oh, no, they're doing a, a full service right now. And there's a hopping Fabio Scherer getting it into the car. You could at least have carried him. Oh, that would be outside assistance, I suppose. So to explain why Fabio Scherer is hopping, uh, it's foot run over by the Corvette, we believe. Yes, yeah. I, I, I believe it was the Corvette. Louise will uh, just downstream of them towards Pit Inn is their sister car. The garage is down on that. What's the next one along? So they've got IDEC, uh, IDEC 48 and then the next one is the 33 Corvette. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure I read some somewhere in the 33. He's right on the scene, he's right on the pit stop with us. Well, the skew policy is shades of green and yellow for the finger of the yellow into your own team. They win this one, they're never going to change it again, are they? Then why would you mean that? And the other car was a sort of mirror image with uh, a white background and, and narrow yellow and green stripes. Now, what were they yelling about there? Were they they pleased with, I think they were pleased with that stop. Yeah. They were 29 pocket. for WRT. Yeah. What was that stop for? Out of Europe. Yeah. It was exactly the same. 29, so they lost nothing. OK. So now we wait and see whether there is a penalty coming for them in the last 75 minutes. Well, we were told that there is an investigation. We'll wait and see what happens. There is the second place car. The number 41 WRT car. 24 seconds is the gap. Louis Delatras hustling now. That means that if Alba Costa has to serve the penalty, he will come out eight seconds behind as of now. It's a 32-second drive-through. That's the pit lane delta. OK, Ferrari getting ready for the driver changes. Is he on his second stint going? Antonio Fuoco might also be in the second. Yeah, Fuoco was definitely on his second, possibly his third even, actually. And, and back home, when you're sitting on your sofa, you go, yeah, but he's in the car, leave him in, you know, leave him in. Mm, oh, it's another 75 minutes to go. And if he's been in there for an hour and a half already, OK, yeah, I'm, I'm good to go, I'm good to go. Except, are you going to be good to go in another hour when it might really, really come down to the nitty gritty? Just don't, don't change things just for sort of some emotional reaction. If it's, if it's due for him to come in and, and jump out the car, then swap drivers. You're all going to be on the top seven of the podium anyway, or you're not. But well, that is unlikely to be changed for the better by not changing drivers and keeping them fresh. Sometimes as a driver, the best place to be is actually in the car because the time passes faster <laughs> and you're in control. There's nothing worse than standing um, watching the car with the final sort of hour or so to go and not being in control. So um, it's a real sort of toss-up really which way to go. But uh, yeah, Jim well, Vanatz is driven brilliantly so far. The other advantage is with fireproof gloves on, it's much harder to chew your fingernails. <laughs> True. And you tend to be busy. Probably second stint. Second stint, okay. yeah. I, I, uh, I thought they had both changed at the same time. So our class leaders in hypercar Ferraris, Antonio Giovinazzi, Fabio Scherer for Inter Europol, still leading in LMP2. And Corvette Racing's Nicky Hatsberg. He's got a, a Texan hat like everybody else. Nicky Katzberg is leading in the Corvette car number 33. We have a total of. Do we only have. Still 40 running cars? I thought we, we have might have 40 lost running one cars or two. with the Jota car. Yes, I suspect the last lap wandered. The last lap wander there, ready to send it out, but not long before the end. So, whatever ails that car is clearly not going to last for long, and that should be, assuming nobody else falls by the wayside, our 40th and final. At the moment, we have lost 22 cars for our 62 starters. 
Because that is a high rated system that we've had in a good decade. It's uh, yeah, been a while since I can remember seeing this many outs and a lot of it weather related, lots of incidents, mm -hmm. lots of the multi car incidents. It's lacked for nothing in terms of drama of the welcome and unwelcome sort, has it? Well, it's been a hard one to walk away from, Guy. <laughs> Whenever you and somebody taps you on the shoulder and go, all right, sunshine, off you go. You kind of, oh, yeah, no, I just, can I, I'll just watch another... And so, actually, one of the, one of the great things that, that's happened in our commentary in the last few years, other than having fantastic guests in the, in the booth like you, is that we've now got a sort of double-sized room, so we've got somewhere to sit and watch and listen Absolutely. when you're not on there. And actually, that's, that really helps with our understanding and living of the race, because we like those, you know, all the fans at home who are sitting in the armchair where they were at lunchtime yesterday with the wife going, are you going to sit there all day then? <laughs> well, yeah, if I can. Right, I'm off then, I'll see you tomorrow. And, and the screens and the, and the iPad with the timing and the, the app and Ferrari's garage cam and the Corvette go with the well, it's like, garage It's cam. like being at home, isn't it? You wait for the adverts to come and you make a cup of tea. Well, you know, <laughs> here the, you, the adverts are coming, we just want to watch the show. So it's, um, I think whether you're a fan or you're, you're, you're a part of the show, it's, um, it's just so exciting what we're seeing here. Yeah. I'm, I'm watching the, the tone on social media as well as popping into a couple of people between Commentary extends, got 51 on radio. Let's see what's going on for the race leader. We've got to that point. Hey mate, box the slap, box the slap, driver change, box the slap, driver change. I'll tell you what it's going to say. As a copy. Okay, Antonio, box this lap, box this lap. As a mark of that level of attrition last year, eight cars plus one non classified car. Right. This year, 22. Wow. 22 what? Non-classified cars? Uh, 22 cars already retired yeah. from this race. Last year it was one non-classified car and eight retirements. Well, it's almost three times the level. Well, and, it, I, and I don't think that is all weather related, but uh, yeah, the, the, the incident breeds incident breeds incident. Where there's been a slow zone, that has actually caused uh, or drivers have had incidents. DKR in the pit lane as well, we've just seen them in there. Vector Sporter in, Edex Sporter yeah. in, and so to Action Express and the 94 Peugeot team. They've come and gone. Louis Delatras is closing on into Europol, and he's taken seven seconds out of that lead since those two pit stops just a couple, couple of laps ago. Wow. So out is Antonio Giovinazzi, and in, perhaps for the rest of the race, is their talisman, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, three time. GT Pro World Champion with teammate James Calado. What a great pairing they have been in terms of cohesion and success and just pure speed and aggression behind the wheel. Uh, Sandro, by the way, together with Antonio Giovinazzi, with the 19th and 20th Italian winners of this fantastic race, which will take few of their nation, their nation ahead of the United States. Uh, both have 18 winners at the moment. Uh, 18 wins, sorry. And was Luigi the Kinetti the then counted as US or Italian? Because he, he was a US citizen, so I'm assuming he would have raced with a US license. Check that for you. Luigi Kinetti won twice in Ferraris, became Ferraris. Distributor ran his own team, North America racing team, for many years. Okay, new mediums, new mediums. Okay, let's just get our free practice program underway here. <laughs> we got a 67 minute session, let's see what we can learn. Italian. Well, let's get down into our lead battle in GTEM. with Ahmed El Harty from the 25 ORT by TFO. My goodness, how are, this is a terrible question, but how are you feeling right now? I honestly, this is, might be the first time where I don't think I can get the words out of my mouth, to be honest. It's, um, wow, what a way to race the 24 hours of the world. Um, you can see where we're really, really fighting for this podium, and it means so much for everybody here, the hard work that was happening throughout the last 16 years, you know, is here right now and everybody drove their hearts out, the team is working, unbelievable with the strategy, 
all the other competitors are really amazing and they've all you know been driving at the best levels possible and you know we survived the first four hours and then we survived the night and the rain and the visibility and now it's just about trying to survive this last hour and a bit so you know um, i don't like talking much before the race finishes but uh, you know it's such a special thing and i hope um, i hope everyone's watching back in oman and i hope that you know we can we can bring it in a very very decent position hopefully summed it up perfectly thank you thank you so much thank you Racing team here his car in second place in the GT Am class, and you can hear he is definitely feeling very tired and emotional right now. And again, like our female racing car situation, there's a, a proud history of women racing in this event that dates right back to the very earliest days, the 1930s. But Let's enjoy again, this. if you don't see it, you can't be it. You know, he will inspire undoubtedly another whole bunch of young, enthusiastic kids in Oman, in the Muscat and, and other regions around, you know, that part of the Middle East to go out and do things because they see it happening. And, and guy, you know, we're used to that in the UK. We're used to that in Europe. We've got a century of motorsport and all to draw on. We're used to seeing it. We grew up with it. There's lots of parts of the world where it's, it's a new thing and, and it encourages people to get involved. Absolutely. And uh, with this race as well being the centenary, you know, we've got eyeballs, we've got people watching the sport, and hopefully we're going to create a new fan base. We're going to get new people, Ferrari fans, Cadillac fans from the US, um, racing NASCAR fans. fans. Just yeah. racing Just fans. Racing fans. <laughs> it's been an amazing and, event. You know, how can you not be um, impressed and excited by, by this race and this, this championship? I think actually you talked about their racing fans, NASCAR fans, who would previously almost certainly unlikely to have been watching them on, will have tuned in because of Henrik Motorsport and Jimmy Johnson and gone, what's this all about? The same way that Formula One fans who are fans of Ferrari will have tuned in to see what's going on just because they know Ferrari are doing it. And people who maybe not even Formula One fans, but have heard that Ferrari is racing this crazy race, there will be all sorts of eyes on it. And if you are a first time fan and you've in any way enjoyed it, tell your friends. We race these cars several times a year. The next race will be in Monza in July. We'll race then in Fuji in Japan. And we'll race in Bahrain. And then an eight race calendar next year. Yep. Yep. Which and so there is a lot of this stuff on air and online. You can catch up with it all. And just a little info from James. Uh, he had a couple of times the power steering go a little hard in fast Indy. So just take extra care there. That's not what you want to hear. Now, Graham, you were jumping up and down, getting ready to tell us something about something a little earlier. Uh, just simply, you mentioned the NASCAR uh, Garage 56 effort. And if you're watching, you're a NASCAR fan, and I'm, I'm sure you're looking at the timing screens as well, and you're thinking, yeah, that's a bit disappointing. Don't be. Uh, you've made friends here for your part of the sport. Um, all the cynicism about, you know, a novelty entry melted away in a nanosecond. Oh. The technology, the team spirit, the attitude, the aptitude, the outlook have all been warmly embraced here, and you've flown the flag very proudly. And damn it, the noise. Oh, yes. Uh, there's, you know, like I said, yeah, in the meantime, we're talking to Vince President John Doonan, who's been sort of responsible for making sure this program came together. There's been 300 plus thousand smiles every lap that car it's has fantastic. turned around here. Jimmy Johnson was saying early in the race when they were behind the safety car, he realized that every time he was passing a big bank of fans, you know, down at Indianapolis or on Arch Corner, everybody was waving at him. So he like, waved back. Two Cadillac like, uh, on pit lane now. Yep. Earl With. Bamber takes over from Richard Westbrook after a triple stint for Westy, and that will take that car through to the end. So we'll listen to what's going on with Rio Hirakawa in the chasing uh, Toto Kazoo racing car. Okay, Joe, box this lap, pit confirm. Box for fuel only, you stay in the car. Control Clouds are the head of GM Racing. We Pressure. talked about some of the, the women driving in this race, a proud heritage. There are more and more and more female faces and voices from the cockpit through the garage, the engineers, team bosses, corporate principals, 
corporate bosses, the head of Peugeot is female as well. You know, we've got race control with female race directors. The, again, you know, the, the more the more young women and, and young girls get to see people like them in, in positions in motor racing, the more it encourages them to come out and do something that they might be passionate about as well. And, and that, again, greatly helps to grow our sport in, in all directions. Completely so, correct. Yeah. Yeah. You were saying about uh, uh, female drivers here at Le Mans. Dorian Pam became the 65th female starter in this race. She will not be finishing it, sadly, with the elimination uh, of the 63 car accident for uh, Danny Kivia. Hearing from Louise Monway, Candy on its way with all back at the wheel, and it's a fresh set of mediums with almost precisely 60 minutes to go. There are still going to be storylines to be written here, gentlemen. This is not done, but in 10 seconds' time, one thing changes, and that's the safety car rules. Yep. We will be into the final hour of the 24 hours of the Mon. Right now, you just saw the Corvette, the B2 GTE Am, OMG by TF, the Oman Racing Team. Charlie Eastwood, that Aston Martin is in second. And the Iron Dames, Rahel Fry, still in third place, ahead of Rexy, the green T-Rex livery, Project One Porsche, Matteo Cairoli, and he is getting on for 40 seconds behind. And there it is, three o'clock, Central European summertime, on the Rolex clock above the start-finish line. We have an hour to go in the centenary Le Mans. Century of history. 23 hours of exceptional racing so far. 60 more minutes to go. Let's hear for, from the number two corner, uh, Cadillac. So, one hour to go, one hour to go. Bring it home, no risk. With sister car, car number three, driven by Sebastian Bourdais, as you can see, is two laps off the lead, uh, or two laps behind them, in fact. So, uh, 4 minutes 58, it's a, a 3 minute 28 lap, so it's more than a lap behind. So there will be no attack from behind, but the yellow-nosed caddy, I'm sure, will try its best to close up the final hour behind the blue-nosed caddy. It comes to Toyota. 311 is still going. Toyota comes into the pit lane. It will need to do one more stop. They cannot go 58 minutes on fuel but it stops before the race leader, or four laps after the race leader, three laps maybe after the race leader. Out of sequence, remember, because of that incident. Well, and also because they, they took a short stint, very short stint, when there were a couple of long slow zones, they ducked in for fuel. Again, trying to roll the dice, trying to make a difference. Guy Smith, when you're in this, when you're in the, in the clinch, like right in the closing stages, you know the cars are equal. If you just do the same as the other guy, it, it doesn't break the deadlock, it doesn't break the stasis. So you've got to try and make a change, do something different. And there are ways you can do it with fuel, with track position. Yeah, you've just got to be creative. At the end of the day, you know, doing the same thing. If you haven't quite got the pace, you're not going to win the race. So you've got to be creative. So. Um, whether it be, uh, as you say, whether it be fuel, tyres, stint length, you've got to try and, uh, and make that difference up. And Unfortunately, we're not going to see that with the with the Toyota here, you know, losing so much time with that um, accident. But still, it's in a great position. Anything happens to that Ferrari. And uh, yeah. as we know with Le Mans, anything can happen right down to the last lap. Look, we've done 23 hours. There's two minutes in it. That ain't much. That's crosses to stop. Yeah. The pit wall. The way it goes to the brakes. It's, it, it, it's barely more than the standard fuel stop, but it's also one stoppage somewhere on the track and recycled for a guy completely and, correct. And, and Toyota, of all people, need no reminding of that Helen and Davidson in the background. Uh, Toyota need no reminding of, uh, and nor did WRT for that matter, or anybody else who's been here in the last decade, need any reminding of what can happen at this crazy race. 57 minutes, less to change in seconds as the brake car goes off in pursuit of Alessandro Pierre Guidi. Rio Hirakawa, it is at the wheel. And a P2, meanwhile, 14 seconds is now the lead gap. Fabio Scherra being hunted less successfully at this point in the uh, cycle by Louis Delatraz. And it's now WRT 2 3 with Roman Freins having made his way by. Rennie Binder in the Duquesne Team 30 car, a little while ago, in GTE Am, at the 27th position, Nicky Katzberg, 
That's over a minute and a half of advantage over the Charger Charlie Eastwood. Has uh, pulled out nearly 17 seconds now over Rahul Fry. Roby in the Project One AO Rexy. The dinosaur liveried Porsche is on pit lane now. What will be the final routine stop for that effort? All those four cars have been exceptional and this and weekend. Fry was just creeping away from Matteo Cairoli, which is not an easy job to do. But he is not in a, a Porsche by accident. He knows how to handle those things. He's a Porsche Junior factory driver. Seen for success. 62 cars started this race. 16 of them were in the hypercar class. At the moment, the top nine are still hypercar entries for three other runners at pace at the moment in that uh, in that uh, that class field in amongst the LMP2s and the 38 Hertz team Jota car which is still uh, on the in the garage and we expect to finish the race as a last lap wonder or last couple of laps wonder yeah it is currently the last car that is not retired 40 cars potentially to take the flag on board of Antonio Fuoco just being worn back pack limits gap we try to catch up let's see I mean it's it's how it is I mean uh, I did forgot how long was a 24 hour race uh, it's long let's see at the finish and especially how long that last hour is as well yeah especially the last lap oh yeah you've been there before so many things can happen thank you Vincent we hopefully speak to you later Closing in now on Rio Hurricane to unlap itself. It is currently, what is that, five it laps down? Five laps back still. Down. Oh, this was happening three or four hours ago. What, 50 car was right up behind that break Toyota. century ago, only four nationalities were represented. France, France and Spain here in the bar. They were entries from Belgian drivers, British drivers, and German drivers. Now we have, I think I remember correctly, 32 different nations represented on the grid. Some major motorsporting nations and some El Nino end of the scale. By the way, radio that is into Europol's pit board, or not a pit board, but uh, just reminding him that uh, Johnny Walker's sounds in the 70s comes up <laughs> <laughs> shortly on radio. I think, I think as well, Martin, by the way, with the exception of Antarctica representing every continent. Yep, on six continents out of the seven, you're right. Antarctica do not, well, Antarctica don't have a nation state, so they don't have a representation either. But uh, I suppose somebody could come from the Ross Ice Shelf who might be a full time scientist and part time racer, but that sounds a little less than likely. Meaning some of the debris out of the cooling grills. This will be the final stop, routine stop for the Iron Dames. Well, indeed, what a run they've had. Yeah. Great spirit of this, this effort. Great in the last few years, but what a race they are having here. They stop place, and it's going to be tight for the podium in GTE Am. It's Europe leading in LMP2. Fabio Scherer uh, back pedaling the car. You need two legs to pedal, so we'll have to come up with a better, a better way of describing driving the car with a single foot. Now, what he needs is a Chaparral 2F. Not because of the high wing, but because of the automatic gearbox. Yeah, it's uh, 12 seconds down the gap. It is still closing, and we've still got a pit cycle to go for both of these cars. And Louis Delatraz setting the WRT 41 cars fastest first sector of the race. Box Fabio. Okay. 
We probably don't need to write Fabio on it. If you put 41 on box, I think they'll, he'll probably get 34. 34 indeed. <laughs> and a long night and another long day. I, d I don't think writing on in Biro is going to really work. <laughs> He's coming past you at 160 miles an hour. Get a bit more gaffer. This you, is you get this edgy stuff, isn't it? They need, to, they need to throw a bread roll at him. Hang on a minute. Box. There's 50 minutes to go. Yeah. Can't do it with you. He can't do it with you. Box now. So why is he boxing? Has oh, he got a penalty? Early. That's very early. Has he got a penalty? Well, we have been informed of the penalty, but the team may have. It is the last hour of the race. Things might not happen. Now, are they just preparing it? Yes, it's not going to the pit wall. It's going to the back of the garage. So have a bit more gaffer on. Because if he hasn't got a radio, they can't tell him. And we don't have the signaling bits at Monsanto Corner anymore. There's Michelle Gatting. Looking quite drawn as well, Michelle. Yeah. Emotional. Yeah. But it's in a very emotional event, this. Well, their car has now dropped out of third place with its final pit stop. But have we had the final pit stop for the Corvette? Have we had the final pit stop for GR Racing and Ricardo Perro? Because if we haven't, and if they need to stop again, then again, the battle is on. It would mean, probably, I would argue, it would mean as much to the crew in that pink Porsche to finish on the podium for Le Mans as it will to anybody else, whether they're winning the centenary Le Mans for Ferrari or anything else. I think that crew have as much invested emotionally in this as any other team yeah. in the business. That would be an enormous, enormous result for them. And it is hanging in the balance. Duquesne Engineering just on the fringes of the top three in LMB2. Let's hear from them. I'm in your journey from the 30 Duquesne car. Uh, you're just getting ready to get back into the car now, so it's going to be full attack, I take it? Yeah, full attack. We had to look because of my four hours within six hour drive limit, and I'm just like on the limit. So now we just try to take over the tires from Rene and see if we can get that third place back. So you're going to stay on the tires, but you're going to swap the driver? Yes, that's what we're going to try. Uh, yeah, we didn't think that we have to fight that hard for P3, because at some stage it looked all good until our punctures. So that's Le Mans, yeah. So let's see. Sure is, and you know it well. It's good to see you here, and hopefully we'll see you at the end. Thank you. Thank you stuff all round. And you can see the faces at its Europol. They're worried, and they should be. Ten and a half seconds now. Louis Delatrazzi is closing. <laughs> taking chunks of time out of their long, long-held lead. As you're about to turn heads around the world with this sports car pace on both sides of the Atlantic. All sorts of weird things happen at the end of races like this, as, as we've seen in, in years gone by. Uh, WRT lost a 1-2 result a couple of years ago when Yiffy E's car failed on the final lap. They ended up with the car winning, Robin Fryings winning the race just from Tom Blomqvist to Jota. Could it be that they might get that one too this year? They've already had a win in the road to Le Mans, the BMW GT3 car. Valentino Rossi was driving, and they run regularly for him in the G Fanatec GT Series. He had his first win in the GT3 car. He was on the Le Mans podium for the first time since 2008. But there's a story there as well. A little further away, in seventh place overall, Gabby Aubrey was supposed to be going to the end for Vector Sport. In the words of Fiona Miller, entering her final hour as a press, uh, a press member of the press corps here in Le Mans, he is toast. Oh dear. So they are going to pit and put Matthias back in for the final, what they think should be five to seven laps. So GM yeah. Racing, by the way, are now making that final pit stop. That okay. should cycle the 85 ahead of the 86 with 47 minutes to go. Well, right, Still pushing is the highest rated driver. She's a gold rated driver in the Iron Dames car. So they can see the OLT by TF car. There's the Duquesne car, kind of a 30. We just heard that Neil Jani will be loaded in in place of Rene Binder. He'll take Rene's tyres and then go hell for leather after a podium spot. But he's about to be put a lap down by the leader who is still absolutely flying, Fabio Scherer. First lap of the race goes to the 
Team WRT car, a 3.36.146, 10.2 seconds. That's the number 41 car in second place. So again, that charge from Louis Delatraz is bearing, for, or is that Frines in the third? No, that is Delatraz in the 30, uh, 41, yes. So you can see 34, 41 ahead of the 34 car on the track. in it. There's the ORT by TF car. The car's still running a comfortable second place, so just about 100 seconds off the now dominant performance from Corvette Racing, and that's a car that's had its troubles this yeah. week. Oh, it was nowhere. I mean, it was pack up and let's go home and go to the pub tonight kind of territory early on in the race. Lap three laps to go. Okay, and you can, you can see there that you can see what Alvin Costa was doing, couldn't you? They're closing, they're closing. Yeah, they're trying desperately to Desperate. communicate, aren't they, with Fabio Scherer? Well, well, how heroic, you know, look, he's, he's, he's hopping into the car, he's got no radio, he's got no clue about gaps, he's left to find his own pace, they can't even signal him into the box without putting sticky tape on a, on a piece of cardboard. I, I think David Brown can relate front. to a lot of that <laughs> from, from his time with them. Here comes RT by XA TF. 220. RT by TF. I think going to put a bit more gaffer on that bonnet just in case. And the gaffer's sort of peeling off the bonnet. Hasn't though. The bonnet pins at the front are holding. There's the young audience member. I wonder how many times that young man will come back to the bar. I wouldn't bet the on him being here. Maybe even for the 150th celebration. There you go. This is the 86 car with its commemorative livery, half and half. And look at the filth on the track. So half the viewers outside the track, don't see any of that. They just get the black side. Anybody who's on the inside of the track only gets the golf side. It's, it's quite bizarre. They're looking at two different race cars for the entire race, and unless it spins, they never see the other side of it. No, uh, not quite clear where we are with the pit stop cycle, by the way, for the 54 Ferrari. Yeah, I can tell you is. Oh, it now. Says right, it's so in each case, the, the battle for second place, or third place rather, in GTM is separated by six seconds, and I think the GR Racing car has come out ahead of the Iron Domes. Yes, it has. OK, but it's being closed. Yeah, the battle is on. Well, there is the Corvette that leads in GTM. Three class leaders as we get into the final three quarters of an hour here. Ferrari, of course, will lead with number 51 in a behind car class. There is your GTM leader, Vicky Katzberg, in the 33 Corvette. And into your bowl, the green and yellow LMP2 car leading in that category. Fabio Scherer in, uh, I was going to say, small silence. I suppose probably not very silent in an LMP2 car. Not in really. comes the GTM leader. But Scherer with no radio comms, they're desperately waving things at him to try and keep him up to speed. Make sure he doesn't come in too early or too late. Final stop for the 33. Final stop for Corvette Racing at Le Mans. It will mm -hmm. be a very different look to the Corvette presence next next year here in a different car, the C06 GT3R, and with a different team to be revealed. Yeah, the focus for the GT3 Corvette will be on customer racing. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure there'll be a fair number of these men and women behind this effort and efforts over the last better part of a quarter of a century with more than a couple of tears in their eye. This has been a, an effort that has attracted so much attention, so much loyalty. Yeah. The most popular sports car team in North America has made a lot of friends here at Le Mans. Also scared the living bejesus out of a lot of people with the mid midday train horn. That that we will miss as much as we will miss the sound and, of these cars. And and our, our friends over the years have been part of the, the, the Pratt & Miller Racing Organization, Corvette Racing, Doug Feehan particularly, who was the figurehead for a quarter of a century and more, and the Danny Binks and all the guys who were here through the early days of their AMS and uh, brought the cars back to the one time after time after time. 31 into the pits from third place. Okay. And that dropped it immediately down into fourth. Robin Fryens will stay in. I can't imagine Jellignite would get him out of that seat right now in the final 45 minutes. The race last year ended badly, didn't it? With an error at Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. Having won the year before, and that's the other side of the Le Mans 
point, of course, because for every, even Tom Christensen, for every win, there's been a year when you haven't won, although he's had a fair share of podium finishes as well. Yeah, it's uh, Tom's record, 18 starts, 4 DNFs, 14 uh, podiums, including the wins. Pretty decent uh, record Not for bad. that. Yeah, not bad at all. What goes through your mind are the board, the car and the garage at this stage, Guy? I suppose it depends where you're on the race. I mean, 2003, what was that like in the final hour? Well, I mean, I was lucky to be in the car for the final sort of hour and a half. So, um, as I said before to Martin, I think it's probably the best place to be because you're kind of preoccupied. You've got obviously to focus on driving the car, but um, at that point, it can only go wrong, really. So um, you obviously were just focusing on making sure you get the apexes, don't make any mistakes, and really just looking after the car because um, it really is the longest hour. I mean, for uh, for Alessandro Perguini now, it's just wanting to wish this next 40 minutes away because he just wants to get that Ferrari to the finish line in one piece. And in many ways, what we're watching here, this run for the last 40 minutes for Ferrari, not dissimilar to the run you had for Bentley, a famous make coming back after such a long time. And it's all on the line. <laughs> yeah, Bentley's gap was, was more than half a century, nearly three quarters of a century, so it was a, it was a long old time. You just saw Ben Keating there in the Corvette Racing Garage saying thanks and well done to the guys. Not all of those crew members, I'm sure, will be with us in Monza. I'm sure they've got extra crew who have come in here for the Le Mans 24-hour race. It's been a, a good partnership so far. And actually, if they finish on the top step of the podium here, they will be within sniffing distance of the championship title. It, it's going to depend on exactly what happens to the podium positions, but I think if my maths is correct, there will be a maximum of three teams in with a chance of winning the title. Um, and that's come particularly courtesy of the fact that a number of other uh, cars in the order haven't finished this race. Remember, for the WC points, as you watch the Ferrari uh, completing the lap, um, the cars that are not the WC entrants are effectively invisible. Louise Beckett. Just going past the 65 Canis Racing Garage and the car is in the garage. But what they are thinking to do is the same as, as Hertz Team Jota and go out for the last half an hour of the race just to finish it and get classified. All right, excellent. Well, if they've done enough laps up until now, as long as their final lap was in, is within... Two minutes of the lead of their class this time, something uh, like that. This, it's, there's, there's, there's now a, a final lap there is a uh, vector. Uh, maximum, and that yeah. came actually after Peugeot waited for the flag uh, with Semple Day in the first year of the 908 programme. That, by the way, is what caught out, but well, didn't catch up, what caught out the uh, Toyota in 2016 was the failure, but that's why that car was not classified, because they couldn't complete the final lap yeah. in the minimum time. You do 24, 24 hours and more, but if you don't make it to the checkered flag, Correct. you didn't start. Well, you don't finish. WRT's um, 41 is now on pit lane. Louis Teletraz comes in. He was about seven seconds back from the Inter Europol car. Inter Europol's penalty, by the way, ha was rescinded. Okay. So they came in and served that drive through. The penalty was rescinded, which is why they didn't come in and serve a penalty. So luckily, they didn't do the penalty first and the drive through uh, at the and the pit stop afterwards. They did the pit stop, argued, then had the penalty rescinded because once you've served it, you can't unserve it. Then they can't give you that 32 seconds back. Now we don't yet know what uh, we're going to see from WRT next season outside of Hypercar. We most certainly know that we're going to be seeing BMW with them as representatives for the factory. We don't like to see GT3 cars too, so this will be their final LMP2 pit stop at Le Mans. Let's get down into our GTE field again. GR Racing in podium contention. Let's hear from them. I'm with Ben Barker from the 86 GR Racing. We are 37 minutes remaining of this 24-hour race. You're currently running in third. This is tense. Very, very. Honestly, I don't want to speak too soon, but we've had uh, yeah, a bad race. Um, we had damage early on, and, and the guys did an amazing job to repair it. We were almost down two laps. We managed to get back onto the lead lap. But, um, yeah, now we're now we're going to third. So Ricky's just got to manage the gap. They're super close behind the Iron Dames, and um, we just got to hold off. Great, thank you. 
this by the way uh, with some news we saw earlier this week news that proved on competition the uh, dominant in terms of numbers at least uh, Porsche customer team in GTE Amos which it afford it leaves slots open for the GT3 cars we expect to see here next year and a good result here for GR Racing could secure the future for that team yeah, because they're racing Porsches now. Iron Lynx are racing Porsches now. No, the Iron they will, race, team will the, be racing yeah. Lamborghinis Correct. next year. That's their deal. So it does open the door open. Leave the door open you know, for maybe somebody out there, maybe somebody like Project One to be part of that. Maybe one and one. There's program. still a possibility that we may see two times one car for two teams rather than a two car team. And that could just fall nicely for Mike Wainwright and his very loyal crew. Final so, stop for the number 50 Ferrari. This car, as you can see, just slips down to sixth position as the better placed uh, number five Porsche goes by it. Phenomenal outlap, by the way, from Louis Delatraz. Louis Delatraz in the Team WRT 41 car chasing LMP2 leader Fabio Scherer. We have yet to see Sherrod being waved in. Cadillac number three will come in this lap. And there'll be a few more pit callers before the end of the race. I'm sure that you're going to get... Yeah, you, if you fill now, you'll get through. In 34 on pit lane. This is the critical pit stop, as is the third place Duquesne team. Come on. So, final two contenders. If this race finishes on pace in LMP2 on pit lane now, it's all about what fuel is needed and how quickly and how trouble free can it be done. Tire change as well on the 50 Ferrari there. They have nothing to lose and everything to gain. So Fabio Scherer, is he going to get out or is he going to stay in? <laughs> I'm more notes in the door of the garage. <laughs> oh, they've opened the door so you can see the notes, haven't they? Go, go, go. You'd think that maybe a team member, or they could, uh, I was going to say they could talk to him on radio. Of course, they can't talk to him on radio. That's why they're waving notes at him and holding the sticky tape boards out. Is what I made earlier. The most important pit stop in the history of this team. Yes, done. And we'll see when it clears the timing beam at the end of pit lane. Here comes the 41. What is the gap? Is, is the absolute definition of a family team. Father and son running it. Cooper Schmidt. Michowski is the young man whose dad, who runs into Europe, a huge bakery concern in Poland, had the money to start racing. They started in small sub LMP3 cars in V to V races, company LMS, and here they are looking to try and win the bond. It is the, the length of the pit straight is the gap, 33 minutes to go. There's a lot of very nervous Polish people there. The number five Porsche, why is that going so slowly? Why is that going so slowly? That's the number five car, Michael Christensen. He's got an issue. That is not racing speed out of a Mulsanne corner. That is racing speed out of Mulsanne corner. He was very low on fuel, wasn't he? Let's take a look at the energy. No, he's not. He's got two thirds of his energy left. So what's going on here? This is the sixth place car. Remember here, you've got to cross the line to finish this race. His next threat are the Glickenhaus cars behind, currently seventh and eighth. He is stuck in third gear. Is he stuck on the pit limiter for some reason? On the, on the, it's, he's doing 85, which it, the limiter should be 80. Yeah. He's 85 kilometers an hour. That's it, that, that's doing no RPM. Oh, that was, it was doing RPM though, wasn't it? It was doing sort of seven. Some Said Bourdais will stay aboard the car. Mm -hmm. Something loose and flappy in there, wasn't there? 11 seconds is the LMP2 lead gap. And look at the huge size of the lumps of rubber coagulating together that get thrown up into these cars. And that's what we talk about when we talk about the big lumps that get stuck on a tyre and it suddenly feels like the car is going to shake itself to, to pieces, Guy. 
that's the huge amount of, that you can run over without noticing, and suddenly the car is like vibrating to bits. Yeah, sometimes it sticks to the actual tire, it actually gets caught between the, uh, the, the, the tire itself and the wheel arch. Yeah. It can do all, all kinds of damage. Or, or, or get stuck inside the rim and becomes like an out of balance exactly. weight on your road car and shakes your fillings. Very, very slow, crawl back to the pit lane. This is really cruel for the Porsche Penske team. About to be caught, by the way, by the LMP2 battle. Yep, that's at the moment making its way down towards Indianapolis. There's the sister car, or one of the two sister cars, one already out the race. Half an hour to one side. side. There's the leading car in GTM behind two. It's the team's best placed car as well. Watch for the yellow and green into Europol car go by, then look for the red and white WRT car, which I think is around 10 seconds back. Here it goes. That was probably half a lap ago when he was crawling away from Mulsan Corner. And on the data, they will see what power has been transmitted to the wheels. There are data sensors on there. The FIA uh, will be monitoring them in real time on all of the driven axles of all of the cars in the hypercar class just to make sure that nobody's exceeding their power delivery limits. So the team should have that data as well. He's obviously, it sounds like, has got maybe only one wheel of rear wheel drive. The uh, LMDH hybrids, they produce their hybrid power and that is directed to the rear axle. So all the power goes through the wheel. That's it, this is second chicane. So you can see the engine was revving. He was fully lit going down into the second chicane, Anthony Davidson. Box of the neutrals, it seemed as he was trying to get on power. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I could see on the graphic as well when it came up, he, uh, he wasn't able to put any throttle down. As he's making very back, we're going to say a big thank you, by the way, to Guy Smith for his contribution yep. on this broadcast. He's going to leave. He's made a fulsome contribution to the centenary event. Got racing and road to the on the podium with his the, the so that was a while ago. <laughs> and uh, as a very valu valuable and uh, Welcome addition to this commentary team for the 2023 centenary edition of the Long 24 Hours. Hope we see you again soon. Absolutely. Behind the microphone and behind the wheel. Thank yep. you so much, Guy. Indeed. Safe journey home. And uh, good night's sleep as well when you get home At tonight. I think, I think everybody will get one of those. So 51 Ferrari must be on its way in. Number 8 Toyota will need to stop as well. Number 5 Porsche coming down pit lane and. 51 car will go around one more time. So Toyota will stop after the 51 car for its final stop. And we'll need to take on less fuel, which will take less time. Real question now for Porsche Penske team and Davidson is, can they fix whatever it is in 20 minutes to get it back out inside the final 10 to try and make it a finisher? Well, it was either drive shaft issue or gearbox issue. I'm going for gearbox. Seemed to happen on the upshift. You can hear from uh, Ben Keating. I'm with Ben Keating from the 33 Corvette. Ben, this is always a tense moment going into this final hour. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I've come radio. to expect this Noting from Nicky Katzberg radio. after the Noting race in Portimao, the race in Spa. Radio. It's hard for an old man's heart to watch Nicky Katzberg uh, in these races like this, but, uh, uh, but we've had a, a, a really crazy race, lots of ups and downs, so much drama, uh, you know, with the weather and, uh, you know, and just all over the place. I, I'm really grateful to be where we are right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, 30 minutes left to go, fingers crossed, uh, and, uh, yeah, there's a lot of emotion tied behind all of this, so we'll see. There is a lot of emotion, I can feel it and see it, um, and I'm, we were worried that we weren't going to be seeing you again, but you're just telling me now that you do intend to come back for Le Mans next year. It's my hope. Uh, yeah, I would really love to run 
in the Pro-Am class of LMP2. I run LMP2 in IMSA, uh, and because I did a full season of WEC, I did not use my automatic entry for LMP2 before. Uh, so uh, I'm hopeful that uh, they'll have me back uh, to run in an LMP2 car. Uh, I would love to do Le Mans for a 10th time in a row in nine different cars. That would be fun. That would be some record, and I think if anyone could do it, you can. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Arch enthusiast Ben Keating. Yeah, a 10th Le Mans entry in nine different kinds of cars and in two different classes as well, GTM and then LMP2 Pro-Am, but right now, let's hope that if they end up in about an hour's time standing on the podium as Victor Victor's in GTM, this time he gets to keep the trophy. Well, it'll be double winner uh, because 2022, of course, won the Tier Sports in the Aston Martin. But there are a record cool thing about that, uh, that figure, the uh, nine different cars who makes it back is he has not had the opportunity if he can get a, a drive in Orica at 07 because remarkably, this dominant car in LMP2, whilst he races it and wins in it in North America, he's never raced one here. So the door is open for that. Yeah, I think Keating's really been there. Uh, he's had such a solid performance here. Brilliant in qualifying, as I said earlier on. And uh, I think the thing that I'm most impressed by, not just with his efforts, but the whole team, was that never give up attitude. They had problems with the uh, suspension earlier on in the race and uh, they just put their foot down, got on with the job and Ben particularly, you know, brilliant effort to uh, to get that car right back up to the sharp end to lead this race as into the pit lane comes the car 51 with 5% energy remaining, you can see on the left hand side of your screen there. Yep. Inside the final 25 minutes, uh, good thought from my buddy Ken Childs watching in Durham, North Carolina, would it be the second time only a Garage 56 entry has finished Le Mans if the number 24 car finishes. Signaling went through car 34 in the signaling area under investigation. That's waving the bit of plastic out because they didn't have any radio. Uh, the answer is uh, Frederick Sose finished, I think. Is his... classified as a finisher? Yes, he was. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think the Academy car he put together finished. I'll check that. Okay which case possibly the third now you can see that all the pit boards are on sort of swivelly arm things so they swivel out of the way and that's a presumably a safety rule uh, you don't normally have somebody holding a pit board out anymore and uh, you saw the 34 team making a big plastic sort of name card from the top of the garage into a pit board for Fabio Scherer because he's lost his radio I would Sense that perhaps there might be a little fine. He's going to have to recycle the car, isn't it? This could be drama for Ferrari. Oh, no. but, uh, it happened before. The engine refused to stop about four hours ago, refused to start again, and they had to go through a power cycle. At that time, I think it was also Alessandro Pierre Guidi. You can hear his engineer very calmly giving him the instructions. It's right there in front of you. Do this, do that. Wait there, said so, Okay, lights are on. Is anybody home? Yes, they are. Okay. So twice in this morning, early afternoon, or the af early afternoon and uh, mid afternoon now, the car, yeah, heart in the mouth moment at Toyota. Damn it, they're saying. But the yeah, HSA are large, by the way. Yeah. Okay, just a moment of worry there. Now they've had two or three. <laughs> James Gallardo can't bear it. It's they've had two or three. Absolutely no drama pit stops since then. No drama at all. Fired up, boom, gone. And now it's done it again. Louise Beckett. I'm just looking at that picture of James Collado now and think, I've seen that about three times before here, but when he's been in GT and most of the time it's turned out okay and he's won, but uh, just that picture of his head in his hands. Yeah, that's a very, <laughs> it's, a, it's a not, and again, as Guy Smith said, and again, Ant Davidson will be the same. When you are in the garage, powerless, and just watching and waiting for the axe to fall. That must be a pretty tough deal. Now then, nose cone being moved in the Ferrari garage. I don't think that's to make room for the dancing and celebrating. Final pit stop by the way underway. Oh, 
on pit road rather for the number two Cadillac. Looks at the moment in third place and not threatened on pace from behind. Uh, LMP2, by the way, uh, Fabio Scherer is pulling away from Rio de la Traz, but we have that pit signaling under investigation. The method of pit signaling, which we saw, was racer tape spelling out a message with no radio for the 34, uh, getting him to box, and also a team member over the uh, with arms over the wall trying to signal how many laps to pit. Yeah, I'd have to check about the regulations. This this stage, <laughs> lap of the gods. Yeah, that, that would be extraordinarily hard to really really receive a real penalty for that, particularly given that it's not just a car trying to finish the race, it's about the victory in the class. In the uh, P2 cars you do have, or any car, you have meetings, lots of meetings prior to the race. You know full well when you have the fuel warning light coming on, you know full well at which point on the circuit, if it comes on there, you have to box. If it comes on in another place on a track, you're okay to carry oh! on. It's 7.09, 7.09. It's, yeah, 7.08 is in the pit lane, Olivier Platt, that car, 7.09 is in seventh place. And the car behind it, the eighth place, number five, Porsche, also chicane, in the pit lane. Again. This first chicane. I mean, it's bone dry and it's still catching out cars. It's always a tricky one, that first chicane, because you're braking, turning into the right, and then you carry on braking as you turn the car left, and that change of uh, body roll in the car really doesn't like it. You come from such high speed, of course, down the Mulsanne straight. Yeah. Now he's completely beached that car, won't be able to reverse out of it. He's going to need external help. He is, and we've got under 20 minutes to go. By the way, the sister car, just before it uh, pitted, had gone up to sixth place because of the issue for the number five, Porsche Penske Motorsport 963. So the lead car, the full season car, so no eight is in sixth. The seventh place car, remember, to retain any finishing position, you have to cross the line. Yeah. Well, he's in a position where they can easily push him back and put him onto terra firma relatively easily and relatively quickly. I think, yeah, I think he's going to need a lift. Toyota team are on their feet. They will be ready, I don't think this lap, for the number eight Toyota Gazoo racing entry, but maybe the next lap. Antonio Giovinazzi there. James Collado sitting, waiting, watching. How many GT wins have they had? Collado, Pierre Guidi? Uh, here? Mm. I'd have to go and check. Um, I'd have to go and check what as a, well. One other very uh, quick thing to, to mention is GR Racing and Hans Ricardo Pera is gradually edging away from the Iron Dames in that final podium position. The gap is growing very slightly. It's out to seven seconds now. Rahal Fry was taking time out to him. Well, there you go. Call me a liar. Number eight car comes down pit road. Yeah, see, I didn't think they needed to come in now. 13% would have taken him round at least another lap. But in they come. 709 Glickenhaus. Well. Guys, I think they might have come in because the uh, there's a full course here. Yeah. The um, slow zone exactly. is about to come out. Exactly right. So you might as well do the pit stop now in hope that uh, it won't be there by the time you get back out, but I'm pretty sure it will be. Another one of those racing vision tear-off visors being peeled off the windscreen. And the answer, by the way, more. about James Collado and Alessandro Piergridi uh, for uh, wins here in GT Pro. The answer is um, Collado has two wins in 2019 and 2021 and three second places. Wow. Uh, Alessandro Piergridi um, has the two wins and two second places. Okay. In GT Pro, which ceased to be part of the championship at the end of last season, so they took the final title as well, the third of their championship titles as a duo. And of course, winning them all with double points, 50 points for victory here, that never hurts your championship campaign. Number eight team is done. 17 minutes to go in the centenary at Le Mans. Martin Haven, Graham Goodwin. Anthony Davidson. Well, they didn't go down without a fight, did they, Toyota? And I think that's what uh, has impressed me the most with them, their efforts this race here at the centenary event at Le Mans. They were, they were, you know, fighting right to the end. We're still 16 minutes still to go, of course, but I mean, in terms of pure performance, it was very evenly matched with Ferrari. And 
to the point where they had to both push themselves into uncomfortable territory, I'd say. I completely agree. Um, I think that's what's defined this race. Yeah, I think that's, you know, it, it, it pushed both driver and machine right over the limit at points. And uh, yeah, like I say, massively uncomfortable and something was going to give. I had the feeling something was going to give. They were, they were trading fastest laps all the time. Uh, it was at the time it was uh, Brendan Hartley uh, versus uh, Giovinazzi. And it, you just felt like you were going to meet boiling point. And uh, yeah, it was Rio when he got in the car, warned by Brendan Hartley that the rear end was very unstable, had to be careful with the saturation of the brakes and how it was too much on the rear end. He couldn't do anything about it. Uh, there were clearly, it was clearly the Achilles heel of that car, this whole race, or pretty much the whole race, warned by Brendan, but still the rear locked up into Arnage and, uh, and that effectively cost them the, uh, the chance to take the fight and went in to the, the dying seconds of this race. Of course, Cadillac racing in third before we try to have those sounds of America, we like to have this sound of America, Awful lot of fans saying the only reason they've been able to stay awake through the night is that every four minutes there's a thundering V8 alarm clock comes, comes rolling by. I'm delighted also to have had on the team another voice of American Motors, Paul Jim Lowell. It's, I hope it's not been a disappointing race for your return to the Oh, heavens no. This has been fantastic. This has been everything I'd hoped it would be. Uh, it has been absolutely wonderful. Finally see these hyper cars in person and Anthony summed it up greatly. I mean, this is, uh, came down to the final uh, 45 minutes. You can't ask for more than that. They, maybe they'll be second-guessed about maybe who should have finished the race for uh, for Toyota, but I'll leave that to, to other people. There's a happy man right yep. there. And you're going to uh, have two American-class winning cars. Yeah, that's right. That might be a first. Yeah, With the Corvette winning in GTM, at least at the moment, and the Hendrick Motorsport Chevy Camaro winning in the Invitational class. OK, well, I feel win, the one, but, win, you know, winning, winning popular opinion. Well, that, absolutely. <laughs> winning hearts and minds yeah, in, exactly. and, uh, in a huge number. And I mean, not saying that they have one yet. I mean, if, if anyone knows better than anybody else, it's me. If you don't know what I'm talking about, YouTube 2016 Toyota, then you'll know. Uh, literally the last lap of the race we were in the lead by a minute and a half and we didn't win um, so I'm not saying that Ferrari have one but if they were to win then you want to beat the best you don't want it handed to you this race hasn't been handed to them they've had the speed they were on pole position as front row lockout they haven't made strategical errors they've been right on the money all the time all the way through this race all the drivers driven brilliantly well one little error from Pierre Guidi in the night, but that I forgive him because there was a spinning car in front of him in that first chicane. So he's, he was actually one of the pivotal moments of the race where he really got that car into the lead and, and excelled. Uh, and you want to beat the best. That's the thing, Toyota are the best. They're leading the World Championship. We've had three races, they're leading the World Championship, and they come here with the target on their back. And when you stand on that top step of the podium, you want to look over your shoulder and know that the best is standing next to you, and on that day, you were better. I completely agree. You've taken some of the words out of my mouth on this one. The best thing about this race will come to the events uh, in due course is it's not been easy to win. It would have been, it's been very easy to lose for some people, but it's not been easy to win. The depth of, of competition, the scale of that competition. Um, this is uh, the 31 WRT car, the third place car. As he lost the third place, it was coming through a garage. It was a WRT that yes, was coming through a garage. Problem it's problem identified the colour. So have they got a braking issue or a clutch issue? It looked like they were working on a steering rack issue. It looked like they were working on the master cylinder. To okay, go through into a podium position. And that's all this. Right. You saw the excitement and the, and the no, 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 don't, no, don't yet. Don't yet. Everybody's not, don't holding yet. their breath. But the final thing, it, it, it is thrown incident and it's thrown drama and it's thrown fantastic racing and uncertainty at us. Lap after lap after lap after lap after lap. This is truly a worthy race for a centenary. And Jim Roller, it's been an epically talented field. In the hypercar class, you can't possibly fault the choice of any of the drivers in the cars. No. In GTM, in, G in LMP2 as well, it's just been such hard, close racing. 
last trip here was 2019 before COVID, and in the intervening years, I have seen an improvement in the GTE and category, and, and it really showed in this event, not only with the way uh, Ben Keating qualified the car, but the way that team came back, the great battle with the uh, 25 car and the 85 car. Uh, we, I've enjoyed the, the Ben Keating, Sarah Bovey um, battle all season long in, in the bronze category. But Ferrari is going to, uh, in 11 minutes, they hope, they have fingers crossed, that they will, will gather finally their 10th victory at this great race. And that is, uh, that's a milestone that, that they can hold proudly. That's a massive result for Ferrari. It's a massive result for this rule set. It's a massive result for the 24 hours of Le Mans. Ferrari are back in the top class and in winning form. We said after Hyderpole, that uh, that would be a news item that would be in timelines yeah. that otherwise we'd never have seen anything about this. The and boy, are we going to get another one. The only manufacturers that have won more, Porsche and Audi. Yep. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I mean, yeah. again, it's one of those things that happens in life that if you wrote it in the script, yeah, they come back up for 50 years and they win one of the toughest races on record. Oh, okay, that's a bit far-fetched. Can you just put a bit more jeopardy in there, a few more failures? Listen, from day one, we knew that they had potential. We went to Sebring and they shook Toyota, I mean, genuinely shook Toyota by taking pole position. Then Toyota fought back and took the race win. They won two in Portimao, they won in spa from Cachon. But there's been a Ferrari on the podium at every race. And they started, they returned to Le Mans with pole position in the Hyperpole, with a front row lockout. How much of that was just sprint race pace? How long would the cars last? Well, the answer is they've traded blows with everyone around them, slugged it out, and they are still standing at the top of the pile. And as a team as well, we kept saying they were a test team when they arrived in Sebring. They'd done a lot of kilometers in testing. Obviously, as a new team, you're allowed to do more testing miles than an established team like the likes of Toyota. Uh, but still, you're not a race team. This race is the first time I've seen them be a race team. Take it easy, take it easy. No need to push. Slow laps are good. You guys are. I've, uh, I have heard a long time off. Yep. Nine minutes to go, and uh, we're closing in on history. 1973, the last time a factory Ferrari team entered here. 1965, the last time a Ferrari factory team. And rinse yep. and the Ferrari 250 LM. I was one year old. <laughs> I was minus 20. Uh, <laughs> 38 team, Hertz Team Jota coming out, as is the number five Porsche, ready for the final lap. 94 Peugeot should leave the pit lane now as well. They're going to need to find some pace to make sure that they are classified as finishers. DKR have finished their final pit stop. Looks as though the number five Porsche, unless it leaves, is not going to make it. Well, those two guys, their teammates, Rio Hirokawa, they know what it takes to win Le Mans. They've done it plenty of times. Looks right now as if it may not be their turn. For info, if we do three minute 38 lap times, we reduce one lap from the race. Mm. Okay. That and seems like more do, of an order than a message. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. That seems like the, definitely the right thing to do. Yes. If you do 3 minute 35s, so we have to do another whole lap, and we may not want to do that. So just, yeah, lift and coast, lift and coast. Not necessarily go slowly, not lose your focus, just lift and coast. So Ferrari 51 leads from the number 8 Toyota Kazoo Racing car. That is the line now for what should be the anti-penultimate anti time. Cadillac Racing's number two car at the moment, completing the overall podium positions in the classes into Europol, 16.3 seconds ahead of Team WRT <laughs> and Duquesne team. That's what it means to Albert Costa. Yeah, focusing on the phone. Don't think about it, don't Absolutely. look at it, wait for it to happen. Yeah, the problem is that the uh, internal combustion engine doesn't know there are six minutes remaining. <laughs> no. The gearbox doesn't know there are six minutes remaining. It doesn't know what time is. 
doesn't live by time. It and just does its thing, and when it breaks, it can break. And 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 the, and it, it's going to be okay. <laughs> it's going to be it? okay. <laughs> and in the interview of Paul Carr, because right? he's not got a radio, yeah. Fabio Sherrod has not got that much time. Right. He's got you're absolutely right. But that is right. This, that, how many times do we have to have this race throw drama at us um, before we stop making assumptions? That's why I'm calling it as I see it at the moment. In GTM, it's this car. Kind of magnificent run from the Corvette racing team all season to this point. Double points for the WEC, that's less important right now to Ben Keating is watching the TV uh, and the, the, uh, the, the car tracker. They are way ahead of the ORT by TF Aston Martin, John Eastwood uh, looking to bring the 25 car home. What a day for the tiny nation of Oman. Six like minutes. any uh, like any Gen Zs would be doing, just go straight to the phone. If you Absolutely. want to preoccupy yourself, straight to the mobile what phone. What did drivers do before there was Twitter and and, and 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 TikTok to watch and WhatsApp? You know, what did you do when you didn't have a phone to distract? You couldn't it's do anything. To focus we were on, it? we were stressing like Ben Keating. Here, here's what we were doing. They, they paced and they went out back and smoked a cigarette. Yeah. 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 <laughs> this we were is like the... Ben Keating. Uh, no, this is how the youngins do it. Just this go straight to the mobile phone. This is how difficult this race was. Three safety car periods. Three hours under safety car and lots of full course yellow as well. Ben Keating is just all over this, isn't he? Yeah. Before we forget the final podium position at the moment in the hands of GR Racing, they have fought for that position all day, all night, and all day again. Uh, Mike Wainwright, Ricardo Parrott, who's at the wheel of the car at the moment, and Ben Barker winning a battle, and it, boy, was it a battle with the Iron Dames, yeah. uh, with five minutes to go. And it is, yeah, that's going to be a tough break from the Iron Dames. They've been in contention for a podium here at Le Mans all the way through the race. They've led, they've been in the top three, they've been in the top six, always on the lead lap, and just to miss out by 10 seconds, that's going to be a tough one. For many, many years, uh, one of the most popular sporting shows in America was ABC Wide World of Sports, and its famous opening was the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Well, I don't think I have seen in a, a long time a better picture that shows agony of defeat than the look in poor Brendan Hartley's eyes just moments ago. Well, that we was, saw, we that, saw, that saw was Michelle Gatting as well, very yes. red-eyed in the Iron Dames garage when it seemed that they were going to lose that podium spot yeah. that they've been fighting so hard for for the last few years. But just finishing this race, you're a winner. I know that sounds like... You know, it, it does sound trite, but, but it's boy, not. this is it's one of the not. toughest things you'll ever do in sport. And, and I learned that the first time I, in 2000, when uh, uh, when I, for my first time back after my, my uh, since 1995, and it to see the teams that may have finished fifth or sixth, but had fought back from great adversity or, or a crash to finish the race. They were just as emotional and joyous at the end of the race as the winners. Yeah, I think it, it gets to that point, doesn't it? Where if you're in contention for a win, of course it's going to hurt, but there's a point for many of these teams where the objective has become get it home. Last lap for the 2023, 24 hours of Le Mans. Alessandro Pierre Guidi on, I'm sure, what be, will be a phenomenally emotional tour of the Circuit de la Sarthe. 12.626 kilometers to take it all. The glory, the headlines, but most of all, the win at this great race. And what a race it has been. In depth, look at the tribunes, absolutely rammed. But how many of these cars have actually won? Martin Avon, bring them home. 24 hours ago, everyone was a winner. One of the busiest grids I've ever seen in motorsport, and what looked like one of the most relaxed everybody excited just to start the Centenary Le Mans to be part of a packed field of talent in GTEM, in LMP2, and especially in this burgeoning hypercar class. And for everybody, a capacity audience of more than 300,000, the celebrations that had built up to it, it was just a big party waiting for the starting signal. And 24 hours later, Quite incredible history is going to be written here again at Le Mans. The last time a factory entered Ferrari, raced in the 24 hours, it finished in second place 50 years ago. 50 years later, the team again started from pole position. They are on the final lap of this epic voyage. 
car rolled out less than 12 months ago, beginning the physical part of this development program of the 499P. And the Ferrari AF Corsa team have worked relentlessly since, testing, formatting, homologating the car, and then bringing it to America, taking it to Sebring to start the FIA World Endurance Championship season. Ferrari, Cadillac, Porsche, Glickenhaus, and Floyd Van Wall came here to take on the established benchmarks, the multiple winners, the five-time consecutive Le Mans winners, Toyota Gazoo Racing. And they all had a chance to lead. Almost every car in hypercar at some stage led the race. Toyota lost a car early. Ferrari lost a car early in the night time. Peugeot and Porsche struggled more perhaps than would seem fair. But in the end, one team only can come away with victory. And incredibly, it seems that Ferrari will complete that fairy tale story. Half the history of this race has gone by without Ferrari, one of its most successful marks. And when they return, they have got two GT multiple world champions in the car, and they are going to end up with victory here at Le Mans. And we will have three different hypercar brands on the podium. Ferrari, Victors, Toyota taking second, and Cadillac Racing in third position. As the clock reaches four o'clock Central European summer time on Sunday in Le Mans, it is going to be victory in the centenary race for 51 Ferrari AF Corsa. And it is Alessandro Pierre Guidi, I'm sure in floods of tears, who takes the checkered flag. What an enormous moment for the team for Ferrari fans across the globe and for that trio of drivers. Ferrari wins Le Mans. Ale, we won Le Mans! <laughs> astonishing, astonishing race in the LMP2 class. The first ever Polish winners into Europe. Fabio Scherer, who had his foot run over by the Corvette early in the race, has hopped in and out of the car and with his teammates have brought this tiny, literally family-owned and populated team to the very highest accolade in their division of the sport. Into Europe competition, win LMP2 from WRT with Duquesne in third place. A huge result for that small French team. But look at this, just can't believe the celebrations. Toyota Gazoo Racing, Rio Hirokawa will bring the number eight car to the line in second place, ahead of the numbers two and three Cadillacs. And Corvette Racing will claim victory. Ali, oh my God, man, I have no words. Thank you, everyone. We are back. 50 years, we are back. That will be clipped up and across social media while the caption is still on air. Antonio Giovinazzi, Ferrari have won Le Mans outright. How does that sound to you? You've all worked so hard. Uh, yeah, yeah, really emotional. Uh, I have no word to be honest, you know. It's, uh, I dreamed this since I was a kid. Now I'm here with Ferrari winning Le Mans. It's uh, just a special day. I've got goosebumps, so I just cannot imagine how you feel. Luis Beckett there in the throng of a very Italian party. And Cadillac Racing, what a result for these guys. Set a third and fourth for the number two and the number three cars. 3-1-1, three, one, one, the Action Express car also running. They get all three cars to the line. What a great effort and great for GM. Great for Corvette Racing, their final one in this format. And great for Ben Keating. He wins again as Nicky Katzberg brings the car across the line. Fabulous stuff, yeah. isn't it, from this effort? Uh, third place, by the way, secured after a late run. Uh, Trying to get to the back of the GR Racing team. Five seconds short, though, it will be GR Racing behind the RT by TF. And this is our LMP2 Pro Am winner. Yeah. So, Pro Am victory going to Algarve Pro. Colin Brown bringing a car to the line. Back 
congratulations to those guys again a small team yeah colin coming back after his last appearance here in 2008 colin Tracy brown uh, a week ago let a lady switch seats with the lady on the airplane because she was afraid of flying backwards. And I told him when he did it, I said, you know, we're going to get some good karma next weekend. <laughs> there you go. There you go, man. What a sight. This car, when it, when it rolled out at C-Ring, looked like a race car. And boy, has it behaved like one. Jakob Skomosti, 34, is the LMP2 Le Mans winner. That is just incredible for you to achieve. Yeah, I mean... It's just incredible, as you say. Uh, it's a dream come true, and I think it's all what we, we've worked for for the past years. And it's uh, it's just I'm just speechless that it happened. Really speechless. I'm so happy for you, Alba Costa, to joining the team this year, and wow, it's paid off. They call me the the oldest rookie of the championship. I'm rookie. I won I won the match now. But I can say I'm lost the words. This is amazing. I'm well done. <laughs> My dad. Oh, I'll go and let you see your tea, your family. Well done. Can be a huge number of tears here. That tiny team into Europol, they've barely been racing for 10 years. They have started in regional sports car racing in Europe and it has grown and grown through the entire ACO ladder from the Michelin Le Mans Cup in LMP3, they moved into LMP2, and then they have moved into the World Championship, and Chip Ganassi gets a car on the podium at Le Mans, and Eddie. that's something that he will remember a very long time. And he gets one over on his old friend. <laughs> yes, he uh, The two Peugeots, by the way, how much better did they do than we thought they would coming yeah. into this race. Yeah. The other quick thing, uh, it, it is the first Polish team to ever win a class um, at Le Mans. And uh, you're right, family-owned team, very proud indeed. Quick thought for our friend Martin Carter Fleming, who pl played a great big part yeah. in the uh, development of this team. And this, by the way, is only their second ever race win in LMP2. Wow. The first fantastic. came earlier this year in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, fantastic for them. Hi to Cara and uh, our thoughts as well. And uh, great thanks for more than a quarter of a century of helping us out, helping me out particularly to Great Fiona Miller, who has just finished, or will finish later this evening, her last Le Mans. But there, James Collado, he's been in Vichy Circle, he's been on the podium, he's never been the first one out. It's not it like this. this. Not like Antonio this. Caneta, the man behind this effort, the man that's uh, been tasked with delivering this, and I'm sure for arguing with what's been required to make it tick. And Charles Leclerc in there somewhere, enjoying the delights of a very different Ferrari team claiming victory. Is it a thing? And by the way, we also saw the Garage 24, the innovative entry, Hendrix Motorsports, their NASCAR Generation 7 Camaro, the boogity, boogity, boogity made it all the way through. They might have had to have rebuilt the tranny, but you know, what's an American classic car if you don't have to rebuild the, the tranny? tranny. Okay, so there you go. I, I, may ne I may never forgive you for a boogity, boogity. <laughs> that wasn't my fault, but I, I'm, I'm taking that. That was. Uh, that was a, a great, great addition to the field this year. Let's hear from Toyota Gazoo Racing. Kamiri Kobayashi, that was one hard Le Mans. Yep, yeah, obviously, yes. Uh, I think we did everything we could do. I think we did a great job, amazing job. Unfortunately, we, I think we have not enough pace to the race. And Micah also had a very bad luck during the race. It was not our day, but uh, definitely we will come back strong. And I think the team this time made really strong. Everybody be together to only one goal to winning. And really thanks all the team, all the effort from Japan, from Cologne. And of course, uh, Mr. Toyota-san, Morizo-san. Our president Sato-san back in Japan. Yeah, and uh, this time uh, our grandfather, highway grandfather, Uchiyama-san came as well. It's really shame we couldn't win, but uh, yeah, I think we have become strong. Thank you. Thank you. What's it going to be like in Marinello on 
oh. St. Tuesday when these guys show up with the trophy. I was going to say it's walk been into quiet the quiet walk into the still be recovering from their hangovers. Walk into the Formula One shop. Put that bad boy up there. Kind of yeah. Rub on it with their sleeve. Well, and, and the deal there you is, go, fellas. The deal Beat is, that. of course, that it's not your standard 24-hour trophy. It will be oh, a yeah. unique trophy. The Centenary Trophy will be very different. They will get their own personal Le Mans 24-hour replica trophies. What a what a wonderful moment for for fans of motor racing everywhere. Ferrari is such an evocative name. They've been part of the sport. Really, you know, since the post-war years, they've been just the, one of the dominant names in the sport. And to take victory at Le Mans, and, and not just in a single car field or, a, you know, with no opposition, in one of the toughest races in years and years and years. And actually, to, to my great delight, that's what the centenary race will be remembered for. Yes, all the fun and all the show and the old cars and getting great names back here and, and, and all of that. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But in the end, we will remember this as, wow, do you remember that race when Ferrari came back? Wow, that was, we said at the beginning, this could be one for the ages. It was. I don't think we quite believed it, did we? I don't think we quite believed how good this could be. The greatest thing about this race, it's not the Ferrari that won it, it's that Ferrari had to fight for it. Yep. And then we've had right. great winners in this race, but great losers as well, uh, and in depth. And what we've seen through the last 24 hours on this fable track is ample evidence that there's more and better still to come. And the fact of it, Jim, is that Toyota could have won it easily. Cadillac could have won it easily. Porsche on pace could have won it easily. Porsche, Porsche could have won it easily. Jota. You know what I mean? Yes. First in Jota. Actually, probably Glickenhaus couldn't. Probably, almost certainly, Floyd Van Wall didn't have the pace and longevity. But the five big hitters, they all led, and they could all have been on the top spot. They all had the their chance. shows these guys. That's right. And you, you said that at the beginning of the show. It isn't necessarily uh, on paper who's going to be best. It's who does Le Mans choose. Yep. And Lady Luck has shined down. And, and, there, there's, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this is a lucky win. But the difference between hero and second and possibly third. Look at that. Well, the difference between fire. 51 and 50 yeah. is zero. Other than one Lady problem. Luck, that's right. The one shows 51. One, one problem, that's right. That's all it is. In, in a class that is now dominated by factory entries, I can barely believe we're saying that. Um, <laughs> all of them have got headlines they can take home and justify this. <laughs> all of them. Yeah. Glickenhaus bring home a headline that says, We are still 100% top 10. The Mon finishes with every car we've ever entered. entered. There is one entry and one entry only that ends without a headline they'd like to write, and that is the seven of the four car. But uh, Hertz Team Jota won, could have won this race. Well, they could have won the this race. They do hold the record for most starts without finishing. In there you go, absolutely right. And the fastest lap of the race that went to Antonio Fuoco in the number 50 Ferrari. The the Toyota number eight, that had the fastest time in the first sector of the race, but the fastest time in sector two and sector three. Both went to Antonio Foco in the 50 car. But for now, it is all about three men and one car. Antonio Giovinazzi, you can see. James Collado will get in the other door. So the check of flag. Pierre Guidi. How many years do you think he aged while he was busy controlling, deleting in the final pit stop? in the final half oh an hour. Oh my god. Look oh. at those images. Look at the stand. The shot of Collado just with his face yeah. in his hands. It's, yeah. Look, this is back to the absolute zenith of Group C, but there are more grandstand seats and there is more standing area on the straight. I can remember watching the beginning and the end of the race, Jaguar versus Porsche versus Mercedes, all of that. It was like that. It was shoulder to shoulder. It was elbow to elbow. But there is more here. There are more facilities now than ever before. There's more viewing. There's more you know, toilet blocks. There's more showers. There's more catering. There's more everything. It's a better event. It's a better than, event. Yeah, more than 300,000. Getting off for 350,000 people watching this. And that's aside from 
all the caterers, all the security staff, all the people working in franchises and shops and uh, everything else, and all the VIP guests. And a worldwide audience. Yeah, and that's, that's before we even turn on the, the TV cameras. Yeah, just, just the crowd here alone justifies this as one of the greatest Le Mans races ever. I just had to check for 10 seconds to just clear up one last thing in the box because there was one last investigation we had called. That was the interior report investigation, uh, and that's uh, for the pit board reprimand. Yep. The, the result will stand. It, it, it would have been beyond reckless, cruel, and heartless to have done anything other than say, guys, we know why you did it. You can see all the other pit boards, they're all firmly fixed, they can't be dropped in the track, they can't be, they can't come out and they hit a car. Something handheld and loose and what we could do. So for safety reasons, that's why it's not done any longer the old manual way. And probably that's not a bad thing, but yes, we understand why it happened. In the same way that when you go off track to avoid a much slower car and avoid an accident, you know it's not legal, but we know why you did it, so you only get a red card. And there is Matty Pregliasco, a man who has been instrumental in so much success for AF Corsa and Ferrari in the GT categories. And now, good lord, wins Le Mans outright with this team of young men and this car. Yep, a Ferrari race driver himself back at the beginning of the century, Barty, and I'm sure he could not be more proud of what he's <laughs> been a part of here. Extraordinary well, scene. Now then, three-time GT Pro World Champions, James Calado and Alessandro Pueguidi, and they have just added 50 fat points to their championship. Could they also win the title? <laughs> OK, that's a long way away. We've got three more long races to go. And right now, they don't care but when they rock up to Monza. And by the way, if you can get a ticket for Monza still, come to Monza. Can you just imagine? Question for Graham. What is the status of the 33 in the championship? The uh, victory not, here. I need to do crunch, it. I need to crunch, uh, crunch the points, but they're very close. They can certainly clinch it at Monza and they came pretty close to doing it here. They have got a massive, massive lead. 325,000 people were here to watch this. That is the official crowd figure. And again, 3,000 marshals around the circuit. Thank you to every single one of them. Thank you to all of the organising staff, the security staff, the people who checked us in and out when we were coming in and out of the circuit, the people who looked after everybody on the campsites, the people who have been supplying food and drinks to everybody, to our caterers. And actually, closer to home, just want to say so much, as ever, thanks to AMP Visual, without whom this would have been a radio show that only we would have heard. There would have been no pictures, no video, no audio. And to Alcamel Systems as well. Alcamel celebrating their 20th anniversary. They provided graphics for the World Endurance Championship and for the ACO all the way through. And they work constantly to improve what we can show you at home. And we will continue to do that. Everything at the moment, everybody is looking to improve and they do year by year, and we will try and keep pace with that and do the same. So thanks to all of our partners, to the championship partners as well, the tyre suppliers like Michelin and Goodyear, to Total Energies who've supplied the renewable fuels, not just for all the cars racing here, but also for all the tyre heaters here as well. That fuel has been supplied, sustainable fuel free of charge. There's Nicky Katzberg, may possibly wear a cowboy hat with pride again, I think, as he celebrates victory in the 33 car. There you go. And the shades. There are your overall winners, and you can see in the green and yellow overalls the guys from Inter Europol as well. I mean, many men who have proudly waved the prancing horse of the Scuderia on the top step of the podium. These are just the latest three to be able to do that. And in this particular branch of the sport, it's been a 50-year hiatus. That's a long wait by anybody's standards. 
as for LMP2. Uh, Manley's first year in LMP2 on the Costa, moving over from his Lamborghini GT3 career. A man who had his foot run over by another class winner <laughs> and a baker from Poland. Uh, yes. That is quite the fairy tale story. Kubisz Michowski, the baker's boy. And there are the marshals applauding the fans, the fans applauding the marshals, and rightly so. And again, um, you know, every time we've been out and about in the paddock and in the village and around the circuit, it's just been joyful. It's been beautiful weather, really scorching hot weather all week, actually, until race weekend. Uh, so the fans have had the best of everything here, an exciting race, fantastic atmosphere, and uh, a few really, really astonishing results. Got to spare a thought for the crew of the Iron Dames Porsche. How far behind in the end? Just five, seconds. five seconds after 24 hours off the podium, and that is a tough, tough one to take. They will come back, and they will win. They are good enough, they will do it. Ferrari victorious in the Centenary Le Mans. Toyota Gazoo Racing, car number eight, the defending champions take second. Cadillac third and fourth. And then a second Ferrari ahead of the pair of Glickenhouses, the better of the Peugeots, in eighth position. And in the end, we only lost permanently two of our hypercar entries. Of our 62 starters, 40 made it to the finish line, including much delayed Hertz Team Jota car, the final car to be classified in the Centenary Le Mans. There will be a very great deal of high-fiving, hugging, celebrating going on. Ford rolls in the gravel traps, yeah, why not? Kids running wild, yeah, why not? All the gates have been open. What the organisers want more than anything else is for a sea of humanity that can't be beaten underneath the podium. And surely they're going to get it. And we've missed that, haven't we, through the COVID years? I was going to say, that's the thing you took the words right out of my mouth, that sea of humanity is the classic Le Mans shot. This is what it's all about. As Don Paino said when he founded the American Le Mans series in a quarter of a century ago, for the fans, that's why they do it. That's why the teams come, that's why the manufacturers come. They come for the glory, but the glory helps them sell cars. It helps boost their image. That's why they're here. For some manufacturers, they've been doing it since day one. You think of Porsche. For some, they've been doing it for more than most of them can remember. You think of Toyota. And Ferrari, well, they haven't done this for a while. There you go, there come the gates. Come on in, kids, bring the flags. Fans of all ages here. So great to see so many. And again, because of the centenary, I'm sure even more people made even more effort to make it a family holiday, to bring friends, to bring new friends, to convert more this glorious, slightly crazy, what we're talking about, utterly bonkers form of motorsport. I've been here with my kid, I'm here this year with my kid, yep. and uh, close to 30 years difference between when we turned up here in 1995 and this centenary year, and the emotions are still the same. Mm, absolutely. It is still, and always will be, an absolutely world-class motor race and a world-class event, a, an event on a scale not very easily matched around the planet and the storylines they start now they're going to take a while for the ladies and gentlemen the press room and the broadcast edit suites to put together but they include of course that's a win for ferrari uh, two of the men that have taken this win are now winners in two separate classes including the overall tom christensen and charles leclerc there and you can see our guys filming for the All Access programmes, which will be out in around 10 days. Boy, that's... If you thought Le Mans was sleepless, wait till, you try, wait till you try editing Le Mans and all of the different backroom footage you get into 40 minutes. That's a sleepless 10 days, my friends. That's a sleepless 10 days. Before we forget, uh, because we're going to get into the ceremonials of this quite correctly very soon, if you're a first-timer watching the Le Mans 24 hours and you've enjoyed this racing, guess what? We do a lot more of it, and we'll be racing again next month. Um, and it's going to be a quiet provincial circuit where there's going to be no excitement <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, just outside Milan, Monza. 
yeah. greeting their Le Mans winners. Oh my gosh, what is that going to be like? Well, we said in qualifying that pole position surely would have put another 25,000 on the ticket sales. I, I don't even want to think about it, Martin. No, I know. <laughs> Ferrari, Ferrari told us that the ticket sales are up fivefold on last year. That was before qualifying. And that was before qualifying. I, I, yeah. It's, it's going to be a sea of humanity, and most of it wearing red. I cannot wait. Elsie <sighs> Jacobson there with Ben Keating in the middle. Uh, Nicolas Pierre with his back to us at that point. Yeah, Martin, the second place car in the Pro-Am category. Yeah. So we have four podiums to get through. GTE Am and LMP2 Pro-Am, LMP2 and that car. Like the Invitational car does not get a podium. What they do get, though, is 325,000 big, broad smiles and a huge thank you for bringing that Chevy Camaro Gen 7 Cup car to a whole different audience. There will be people here, of course, who know about NASCAR, who probably are passionate about NASCAR, about many other forms of motorsport. And there'll be a whole bunch who never really gave it a second thought, but who have been noisily and excitingly converted to the possibility that going round on an oval in a pack of 40 plus cars might actually be really quite entertaining and dead hard work and all that. President of the ACO, Pierre Fion on the right hand side there, Fred Lacan in the blazer who runs the FIA World Endurance Championship. You saw Charles Leclerc there as well, greeting fellow Marinello representatives in that podium room. And one of the great joys about Le Mans, because it's a team sport, is you don't get that staircase of awkwardness and the pre-podium room of awkwardness that you see so often in Formula One with two or three drivers who may not necessarily want to be that close to each other after perhaps a fractious race. Here, even if the race is very, very, very tired, tight, in the end, when you get into that room, you're united by one thing. You conquered Le Mans. Le Mans did not beat you, and that is a tough thing to say. It's a tough thing to achieve. There's an awful lot of cars that came here. Fully a third of our grid didn't make the chequered flag, and that is a high attrition rate. It is an extraordinary, I think, for the modern era. And it wasn't crunched. cars breaking down and falling apart and catching fire and blowing turbos. Generally, the scenery had more effect on the shape of the cars than any other item. Gianni told us that we'd be fighting for the podium. They did. They've got there. Yep, and third uh, place finish. Absolutely. Neil with Renny Binder and Jan Nico Pino, a Chilean racer on the podium at Le Mans. Yet another nation. It's got to be a first, hasn't it? Even without checking, you think that must be a first. Let's take a look at our overall classification then. Ferrari AF Corsa victorious over Toyota Gazoo Racing. Cadillacs finishing in third and fourth places ahead of the delayed second Ferrari. Glickenau sixth and seventh again, 100% top 10 finishing record ahead of the better of the Peugeots. Into your pole, Team WRT and Duquesne fill the podium in the LMP2 and in LMP2 Pro-Am. Algarve Pro's number 45 crew take victory from 37 Cool Racing and the third Pro-Am car, DKR Engineering car number 15. Corvette Racing, ORT by TF and GR Racing are our podium finishers. GR taking the third spot in GTE and by just five seconds ahead of the Iron Dames. And you can see, again, the agony and the ecstasy, the tears of joy and defeat in that pre-podium room. For every winner, there will be a whole host of teams that could have, would have, should have. And that's what makes them come back. Because whether it's the one that defeats you or a rival, either way, you've taken on the challenge and you don't want to stop until you succeed. Your smiles for Sebastian Buemi and Brendan Hartley. Brendan just really looking after Rio Hirakara. Comforting the young man. Yeah, yeah. He probably feels a degree of responsibility for the fact they're not on the top step of the podium. In the end, 
Uh, again, it sounds slightly trite, but win as a team, lose as a team. And that is so much a part of this sport. And the Toyota crew, Kaznaki Jima there in the centre, there to greet the winners. Tom Christensen there to present the trophies as well. To James Collado, Antonio Giovanazzi. Sancho Pierre Guidi didn't go grey during that uh, final <laughs> <laughs> refusal to fire up. But I tell you what, I bet his heart rate spikes to a rate that he's previously almost never seen. This is the point where everybody's waiting for the podium, and then everybody doesn't want to go home, but they know they've got to. Well, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Well, you can overnight, but you need to kind of yeah, shuffle off tomorrow. What we're looking at is what is going to be one of the photographs of the year because you've got Ferrari winning Le Mans, a sea of humanity and beautiful sunshine and beautiful weather. And these photographs will go around the world and around the world and around the world. They'll be on social media for days, if not weeks, if not months. Uh, by the way, Alessio Salazar uh, from Chile, but uh, never got on the podium, no. remember, because he was taken out of the car and switched between two Jaguars. Him and and Martin Brundle, Brundle. He switched into the second car before Eliseo managed to start the car. You're absolutely right, Stuart Dent. I'm sure you were shouting at the TV to remind me. I was here, we were both here. I should have remembered. Well, there you can see the slightly different look to the 24-hour trophies below the centenary trophy still on the four pillars but without the standard Le Mans 24 logo they've got a centenary logo as well so those drivers will get an exceptional trophy as well just on the right hand side there you saw I didn't see that before the number 14 Nielsen pit board the number 14 Nielsen car was gold with a whole series of images from the history of Le Mans on the pit board, the famous shot of Michael Delaney saluting one of his rivals <laughs> in Steve McQueen's film Le Mans. Great. I had not spotted that before. If you didn't see it, you'll have to look back and, uh, and get it there. There's Gilles Duquesne. Again, arch enthusiast. On the podium. Mm, absolutely. Think of another French arch enthusiast. The man with most race entries here at the Mall. 33 entries as a driver then a dozen more and more than that as a team owner and facilitator of me Pescarona. Our very best wishes go to him and best thoughts, I'm sure, from everybody in the booth and around the world. Henri Pescarona, one of the great names of racing at Le Mans. By the way, 12 podium positions of grabs in these four classes, 11 nations across those 12. Oh, yeah, the only goodness. one repeated with two is right. going to be the United States of America, yeah. lost the innovative car. Corvette Racing, of course, winning GTM, Cadillac Racing in Hypercar. Every other nation is a unique nation on this podium. From the tiniest to some of the very biggest and most powerful in this sport. First time in a very long while that the overall trophy will be awarded and followed by the national anthem of motorsport, the Italian national anthem. And that, I mean, they're all looking quite happy now. That will bring on the floods of tears. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, it just absolutely will. Not from me, not from them. So here come in third place. Leading the team out is Richard Westbrook. There is Westy. But he wasn't. He, I thought he was going to be the first out the door. He wasn't. So the team of the number two Cadillac. They had the least misfortune of the three caddies. They came home in third place. The number two car, Earl Bamba, Alex Lynn, and Richard Westbrook. <laughs> Earl Bamba on the left knows the view down from this podium. He's been an overall winner before, of course, with Porsche. Alex Lynn. Richard Westbrook, Alex Lynn carrying the colours of five-time Le Mans winner Derek Bell on his helmet as his little tribute to the centenary of this great race. This is going to be the first time, Martin, the two schoolmates have stood on the same overall podium. Brendan Hart and Earl Bamba. Yeah, both from Europe together. Near Wanganui, in fact, Earl from Wanganui. Good morning, good Monday morning to my friend Don, friend Don Point, but also from Wanganui. Uh, there is the crew of the number eight Toyota, Sebastian Remy, Brendan Hartley, and Rio Hirokawa. And for the 
first time in 50 years. Ferrari wins the mark. Not in GT. The overall winners of the Le Mans 24 hours, the Centenary Le Mans 2023. It is the crew of Ferrari number 51. Alessandro Pierguidi, James Collado, and Antonio Giovinazzi. They came, they saw, they conquered. And fittingly enough, those were the words of Julius Caesar in the opening of his Tales of the Gallic Wars. And Veni Vidi Vici, 50 years since the last time it was done by Ferrari here again in France. And it has been a Gallic War. came up with this crazy idea back in the late autumn of 1922. Team boss, Patti Asco looking rightly happy. Whatever else happens in the remainder of the season, this is the one, this is it. This is the whole shooting match. This is the big ball game. The second place trophies go to the team who could so easy bar one tiny twist of fate, one turn of the cards have been on the top step. President of the Department of the South, of the South. Uh, local governing body. They also have the owners of the property. They take all the public roads around this region. In a state in which they can become most famous racetracks. Crew number eight Toyota, Sebastian Buemi, Brendan Hartley, Rio Hirakawa. So close. They fought like tigers throughout. It was an epic battle for victory in all three classes. The Grand Marshal, the most successful race winner here at the Mall. Tom Christensen presents the Victor's Trophies, unique Victor's Trophies with the Centenary logo on the top. To Alessandro Pierguidi, to James Collado, and to Antonio Giovinazzi. The team boss gets the big one for Marinello. And the Centenary Trophy is going to need some lifting. That is best left on its plinth. Joy pretty much unlimited. And uh, you can see the, the looks of relief on many of the crew's uh, faces, can't you, down in the pit lane? Yep. What are we going to 
fill this with? Well, the obvious answer <laughs> is champagne. <laughs> because we are, of course, in France. Look at that. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's exactly what every photographer has been hoping for. Just an absolute sea of colour and humanity. Actually, that gives you a pretty good indication of what the pit walk looked like in the autograph session. Put a few drivers' tables out there, and there you have it. Rolex watches handed, and a uh, new deal signed between this famous brand and this great race. Long-term deal will mean the winners will continue to get uh, one of the most prized of their prizes. Come on, it's Tom. Don't leave him hanging. <laughs> Tony <laughs> leaving, leaving Tom Christensen hanging with a, with a fist bump. Congratulations to all of them. And to everybody who brought cars here, who brought teams here, who brought drivers here, who brought hopes and dreams here. The combination of every single one of them, all 62 teams, has created quite a remarkable event. many faces in the photos when the trophies go up. They're such enormous things, aren't they? Particularly for the winners. Photoshop's going to be taking a beating tonight at Media Room. <laughs> Overwhelmed, I think, is the uh, the overwhelming emotion that you're looking at in the faces of those three Ferrari drivers. I yeah. don't think they can quite believe it. I'm not sure what the Italian for it hasn't really sunk in yet is, but that's going to get bandied around an awful lot, I think, amongst uh, our drivers. Of course, the winner's selfie. That's as much a tradition now on the podium as almost anything else. Chikadori floated in. This is the Japanese flag. And now everybody gets to smell like a winner. <laughs> Man's from down below, thanking the lucky stars that somebody placed them downwind behind a foot of object. Otherwise, they undoubtedly would be the subjects of some very sticky champagne showers. Doesn't do well for your trumpet, does it? Really doesn't. I don't think a trombone slide would, <laughs> would work particularly well full of sticky champagne in this temperature. However, uh, this is the beginning now of a long round of interviews and press calls and meet and greets that can only extend all the way, you should think, to Monza in a month's time because everybody will want to talk to the Ferrari drivers that won the month. In the white shirt, Bruno Van Der Steek. He has been the speaker here at the Circuit de la Sarthe since 1992. Antonio Giovinazzi, James Terado, Alessandro Pierguini! Remarkable, remarkable scenes. 50 years is a long time. Voilà, regardez bien, mesdames et messieurs, ce qu'ils vont faire. Je vais leur. Regardez bien, on va les laisser embrasser le trophée du centenaire! Oui! Voilà! For those of us that were both lucky enough and unlucky enough to be able to enter, lucky enough yeah. because we know a lot of you wanted to be here, and unlucky enough because Say it's beyond what you want. Um, this you does you not good. It just does. It's amazing to see you all here, and uh, thank you. Hey, and there is no word to to describe the emotion I'm feeling now. Just look at this group of amazing people, and uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Forza Ferrari. Merci à vous, messieurs. Merci à vous.
Et encore une fois, sincère félicitations à, à l'équipage. Et effectivement, Alessandro, n'oubliez pas le beau coffret Rolex qui est là. Et mesdames et messieurs, pour le public, parce que vous savez qu'on a une petite tradition, n'ayez crainte, ce sera pour vous juste après. On les met de côté. On va quand même pas changer une formule qui gagne. Three winning drivers in front of a goodly proportion of the 325,000 people who are here to watch this astonishing race and this amazing triumph for Ferrari AF Corsa and the number 51, Ferrari 499P. Once again, Martin, there's the result. Yep. Ferrari, Toyota Gazoo Racing and Cadillac Racing completing the podium in LMP2. Victors into Europol ahead of Team WRT and Duquesne. What a result for two very small and very dedicated teams. In GTM, Corvette Racing are ahead of ORT by TF and by five seconds, GR Racing snatching the final podium spot from the Iron Dames. And the Garage 56 car coming home, 39 spots, the penultimate car running at the flag. Jimmy Johnson fittingly bringing the Hendrix Motorsport car to the line. Rick Hendrick and his crew spent nearly two years developing that car. Chad Canals, Jimmy Johnson, and uh, Rocco, Michael Rockefeller and Jensen Button bringing the car through. We're going to take a look at our LMP2 Pro-Am category in a moment or two. Toyota still lead the World Championship from Ferrari. That battle will tighten up, and as you can see, there is a 25-point spread, one win between the crew of the number eight car and the number 51 car. That makes life very entertaining. And look who's in third. It's the crew of the number two Cadillac. And there you go, it's Ferrari up to second place in the World Championship now, and Cadillac up to third, it's game on. Toyota undefeated so far in the FIA World Endurance Championship this season. But it could happen. And again, the way... I, th I think the thing that's impressed me that most about Le Mans... I beg to differ. They've just been defeated. Yeah, it, yeah uh, up to now. Uh, the way that's impressed me most about Le Mans and the way that Ferrari have taken it as a on, as it's as if they were never not here. Yes. It just has been the most yes. natural thing. They've not been tetchy or tight-lipped or, or closed-doored or, or nervous or you know, overthinking or second-guessing. They've just come in, relaxed and flowing, and gone and done it. Of course, now coming back and doing it again, that's another whole thing. But I have been singularly impressed by the, the re genuine relaxed and almost carefree attitude with which not unprepared not serious not professional but not stressed way in which they have dealt with the entire thing the history element of it the expectations the hopes all of that yeah they know it's there it's not stressing them out inside the team it's a little oasis of happiness and zen calm and that's a remarkable thing to achieve in a team that has not raced as a team until the beginning of this season. So we've had already an Italian team, of course, winning overall. Japanese team, Toyota Kazoo racing in second, and a US team in third overall. We wait now, I think it's on the P2 we're going to be seeing next. Yeah. Well, the band down below who are playing the anthems have got a couple of good choices. OK, uh, Italian anthem. Pretty standard stuff. Uh, in GTEM, Star Spangled Banner, okay, most bands are going to know that. Our uh, LMP2 Pro Am winner, a Portuguese flagged team. A little bit less of a familiar anthem. And our overall LMP2 winners, a Portuguese team. That That's kind of stuff here. one that they may not play very frequently. So, Decane Team's number 30 squad come to the podium. Iliani has been on this podium before, on the top step, of course. We saw Gilles Bacain and uh, Chilean racer Nico Pinho. His 2022 season finished with despair. But, uh, he'll stand on the third step. On the other side, the number 41 Team WRT crew, they fought hard for this. Yep. First Angolan driver on the podium at Le Mans. A bit 
Alors ça, ça va mettre en trace. But the winners, extraordinary story this. Yeah. Absolute extraordinary story. The sense of their Rui Andrade, the first Angolian, Angolan driver to finish on the podium along there is Kuba Schmichowski, the most unassuming racing driver I think you will probably ever meet. Alba Costa, whose career is just going to start getting vaulted into the stratosphere. And Fabio Scherer, apparently, Ben Keating has been down to apologise to him. Uh, in that it seems he has broken a toe, probably his big toe, actually. Uh, so, uh, Nicky Katzberg, I beg your pardon, apologised to Fabio Scherer. There he is in the centre. Uh, luckily, he didn't have to hop onto the podium. He can stand our LMP2 winners. Polish anthem. Stuff. And by the way, we didn't get Michael Fassbender on the podium. We did get Sasha Fassbender, team manager of the European competition, on the podium there. His younger brother. The you can see the state of the cars of there underneath the, the, the battle scars on these cars. <laughs> Even the ones that haven't been damaged are just covered in filth. Road filth, dirt from all the cars and lorries and trucks that use the public highways that gets thrown up in the rain. All the little black marks, black smears all over the car from their no marbles from the rubber that gets thrown off by the tyres of the race cars. Poland's biggest name in motorsport on the second step at the podium, but tomorrow morning the biggest name in Poland in the newspapers will be the team on the top step. Yep, into Europol. Our thanks again, as we have mentioned a couple of times, to Total Energy, the energy and fuel supply partner of the FIA World Endurance Championship and of Vermont, their 100% sustainable fuel, used not just in every racing car, but in all the tyre heaters in the paddock. And Kuritz on the left, Rui Andrade in the centre, and Gola's Rui Andrade. Louis Delatraz, one of many second-generation racers in this field. Third generation as well with young Jonas Reed, whose grandfather and father both raced here at Le Mans, whose dad was also in the race, Christian Reed. The Mayor of Le Mans presents our winners, the Inter Europol trio, with their trophy. Closest to us with the glasses is Kubo Schmirovsky, Fabio Scherer in the middle, and Albert Costa with the beard and the biggest smile. Amazing. Yeah. What a remarkable achievement. It is a very small family operation. Into Europol, for those who don't know, is not a uh, European wide police operation. That's Interpol. Into Europol is a Europe wide Polish based bakery concern. So, the racing bakers have done it. Well, before Fabio Scherer goes for a jog, I reckon. Yeah. And actually, if he's broken his big toe, it's going to be hurting him a long while. Hopefully, it's not too bad. A little pain for the next few weeks. But every time it hurts, he can look at his Le Mans winner's trophy and make him feel just a little bit better. Yeah. Make him feel a heck of a lot better. Not many people get to win Le Mans in such exclusive company and very few do it without able being able to even walk to their car. Great stuff. Those Thank images you. will be played in 20 years' time with the driver hopping around to get into a race car. We go, oh, I'd forgotten that even happened. Who is that? It is it is going to be one of those images that will come back time after time. Think by the way, this is 
dramatically alters the points in the FI World Endurance Championship and uh, inter competition won the few teams in LMP2, which is a fantastic relief WC at the end of this year that does not have a, as yet a clear path forward. This isn't going to hurt, is it? No. Absolutely not. See our class winning cars down there, the oval winning Ferrari, front and centre, the LMP2, the LMP2 Pro Am, and GTM class winners. Well done, WRT, they fought for that, and uh, yep, at uh, two or three points, I thought they got that one. But the spirit in this little team from Poland, amazing. Well, LMP2 was a mirror of hypercar. You could go Allez, almost literally photo, from first to last with a little pour, incident pour échanger, or, or sometimes even a pit stop. It was so close and so tight for most of the race. Albert, voilà. None of these really podium, even looked like vainqueur. being partly resolved wow. until we were pretty much at lunchtime on Sunday. It's incredible. I, I think most of the race I was looking to the Spanish flags. Some people saying, vamos, 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 Albert. Thank you, thank you so much for all the support to all the people around these days. It's been amazing. Thank you beaucoup. Bye, merci beaucoup, Jolly. Fabio, how is the, the left foot? Let's speak tomorrow about it. Today I don't feel it. And it's unbelievable. Merci beaucoup. Jacob, congratulations. I think it is the most beautiful day of your life. Yes, of course. I mean, my racing life at least. It's uh, the most amazing experience. And I'm just so proud to have the Polish flag waving here on the top step of the podium. It's uh, it's a dream come true, and I think it's it's just amazing. I'm speechless. Merci beaucoup. Voilà, Jacob Smyszowski le confirme, mesdames et messieurs. Alan Costa came up the single seater ladder. Yeah. Thankfully for all the commentators, at exactly the same as Antonio Felix de Costa. No confusion there whatsoever when they're in the same categories and in the same races. Is the chosen. Uh, Monica for Hubbard Costa, but uh, as you can see, massive enthusiast, as Martin said earlier in the broadcast, Cuba, uh, a very understated and private individual, but uh, you can see the emotion in his face. That is the result, 20 laps, uh, 28 laps completed uh, by the 34 car, and it was eventually 21 seconds to the good head of the second place team WRT car, with the third place going to decayed team after winning a bit of a duel with the number 31 team WRT that actually eventually fell behind yeah. the uh, the Alpine Elf 36. Team WRT lead the World Championship, or the World Cup rather, four points just now ahead of its European competition with the yeah. two United cars who did not have the best level this year. That is a really tough battle, and into Europol claiming victory with Team WRT's 41 car in second place. That makes that a super car a tight battle with half the season almost left to go. So just a four point spread between those two crews. Well, this race in LMP2 was never a two horse affair. There were not yawning chasms in it, nor were there in GTE app. The final podium spot decided for the crew of GR Racing by just five seconds. They're jubilant. The crew of the Iron Dames Porsche will be crushed. So GR Racing, Mike Wainwright, the tall figure of Ben Barker, and Ricardo Perra, who did the anchor leg there in the centre. Go one better than last year, fourth last year for this team. And indeed, this exact driving crew Second for ORT by TF Sports ORT for Oman Racing Team. If you're listening and uh, looking in from Oman, I'm sure this is a very happy day for your crowd nation as well. That's come courtesy of Armand Harty, a massive flag carrier for his country. Or as Louise almost renamed them, OMG by TF Sport. There is TF, Tom the Ferrier himself from the racer up to Formula 3 standards in the UK. It's started Bobby Cars Brothers and has never stopped since. So, uh, Amadar Harvey, Michael Dynan of the USA and Charlie Eastwood and our winners in the Corvette Racing C8R, Nicky Katzberg, the very slightly tall figure of Nico Veroni and the ebullient Ben Keating. I mean, Daly, by the way, the team manager on the other side of the podium for GR Racing. 
great to see. The teams absolutely should be represented here. GT car built in America. The win in the wins for GT didn't last long. This one hopefully will stick around. Indeed. Nine years, eight different cars. He's won with, well, in fact, won across the line with three of them. He's kept the win with two of them. The Ford GT, very popular car back in the day. Unfortunately, losing its win to a technical infringement the, uh, the day after. And uh, GR Racing important might this be for their future in the FI World Endurance Championship. Again, another team that punches above its weight. Can't argue with a podium at Le Mans. A huge result for them. Very big day indeed. Ingemal, head of Bosch Motorsport, and again, one of the key suppliers to the FIA World Endurance Championship. And receives ORT by TM Sport trophy. Mohamed El Harty on the left hand side of your shot there, the first racing driver from Omar to claim an FIA World Championship pole position, and now he claims his nation's first Le Mans trophy. Is there a better 